section one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by tony oliva the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez translated by charlotte brewster jordan part one chapter one the tryst in the garden of the expiatory chapel they were to have met in the garden of the chapelle expiatoire at five o'clock in the afternoon but julio desnoyers with the impatience of a lover who hopes to advance the moment of meeting by presenting himself before the appointed time arrived an half hour earlier the change of the seasons was at this time greatly confused in his mind and evidently demanded some readjustment five months had passed since their last interview in this square had afforded the wandering lovers the refuge of a damp depressing calmness near a boulevard of continual movement close to a great railroad station the hour of the appointment was always five and julio was accustomed to see his beloved approaching by the reflection of the recently lit street lamps her figure enveloped in furs and holding her muff before her face as if it were a half mask her sweet voice greeting him had breathed forth a cloud of vapour white and tenuous congealed by the cold after various hesitating interviews they had abandoned the garden their love had acquired the majestic importance of acknowledged fact and from five to seven had taken refuge in the fifth floor of the rue de la pompe where julio had an artist's studio the curtains well drawn over the double glass windows the cosy hearth fire sending forth its ruddy flame as the only light of the room the monotonous song of the samovar bubbling near the cups of tea all the seclusion of life isolated by an idolizing love had dulled their perceptions to the fact that the afternoons were growing longer that outside the sun was shining later and later into the pearl-covered depths of the clouds and that a timid and pallid spring was beginning to show its green finger-tips in the buds of the branches suffering the last nips of winter that wild black boar who so often turned on his tracks then julio had made his trip to buenos aires encountering in the other hemisphere the last smile of autumn and the first icy winds from the pampas and just as his mind was becoming reconciled to the fact that for him winter was an eternal season since it always came to meet him in his chamber of domicile from one extreme of the planet to the other lo summer was unexpectedly confronting him in this dreary garden a swarm of children was racing and screaming through the short avenues around the monument on entering the place the first thing that julio encountered was a hoop which came rolling toward his legs trundled by a childish hand then he stumbled over a ball around the chestnut trees was gathering the usual warm weather crowd seeking the blue shade perforated with points of light many nursemaids from the neighboring houses were working and chattering here following with indifferent glances the rough games of the children confided to their care near them were the men who had brought their papers down into the garden under the impression that they could read them in the midst of peaceful groves all of the benches were full a few women were occupying camp stools with that feeling of superiority which ownership always confers the iron chairs pay seats were serving as resting places for various suburban dames loaded down with packages who were waiting for straggling members of their families in order to take the train to the gare saint lazare and julio in his special delivery letter had proposed meeting in this place 
supposing that it would be as little frequented as in former times she too with the same thoughtlessness had in her reply set the usual hour at five o'clock believing that after passing a few minutes in the printemps or the galerie on the pretext of shopping she would be able to slip over to the unfrequented garden without risk of being seen by any of her numerous acquaintances desnoyers was enjoying an almost forgotten sensation that of strolling through vast spaces crushing as he walked the grains of sand under his feet for the past twenty days his rovings had been upon planks following with the automatic precision of a riding school the oval promenade on the deck of a ship his feet accustomed to insecure ground still were keeping on terra firma a certain sensation of elastic unsteadiness his goings and comings were not awakening the curiosity of the people seated in the open for a common preoccupation seemed to be monopolizing all the men and women the groups were exchanging impressions those who happened to have a paper in their hands saw their neighbors approaching them with a smile of interrogation there had suddenly disappeared that distrust and suspicion which impels the inhabitants of large cities mutually to ignore one another taking each other's measure at a glance as though they were enemies they are talking about the war said desnoyers to himself at this time all paris speaks of nothing but the possibility of war outside of the garden he could see also the same anxiety which was making those around him so fraternal and sociable the vendors of newspapers were passing through the boulevard crying the evening editions their furious speed repeatedly slackened by the eager hands of the passers-by contending for the papers every reader was instantly surrounded by a group begging for news or trying to decipher over his shoulder the great headlines at the top of the sheet in the rue des maturins on the other side of the square a circle of workmen under the awning of a tavern were listening to the comments of a friend who accompanied his words with oratorical gestures and wavings of the paper the traffic in the streets the general bustle of the city was the same as in other days but it seemed to julio that the vehicles were whirling past more rapidly that there was a feverish agitation in the air and that people were speaking and smiling in a different way the women of the garden were looking even at him as if they had seen him in former days he was able to approach them and begin a conversation without experiencing the slightest strangeness they are talking of the war he said again but with the commiseration of a superior intelligence which foresees the future and feels above the impressions of the vulgar crowd he knew exactly what course he was going to follow he had disembarked at ten o'clock the night before and as it was not yet twenty-four hours since he had touched land his mentality was still that of a man who comes from afar across oceanic immensities from boundless horizons and is surprised at finding himself in touch with the preoccupations which govern human communities after disembarking he had spent two hours in a cafe in boulogne listlessly watching the middle-class families who passed their time in the monotonous placidity of a life without dangers then the special train for the passengers from south america had brought him to paris leaving him at four in the morning on a platform of the gare du nord in the embrace of pepe argensola the young spaniard whom he sometimes called my secretary or my valet because it was difficult to define exactly the relationship between them in reality he was a mixture of friend and parasite the poor comrade complacent and capable in his companionship with a rich youth on bad terms with his family sharing with him the ups and downs of fortune picking up the crumbs of prosperous days or inventing expedients to keep up appearances in the hours of poverty what about the war argensola had asked him before inquiring about the result of his trip you have come a long ways and should know much soon he was sound 
sound asleep in his dear old bed while his secretary was pacing up and down the studio talking of servia russia and the kaiser this youth too sceptical as he generally was about everything not connected with his own interests appeared infected by the general excitement when desnoyers awoke he found her note awaiting him setting their meeting at five that afternoon and also containing a few words about the threatened danger which was claiming the attention of all paris upon going out in search of lunch the concierge on the pretext of welcoming him back had asked him the war news and in the restaurant the cafe and the street always war the possibility of war with germany julio was an optimist what did all this restlessness signify to a man who had just been living more than twenty days among germans crossing the atlantic under the flag of the empire he had sailed from buenos aires in a steamer of the hamburg line the koenig frederick august the world was in blessed tranquillity when the boat left port only the whites and half-breeds of mexico were exterminating each other in conflicts in order that nobody might believe that man is an animal degenerated by peace on the rest of the planet the people were displaying unusual prudence even aboard the transatlantic liner the little world of passengers of most diverse nationalities appeared a fragment of future society implanted by way of experiment in modern times a sketch of the hereafter without frontiers or race antagonisms end of section one recording by tony oliva albuquerque new mexico section two part one chapter one continued of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez this librivox recording is in the public domain one morning the ship band which every sunday had sounded the choral of luther awoke those sleeping in the first-class cabins with the most unheard-of serenade desnoyers rubbed his eyes believing himself under the hallucinations of a dream the german horns were playing the marseillaise through the corridors and decks the steward smiling at his astonishment said the fourteenth of july on the german steamers they celebrate as their own the great festivals of all the nations represented by their cargo and passengers their captains are careful to observe scrupulously the rites of this religion of the flag and its historic commemoration the most insignificant republic saw the ship decked in its honor affording one more diversion to help combat the monotony of the voyage and further the lofty ends of the germanic propaganda for the first time the great festival of france was being celebrated on a german vessel and whilst the musicians continued escorting a racy marseillaise in double quick time through the different floors the morning groups were commenting on the event what finesse exclaimed the south american ladies these germans are not so phlegmatic as they seem it is an attention something very distinguished and is it possible that some still believe that they and the french might come to blows the very few frenchmen who were travelling on the steamer found themselves admired as though they had increased immeasurably in public esteem there were only three an old jeweller who had been visiting his branch shops in america and two demi mondaines from the rue de la paix the most timid and well-behaved persons aboard vestals with bright eyes and disdainful noses who held themselves stiffly aloof in this uncongenial atmosphere at night there was a gala banquet in the dining-room at the end of which the french flag and that of the empire formed a flaunting conspicuous drapery all the german passengers were in dress suits and their wives were wearing low-necked gowns the uniforms of the attendants were as resplendent as on a day of a grand review 
during dessert the tapping of a knife upon a glass reduced the table to sudden silence the commandant was going to speak and this brave mariner who united to his nautical functions the obligation of making harangues at banquets and opening the dance with the lady of most importance began unrolling a string of words like the noise of clappers between long intervals of silence desnoyers knew a little german as a souvenir of a visit to some relatives in berlin and so was able to catch a few words the commandant was repeating every few minutes peace and friends a table neighbor a commercial commissioner offered his services as interpreter to julio with that obsequiousness which lives on advertisement the commandant asks god to maintain peace between germany and france and hopes that the two people will become increasingly friendly another orator arose at the same table he was the most influential of the german passengers a rich manufacturer from dusseldorf who had just been visiting his agents in america he was never mentioned by name he bore the title of commercial counsellor and among his countrymen was always herr commerzienrat and his wife was entitled frau rat the counsellor's lady much younger than her important husband had from the first attracted the attention of De Noyer. she too had made an exception in favor of this young argentinian abdicating her title from their first conversation call me bertha she said as condescendingly as a duchess of versailles might have spoken to a handsome abbot seated at her feet her husband also protested upon hearing desnoyers call him counsellor like his compatriots my friends said he call me captain i command a company of the landsturm and the air with which the manufacturer accompanied these words revealed the melancholy of an unappreciated man scorning the honours he has in order to think only of those he does not possess while he was delivering his discourse julio was examining his small head and thick neck which gave him a certain resemblance to a bulldog in imagination he saw the high and oppressive collar of a uniform making a double roll of fat above its stiff edge the waxed upright moustaches were bristling aggressively his voice was sharp and dry as though he were shaking out his words thus the emperor would utter his harangues so the martial burgher with instinctive imitation was contracting his left arm supporting his hand upon the hilt of an invisible sword in spite of his fierce and oratorical gesture of command all the listening germans laughed uproariously at his first words like men who knew how to appreciate the sacrifice of a herr commerzienrat when he deigns to divert a festivity he is saying very witty things about the french volunteered the interpreter in a low voice but they are not offensive julio had guessed as much upon hearing repeatedly the word franzosen he almost understood what the orator was saying franzosen great children light-hearted amusing improvident the things that they might do together if they would only forget past grudges the attentive germans were no longer laughing the counsellor was laying aside his irony that grandiloquent crushing irony weighing many tons as enormous as a ship then he began unrolling the serious part of his harangue so that he himself was also greatly affected he says sir reported julio's neighbor that he wishes france to become a very great nation so that some day we may march together against other enemies against others and he winked one eye smiling maliciously with that smile of common intelligence which this allusion to the mysterious enemy always awakened finally the captain counsellor raised his glass in a toast to france hoch he yelled as though he were commanding an evolution of his soldierly reserves three times he sounded the cry and all the german contingents springing to their feet responded with a lusty hoch 
while the band in the corridor blared forth the marseillaise desnoyers was greatly moved thrills of enthusiasm were coursing up and down his spine his eyes became so moist that when drinking his champagne he almost believed that he had swallowed some tears he bore a french name he had french blood in his veins and this that the gringos were doing though generally they seemed to him ridiculous and ordinary was really worth acknowledging the subjects of the kaiser celebrating the great date of the revolution he believed that he was witnessing a great historic event very well done he said to the other south americans at the near tables we must admit that they have done a handsome thing then with the vehemence of his twenty-seven years he accosted the jeweller in the passageway reproaching him for his silence he was the only french citizen aboard he should have made a few words of acknowledgment the fiesta was ending awkwardly through his fault and why have you not spoken as a son of france retorted the jeweller i am an argentinian citizen replied julio and he left the older man believing that he ought to have spoken and making explanations to those around him it was a very dangerous thing he protested to meddle in diplomatic affairs furthermore he had not instructions from his government and for a few hours he believed that he had been on the point of playing a great role in history desnoyers passed the rest of the evening in the smoking-room attracted thither by the presence of the councillor's lady the captain of the landsturm sticking a preposterous cigar between his mustachios was playing poker with his countrymen ranking next to him in dignity and riches his wife stayed behind him most of the time watching the goings and comings of the stewards carrying great box without daring to share in this tremendous consumption of beer her special preoccupation was to keep vacant near her a seat which desnoyers might occupy she considered him the most distinguished man on board because he was accustomed to taking champagne with all his meals he was of medium height a decided brunette with a small foot which obliged her to tuck hers under her skirts and a triangular face under two masses of hair straight black and glossy as lacquer the very opposite of the type of men about her besides he was living in paris in the city which she had never seen after numerous trips in both hemispheres oh paris paris she sighed opening her eyes and pursing her lips in order to express her admiration when she was speaking alone to the argentinian how i should love to go there and in order that he might feel free to tell her things about paris she permitted herself certain confidences about the pleasures of berlin but with a blushing modesty admitting in advance that in the world there was more much more that she wished to become acquainted with while pacing around the chapelle expiatoire julio recalled with a certain remorse the wife of councillor erichman he who had made the trip to america for a woman's sake in order to collect money and marry her then he immediately began making excuses for his conduct nobody was going to know furthermore he did not pretend to be an ascetic and bertha erichmann was certainly a tempting adventure in mid-ocean upon recalling her his imagination always saw a racehorse large spare roan colored and with a long stride she was an up-to-date german who admitted no defect in her country except the excessive weight of its women combating in her person this national menace with every known system of dieting for her every meal was a species of torment and the procession of box in the smoking-room a tantalizing agony the slenderness achieved and maintained by will-power only made more prominent the size of her frame the powerful skeleton with heavy jaws and large teeth strong and dazzling 
which perhaps suggested desnoyers' disrespectful comparison she is thin but enormous nevertheless was always his conclusion but then he considered her notwithstanding the most distinguished woman on board distinguished for the sea elegant in the style of munich with clothes of indescribable colors that suggested persian art and the vignettes of medieval manuscripts the husband admired bertha's elegance lamenting her childlessness in secret almost as though it were a crime of high treason germany was magnificent because of the fertility of its women the kaiser with his artistic hyperbole had proclaimed that the true german beauty should have a waist measure of at least a yard and a half when desnoyers entered into the smoking-room in order to take the seat which bertha had reserved for him her husband and his wealthy hangers-on had their pack of cards lying idle upon the green felt herr rat was continuing his discourse and his listeners taking their cigars from their mouths were emitting grunts of approbation the arrival of julio provoked a general smile of amiability here was france coming to fraternize with them they knew that his father was french and that fact made him as welcome as though he came in direct line from the palace of the quai d'orsay representing the highest diplomacy of the republic the craze for proselyting made them all promptly concede to him unlimited importance we continued the counsellor looking fixedly at desnoyers as if he were expecting a solemn declaration from him we wish to live on good terms with france the youth nodded his head so as not to appear inattentive it appeared to him a very good thing that these people should not be enemies and as far as he was concerned they might affirm this relationship as often as they wished the only thing that was interesting him just at that time was a certain knee that was seeking his under the table transmitting its gentle warmth through a double curtain of silk end of section two recording by tony oliva albuquerque new mexico section three part one chapter one continued of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez this librivox recording is in the public domain but france complained the manufacturer is most unresponsive towards us for many years past our emperor has been holding out his hand with noble loyalty but she pretends not to see it that you must admit is not as it should be just here desnoyers believed that he ought to say something in order that the spokesman might not divine his more engrossing occupation perhaps you are not doing enough if uh, first of all you would return that which you took away from france stupefied silence followed this remark as if the alarm signal had sounded through the boat some of those who were about putting their cigars in their mouths remained with hands immovable within two inches of their lips their eyes almost popping out of their heads but the captain of the landsturm was there to formulate their mute protest return he said in a voice almost extinguished by the sudden swelling of his neck we have nothing to return for we have taken nothing that which we possess we acquire by our heroism the hidden knee with its agreeable friction made itself more insinuating as though counselling the youth to greater prudence do not say such things breathed bertha thus only the republicans corrupted by paris talk a youth so distinguished who has been in berlin and has relatives in germany but desnoyers felt a hereditary impulse of aggressiveness before each of her husband's statements enunciated in haughty tones and responded coldly it is as if i should take your watch and then propose that we should be friends forgetting the occurrence although you might forget the first thing for me to do would be to return the watch counsellor erckmann wished to retort with so many things at once that he stuttered horribly leaping from one idea to the other to compare the reconquest of alsace to a robbery a german country 
the race the language the history but when did they announce their wish to be german asked the youth without losing his calmness when have you consulted their opinion the counsellor hesitated not knowing whether to argue with this insolent fellow or crush him with his scorn young man you do not know what you are talking about he finally blustered with withering contempt you are an argentinian and do not understand the affairs of europe and the others agreed suddenly repudiating the citizenship which they had attributed to him a little while before the counsellor with military rudeness brusquely turned his back upon him and taking up the pack distributed the cards the game was renewed desnoyers seeing himself isolated by the scornful silence felt greatly tempted to break up the playing by violence but the hidden knee continued counselling self-control and an invisible hand had sought his right pressing it sweetly that was enough to make him recover his serenity the counsellor's lady seemed to be absorbed in the progress of the game he also looked on a malignant smile contracting slightly the lines of his mouth as he was mentally ejaculating by way of consolation captain captain you little know what is awaiting you on terra firma he would never again have approached these men but life on a transatlantic liner with its inevitable promiscuousness obliges forgetfulness the following day the counsellor and his friends came in search of him flattering his sensibilities by erasing every irritating memory he was a distinguished youth belonging to a wealthy family and all of them had shops and business in his country the only thing was that he should be careful not to mention his french origin he was an argentinian and thereupon the entire chorus interested itself in the grandeur of his country and all the nations of south america where they had agencies or investments exaggerating its importance as though its petty republics were great powers commenting with gravity upon the deeds and words of its political leaders and giving him to understand that in germany there was no one who was not concerned about the future of south america predicting for all its divisions most glorious prosperity a reflex of the empire always provided of course that they kept under germanic influence in spite of these flatteries desnoyers was no longer presenting himself with his former assiduity at the hour of poker the counsellor's wife was retiring to her stateroom earlier than usual their approach to the equator inducing such an irresistible desire for sleep that she had to abandon her husband to his card-playing julio also had mysterious occupations which prevented his appearance on deck until after midnight with the precipitation of a man who desires to be seen in order to avoid suspicion he was accustomed to enter the smoking-room talking loudly as he seated himself near the husband and his boon companions the game had ended and an orgy of beer and fat cigars from hamburg was celebrating the success of the winners it was the hour of teutonic expansion of intimacy among men of heavy sluggish jokes of off-color stories the counsellor was presiding with much majesty over the diableries of his chums prudent business men from the hanseatic ports who had big accounts in the deutsche bank or were shopkeepers installed in the republic of the la plata with an innumerable family he was a warrior a captain and on applauding every heavy jest with a laugh that distended his fat neck he fancied that he was among his comrades at arms in honor of the south americans who tired of pacing the deck had dropped in to hear what the gringos were saying they were turning into spanish the witticisms and licentious anecdotes awakened in the memory by a superabundance of beer julio was marvelling at the ready laugh of all these men while the foreigners were remaining unmoved they would break forth into loud hoarse laughs 
throwing themselves back in their seats and when the german audience was growing cold the story-teller would resort to an infallible expedient to remedy his lack of success they told this yarn to the kaiser and when the kaiser heard it he laughed heartily it was not necessary to say more they all laughed then ha 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 with a spontaneous roar but a short one a laugh in three blows since to prolong it might be interpreted as a lack of respect to his majesty as they neared europe a batch of news came to meet the boat the employees in the wireless telegraphy office were working incessantly one night on entering the smoking-room desnoyers saw the german notables gesticulating with animated countenances they were no longer drinking beer they had had bottles of champagne uncorked and the counsellor's lady much impressed had not retired to her stateroom captain erckmann spying the young argentinian offered him a glass it is war he shouted with enthusiasm war at last the hour has come desnoyers made a gesture of astonishment war what war like all the others he had read on the news bulletin outside a radiogram stating that the austrian government had just sent an ultimatum to servia but it made not the slightest impression on him for he was not at all interested in the balkan affairs those were but the quarrels of a miserable little nation monopolizing the attention of the world distracting it from more worthwhile matters how could this event concern the martial counsellor the two nations would soon come to an understanding diplomacy sometimes amounted to something no insisted the german ferociously it is war blessed war russia will sustain servia and we will support our ally what will france do do you know what france will do julio shrugged his shoulders testily as though asking to be left out of all international discussions it is war asserted the counsellor the preventive war that we need russia is growing too fast and is preparing to fight us four years more of peace and she will have finished her strategic railroads and her military power united to that of her allies will be worth as much as ours it is better to strike a powerful blow now it is necessary to take advantage of this opportunity war preventive war all his clan were listening in silence some did not appear to feel the contagion of his enthusiasm war in imagination they saw their businesses paralyzed their agencies bankrupt the banks cutting down credit a catastrophe more frightful to them than the slaughters of battle but they applauded with nods and grunts all of erckmann's ferocious demonstrations he was a herr rat and an officer besides he must be in the secrets of the destiny of his country and that was enough to make them drink silently to the success of the war julio thought that the counsellor and his admirers must be drunk look here captain he said in a conciliatory tone what you say lacks logic how could war possibly be acceptable to industrial germany every moment its business is increasing every month it conquers a new market and every year its commercial balance soars upward in unheard-of proportions sixty years ago it had to man its boats with berlin hack drivers arrested by the police now its commercial fleets and war vessels cross all oceans and there is no port where the german merchant marine does not occupy the greatest part of the docks it would only be necessary to continue living in this way to put yourselves beyond the exigencies of war twenty years more of peace and the germans would be lords of the world's commerce conquering england the former mistress of the seas in a bloodless struggle and are they going to risk all this like a gambler who stakes his entire fortune on a single card in a struggle that might result unfavorably no war insisted the counsellor furiously preventive war we live surrounded by our enemies and this state of things cannot go on it is best to end it all at once either they or we germany feels herself strong enough to challenge the world we've got to put an end to this russian menace and if france doesn't keep herself quiet so much the worse for her and if anyone else anyone dares to come in against us 
so much the worse for him when i set up a new machine in my shops it is to make it produce unceasingly we possess the finest army in the world and it is necessary to give it exercise that it may not rust out he then continued with heavy emphasis they have put a band of iron around us in order to throttle us but germany has a strong chest and has only to expand in order to burst its bands we must awake before they manacle us in our sleep woe to those who then oppose us desnoyers felt obliged to reply to this arrogance he had never seen the iron circle of which the germans were complaining the nations were merely unwilling to continue living unsuspecting and inactive before boundless german ambition they were simply preparing to defend themselves against an almost certain attack they wished to maintain their dignity repeatedly violated under most absurd pretexts i wonder if it is not the others he concluded who are obliged to defend themselves because you represent a menace to the world an invisible hand sought his under the table as it had some nights before to recommend prudence but now he clasped it forcibly with the authority of a right acquired oh sir sighed the sweet berta to talk like that a youth so distinguished who has she was not able to finish for her husband interrupted they were no longer in american waters and the counsellor expressed himself with the rudeness of a master of his house End of section three. Recording by Tony Oliva, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Section four, part one, chapter one, continued of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez this librivox recording is in the public domain i have the honor to inform you young man he said imitating the cutting coldness of the diplomats that you are merely a south american and know nothing of the affairs of europe he did not call him an indian but julio heard the implication as though he had used the word itself ah if that hidden hand clasp had not held him with its sentimental thrills but this contact kept him calm and even made him smile thanks captain he said to himself it is the least you can do to get even with me here his relations with the german and his clientele came to an end the merchants as they approached nearer and nearer to their native land began casting off that servile desire of ingratiating themselves which they had assumed in all their trips to the new world they now had more important things to occupy them the telegraphic service was working without cessation the commandant of the vessel was conferring in his apartment with the counsellor as his compatriot of most importance his friends were hunting out the most obscure places in order to talk confidentially with one another even berta commenced to avoid desnoyers she was still smiling distantly at him but that smile was more of a souvenir than a reality between lisbon and the coast of england julio spoke with her husband for the last time every morning was appearing on the bulletin board the alarming news transmitted by radiograph the empire was arming itself against its enemies god would punish them making all manner of troubles fall upon them desnoyers was motionless with astonishment before the last piece of news three hundred thousand revolutionists are now besieging paris the suburbs are beginning to burn the horrors of the commune have broken out again my but these germans have gone mad exclaimed the disgusted youth to the curious group surrounding the radio sheet we are going to lose the little sense that we have left what revolutionists are they talking about how could a revolution break out in paris if the men of the government are not reactionary a gruff voice sounded behind him rude authoritative as if trying to banish the doubts of the audience it was the herr commerzienrat who was speaking young man these notices are sent us by the first agencies of germany and germany never lies after this affirmation he turned his back upon them and they saw him no more on the following morning the last day of the voyage desnoyers steward awoke him in great excitement herr come up on deck a most beautiful spectacle 
the sea was veiled by the fog but behind its hazy curtains could be distinguished some silhouettes like islands with great towers and sharp pointed minarets the islands were advancing over the oily waters slowly and majestically with impressive dignity julio counted eighteen they appeared to fill the ocean it was the channel fleet which had just left the english coast by government order sailing around simply to show its strength seeing this procession of dreadnoughts for the first time desnoyers was reminded of a flock of marine monsters and gained a better idea of the british power the german ship passed among them shrinking humiliated quickening its speed one might suppose mused the youth that she had an uneasy conscience and wished to scud to safety a south american passenger near him was jesting with one of the germans what if they have already declared war what if they should make us prisoners after midday they entered southampton roads the frederic august hurried to get away as soon as possible and transacted business with dizzying celerity the cargo of passengers and baggage was enormous two launches approached the transatlantic and discharged an avalanche of german residents in england who invaded the decks with the joy of those who tread friendly soil desiring to see hamburg as soon as possible then the boat sailed through the channel with a speed most unusual in these places the people leaning on the railing were commenting on the extraordinary encounters in this marine boulevard usually frequented by ships of peace certain smoke lines on the horizon were from the french squadron carrying president poincare who was returning from russia the european alarm had interrupted his trip then they saw more english vessels patrolling the coast like aggressive and vigilant dogs two north american battleships could be distinguished by their mastheads in the form of baskets then a russian battleship white and glistening passed at full steam on its way to the baltic bad said the south american passengers regretfully very bad it looks this time as if it were going to be serious and they glanced uneasily at the neighboring coasts on both sides although they presented the usual appearance behind them perhaps a new period of history was in the making the transatlantic was due at boulogne at midnight where it was supposed to wait until daybreak to discharge its passengers comfortably it arrived nevertheless at ten dropped anchor outside the harbor and the commandant gave orders that the disembarkation should take place in less than an hour for this reason they had quickened their speed consuming a vast amount of extra coal it was necessary to get away as soon as possible seeking the refuge of hamburg the radiographic apparatus had evidently been working to some purpose by the glare of the bluish searchlights which were spreading a livid clearness over the sea began the unloading of passengers and baggage for paris from the transatlantic into the tenders hurry hurry the seamen were pushing forward the ladies of slow step who were recounting their valises believing that they had lost some the stewards loaded themselves up with babies as though they were bundles the general precipitation dissipated the usual exaggerated and oily teutonic amiability they are regular bootlickers thought desnoyers they believe that their hour of triumph has come and do not think it necessary to pretend any longer he was soon in a launch that was bobbing up and down on the waves near the black and immovable hulk of the great liner dotted with many circles of light and filled with people waving handkerchiefs julio recognized berta who was waving her hand without seeing him without knowing in which tender he was but feeling obliged to show her gratefulness for the sweet memories that now were being lost in the mystery of the sea and the night adieu frau rat the distance between the departing transatlantic and the lighters was widening as though it had been awaiting this moment with impunity a stentorian voice in the upper deck shouted with a noisy guffaw see you later soon we shall meet you in paris and the marine band the very same band that three days before had astonished desnoyers 
with its unexpected marseillaise burst forth into a military march of the time of frederick the great a march of grenadiers with an accompaniment of trumpets that had been the night before although twenty-four hours had not yet passed by desnoyers was already considering it as a distant event of shadowy reality his thoughts always disposed to take the opposite side did not share in the general alarm the insolence of the councillor now appeared to him but the boastings of a burgher turned into a soldier the disquietude of the people of paris was but the nervous agitation of a city which lived placidly and became alarmed at the first hint of danger to its comfort so many times they had spoken of an immediate war always settling things peacefully at the last moment furthermore he did not want war to come because it would upset all his plans for the future and the man accepted as logical and reasonable everything that suited his selfishness placing it above reality no there will not be war he repeated as he continued pacing up and down the garden these people are beside themselves how could a war possibly break out in these days and after disposing of his doubts which certainly would in a short time come up again he thought of the joy of the moment consulting his watch five o'clock she might come now at any minute he thought that he recognized her afar off in a lady who was passing through the grating by the rue pasquier she seemed to him a little different but it occurred to him that possibly the summer fashions might have altered her appearance but soon he saw that he had made a mistake she was not not alone another lady was with her they were perhaps english or north american women who worshipped the memory of marie antoinette and wished to visit the chapelle expiatoire the old tomb of the executed queen julio watched them as they climbed the flights of steps and crossed the interior patio in which were interred the eight hundred swiss soldiers killed in the attack of the tenth of august with other victims of revolutionary fury disgusted at his error he continued his tramp his ill humor made the monument with which the bourbon restoration had adorned the old cemetery of the madeleine appear uglier than ever to him time was passing but she did not come every time that he turned he looked hungrily at the entrances of the garden and then it happened as in all their meetings she suddenly appeared as if she had fallen from the sky or risen from the ground like an apparition a cough a slight rustling of footsteps and as he turned julio almost collided with her marguerite oh marguerite it was she and yet he was slow to recognize her he felt a certain strangeness in seeing in full reality the countenance which had occupied his imagination for three months each time more spirituel and shadowy with the idealism of absence but his doubts were of short duration then it seemed as though time and space were eliminated that he had not made any voyage and but a few hours had intervened since their last interview marguerite divined the expansion which might follow julio's exclamations the vehement hand-clasp perhaps something more so she kept herself calm and serene no not here she said with a grimace of repugnance what a ridiculous idea for us to have met here they were about to seat them themselves on the iron chairs in the shadow of some shrubbery when she rose suddenly those who were passing along the boulevard might see them by merely casting their eyes toward the garden at this time many of her friends might be passing through the neighborhood because of its proximity to the big shops they therefore sought refuge at a corner of the monument placing themselves between it and the rue des maturins desnoyers brought two chairs near the hedge so that when seated they were invisible to those passing on the other side of the railing but this was not solitude a few steps away a fat near-sighted man was reading his paper and a group of women were chatting and embroidering a woman with a red wig and two dogs some housekeeper who had come down into the garden in order to give her pets an airing passed several times near the amorous pair smiling discreetly how annoying groaned marguerite why did we ever come to this place the two scrutinized each other carefully wishing to see exactly what transformation time had wrought you are darker than ever she said you look like a man of the sea 
julio was finding her even lovelier than before and felt sure that possessing her was well worth all the contrarieties which had brought about his trip to south america she was taller than he with an elegantly proportioned slenderness she has the musical step desnoyers had told himself when seeing her in his imagination and now on beholding her again the first thing that he admired was her rhythmic tread light and graceful as she passed through the garden seeking another seat her features were not regular but they had a piquant fascination a true parisian face everything that had been invented for the embellishment of feminine charm was used about her person with the most exquisite fastidiousness she had always lived for herself only a few months before had she abdicated a part of this sweet selfishness sacrificing reunions teas and calls in order to give desnoyers some of the afternoon hours End of section four recording by tony oliva albuquerque new mexico section five part one chapter one continued of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez this librivox recording is in the public domain stylish and painted like a priceless doll with no loftier ambition than to be a model interpreting with personal elegance the latest confections of the modistes she was at last experiencing the same preoccupations and joys as other women creating for herself an inner life the nucleus of this new life hidden under her former frivolity was desnoyers just as she was imagining that she had reorganized her existence adjusting the satisfactions of worldly elegance to the delights of love in intimate secrecy a fulminating catastrophe the intervention of her husband whose possible appearance she seemed to have overlooked had disturbed her thoughtless happiness she who was accustomed to think herself the centre of the universe imagining that events ought to revolve around her desires and tastes had suffered this cruel surprise with more astonishment than grief and you how do you think i look marguerite queried i must tell you that the fashion has changed the sheath skirt has passed away now it is worn short and with more fullness desnoyers had to interest himself in her apparel with the same devotion mixing his appreciation of the latest freak of the fashion-monger with his eulogies of marguerite's beauty have you thought much about me she continued you have not been unfaithful to me a single time not even once tell me the truth you know i can always tell when you are lying i have always thought of you he said putting his hand on his heart as if he were swearing before a judge and he said it roundly with an accent of truth since in his infidelities now completely forgotten the memory of marguerite had always been present but let us talk about you added julio what have you been doing all the time he had brought his chair nearer to hers and their knees touched he took one of her hands patting it and putting his finger in the glove opening oh that accursed garden which would not permit greater intimacy and oblige them to speak in a low tone after three months absence in spite of his discretion the man who was reading his paper raised his head and looked irritably at them over his spectacles as though a fly were distracting him with its buzzing the very idea of talking love nonsense in a public garden when all europe was threatened with calamity repelling the audacious hand marguerite spoke tranquilly of her existence during the last months i have passed my life the best i could but i have been greatly bored you know that i I am now living with mamma and mamma is a lady of the old regime who does not understand our tastes i have been to the theatres with my brother i have made many calls on the lawyer in order to learn the progress of my divorce and hurry it along and nothing else and your husband don't let's talk about him do you want to i pity the poor man so good so correct the lawyer assures me that he agrees to everything and will not impose any obstacles they tell me that he does not come to paris that he lives in his factory our old home is closed there are times when i feel remorseful over the way i have treated him and i queried julio withdrawing his hand you are right she returned smiling you are life 
it is cruel but it is human we have to live our lives without taking others into consideration it is necessary to be selfish in order to be happy the two remained silent the remembrance of the husband had swept across them like a glacial blast julio was the first to brighten up and you have not danced in all this time no how could i the very idea a woman in divorce proceedings i have not been to a single chic party since you went away i wanted to preserve a certain decorous morning fiesta how horrible it was it needed you the master they had again clasped hands and were smiling memories of the previous months were passing before their eyes visions of their lives from five to seven in the afternoon dancing in the hotels of the champs elysees where the tango had been inexorably associated with a cup of tea she appeared to tear herself away from these recollections impelled by a tenacious obsession which had slipped from her mind in the first moments of their meeting do you know much about what's happening tell me all people talk so much do you really believe believe that there will be war don't you think that it will all end in some kind of settlement desnoyers comforted her with his optimism he did not believe in the possibility of a war that was ridiculous i say so too ours is not an epoch of savages i have known some germans chic and well-educated persons who surely must think exactly as we do an old professor who comes to the house was explaining yesterday to mamma that wars are no longer possible in these progressive times in two months time there would scarcely be any men left in three the world would find itself without money to continue the struggle i do not recall exactly how it was but he explained it all very clearly in a manner most delightful to hear she reflected in silence trying to coordinate her confused recollections but dismayed by the effort required added on her own account just imagine what war would mean how horrible society life paralyzed no more parties nor clothes nor theatres why it is even possible that they might not design any more fashions all the women in mourning can you imagine it and paris deserted how beautiful it seemed as i came to meet you this afternoon no no it cannot be next month you know we go to vichy mamma needs the waters then to biarritz after that i shall go to a castle on the loire and besides there are our affairs my divorce our marriage which may take place the next year and is war to hinder and cut short all this no no it is not possible my brother and the others like him are foolish enough to dream of danger from germany i am sure that my husband too who is only interested in serious and bothersome matters is among those who believe that war is imminent and prepare to take part in it what nonsense tell me that it is all nonsense nonsense i need to hear you say it tranquilized by the affirmations of her lover she then changed the trend of the conversation the possibility of their approaching marriage brought to mind the object of the voyage which desnoyers had just made there had not been time for them to write to each other during their brief separation did you succeed in getting the money the joy of seeing you made me forget all about such things adopting the air of a business expert he replied that he had brought back less than he expected for he had found the country in the throes of one of its periodical panics but still he had managed to get together about four hundred thousand francs in his purse he had a check for that amount later on they would send him further remittances a ranchman in argentina a sort of relative was looking after his affairs marguerite appeared satisfied and in spite of her frivolity adopted the air of a serious woman money money she exclaimed sententiously and yet there is no happiness without it with your four hundred thousand and what i have we shall be able to get along i told you that my husband wishes to give me back my dowry he has told my brother so but the state of his business and the increased size of his factory do not permit him to return it as quickly as he would like i can't help but feel sorry for the poor man so honourable and so upright in every way if he only were not so commonplace again marguerite seemed to regret these tardy spontaneous eulogies which were chilling their interview so again she changed the trend of her chatter and your family have you seen them desnoyers had been to his father's home before starting for the chapelle expiatoire a stealthy entrance into the great house on the avenue victor hugo and then up to the first floor like a tradesman then he had slipped into the kitchen like a soldier sweetheart of the maids 
his mother had come there to embrace him poor dona luisa weeping and kissing him frantically as though she had feared to lose him for ever close behind her mother had come luisita nicknamed chichi who always surveyed him with sympathetic curiosity as if she wished to know better a brother so bad and adorable who had led decent women from the paths of virtue and committed all kinds of follies then desnoyers had been greatly surprised to see entering the kitchen with the air of a tragedy queen a noble mother of the drama his aunt elena the one who had married a german and was living in berlin surrounded with innumerable children she has been in paris a month she is going to make a little visit to our castle and it appears that her eldest son my cousin the sage whom i have not seen for years is also coming here the home interview had several times been interrupted by fear your father is at home be careful his mother had said to him each time that he had spoken above a whisper and his aunt elena had stationed herself at the door with a dramatic air like a stage heroine resolved to plunge a dagger into the tyrant who should dare to cross the threshold the entire family was accustomed to submit to the rigid authority of don marcelo desnoyers oh that old man exclaimed julio referring to his father he may live many years yet but how he weighs upon us all his mother who had never wearied of looking at him finally had to bring the interview to an end frightened by certain approaching sounds go he might surprise us and he would be furious so julio had fled the paternal home caressed by the tears of the two ladies and the admiring glances of chichi by turns ashamed and proud of a brother who had caused such enthusiasm and scandal among her friends marguerite also spoke of seigneur desnoyers a terrible tyrant of the old school with whom they could never come to an understanding the two remained silent looking fixedly at each other now that they had said the things of greatest urgency present interests became more absorbing more immediate things unspoken seemed to well up in their timid and vacillating eyes before escaping in the form of words they did not dare to talk like lovers here every minute the cloud of witnesses seemed increasing around them the woman with the dogs and the red wig was passing with greater frequency shortening her turns through the square in order to greet them with a smile of complicity the reader of the daily paper was now exchanging views with a friend on a neighboring bench regarding the possibilities of war the garden had become a thoroughfare the modistes upon going out from their establishments and the ladies returning from shopping were crossing through the square in order to shorten their walk the little avenue was a popular shortcut all the pedestrians were casting curious glances at the elegant lady and her companion seated in the shadow of the shrubbery with the timid yet would-be natural look of those who desire to hide themselves yet at the same time feign a casual air End of section five. Recording by Tony Oliva, Albuquerque, New Mexico. section six part one chapter one continued of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez this librivox recording is in the public domain how exasperating sighed marguerite they are going to find us out a girl looked at her so searchingly that she thought she recognized in her an employee of a celebrated modiste besides some of her personal friends who had met her in the crowded shops but an hour ago might be returning home by way of the garden let us go she said rising hurriedly if they should spy us here together just think what they might say and just when they are becoming a little forgetful desnoyers protested crossly go away paris had become a shrunken place for them nowadays because marguerite refused to go to a single place where there was a possibility of their being surprised in another square in a restaurant wherever they might go they would run the same risk of being recognized she would only consider meeting in public places and yet at the same time dreaded the curiosity of the people if marguerite would like to go to his studio of such 
sweet memories to your home no no indeed she replied emphatically i cannot forget the last time i was there but julio insisted foreseeing a break in that firm negative where could they be more comfortable besides weren't they going to marry as soon as possible i tell you no she repeated who knows but my husband may be watching me what a complication for my divorce if he should surprise us in your house now it was he who eulogized the husband insisting that such watchfulness was incompatible with his character the engineer had accepted the facts considering them irreparable and was now thinking only of reconstructing his life no it is better for us to separate she continued to-morrow we shall see each other again you will hunt a more favorable place think it over and you will find a solution for it all but he wished an immediate solution they had abandoned their seats going slowly toward the rue des maturins julio was speaking with a trembling and persuasive eloquence to-morrow no now they had only to call a taxicab it would be only a matter of a few minutes and then the isolation the mystery the return to a sweet past to that intimacy in the studio where they had passed their happiest hours they would believe that no time had elapsed since their first meetings no she faltered with a weakening accent seeking a last resistance besides your secretary might be there that spaniard who lives with you how ashamed i would be to meet him again julio laughed argensola how could that comrade who knew all about their past be an obstacle if they should happen to meet him in the house he would be sure to leave immediately more than once he had had to go out so as not to be in the way his discretion was such that he had foreseen events probably he had already left conjecturing that a near visit would be the most logical thing his chum would simply go wandering through the streets in search of news marguerite was silent as though yielding on seeing her pretexts exhausted desnoyers was silent too construing her stillness as assent they had left the garden and she was looking around uneasily terrified to find herself in the open street beside her lover and seeking a hiding place suddenly she saw before her the little red door of an automobile opened by the hand of her adorer get in ordered julio and she climbed in hastily anxious to hide herself as soon as possible the vehicle started at great speed marguerite immediately pulled down the shade of the window on her side but before she had finished and could turn her head she felt a hungry mouth kissing the nape of her neck no not here she said in a pleading tone let us be sensible and while he rebellious at these exhortations persisted in his advances the voice of marguerite again sounded above the noise of the rattling machinery of the automobile as it bounded over the pavement do you really believe that there will be no war do you believe that we will be able to marry tell me again i want you to encourage me i need to hear it from your lips end of section six recording by tony oliva albuquerque new mexico section seven part one chapter two of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez this librivox recording is in the public domain madariaga the centaur in eighteen seventy marcelo desnoyers was nineteen years old he was born in the suburbs of paris an only child his father interested in little building speculations maintained his family in modest comfort the mason wished to make an architect of his son and marcelo was in the midst of his preparatory studies when his father suddenly died leaving his affairs greatly involved in a few months he and his mother descended the slopes of ruin and were obliged to give up their snug middle-class quarters and live like laborers when the fourteen-year-old boy had to choose a trade he learned wood carving this craft was an art related to the tastes away in marcelo by his abandoned studies his mother retired to the country living with some relatives while the lad advanced rapidly in the shops aiding his master in all the important orders which he received from the provinces the first news of the war with prussia surprised him in marseilles working on the decorations of a theatre 
marcelo was opposed to the empire like all the youths of his generation he was also much influenced by the older workmen who had taken part in the republic of forty eight and who still retained vivid recollections of the coup d'etat of the second of december one day he saw in the streets of marseilles a popular manifestation in favor of peace which was practically a protest against the government the old republicans in their implacable struggle with the emperor the companies of the international which had just been organized and a great number of italians and spaniards who had fled their countries on account of recent insurrections composed the procession a long-haired consumptive student was carrying the flag it is peace that we want a peace which may unite all mankind chanted the paraders but on this earth the noblest propositions are seldom heard since destiny amuses herself in perverting them and turning them aside scarcely had the friends of peace entered the rue cambiere with their hymn and standard when war came to meet them obliging them to resort to fist and club the day before some battalions of zouaves from algiers had disembarked in order to reinforce the army on the frontier and these veterans accustomed to colonial existence and undiscriminating as to the cause of disturbances seized the opportunity to intervene in this manifestation some with bayonets and others with ungirded belts hurrah for the war and a rain of lashes and blows fell upon the unarmed singers marcelo saw the innocent student the standard bearer of peace knocked down wrapped in his flag by the merry kicks of the zouave then he knew no more since he had received various blows with a leather strap and a knife thrust in his shoulder he had to run the same as the others that day developed for the first time his fiery stubborn character irritable before contradiction even to the point of adopting the most extreme resolution down with war since it was not possible for him to protest in any other way he would leave the country the emperor might arrange his affairs as best he could the struggle was going to be long and disastrous according to the enemies of the empire if he stayed he would in a few months be drawn for the soldiery desnoyers renounced the honor of serving the emperor he hesitated a little when he thought of his mother but his country relatives would not turn her out and he planned to work very hard and send her money who knew what riches might be waiting for him on the other side of the sea good by france thanks to his savings a harbor official found it to his interest to offer him the choice of three boats one was sailing to egypt another to australia another to montevideo and buenos aires which made the strongest appeal to him desnoyers remembering his readings wished to consult the wind and follow the course that it indicated as he had seen various heroes of novels do but that day the wind blew from the sea toward france he also wished to toss up a coin in order to test his fate finally he decided upon the vessel sailing first not until with his scanty baggage he was actually on the deck of the next boat to anchor did he take any interest in its course for the rio de la plata and he accepted these words with a fatalistic shrug very well let it be south america the country was not distasteful to him since he knew it by certain travel publications whose illustrations represented herds of cattle at liberty half-naked plumed indians and hairy cowboys whirling over their heads serpentine lassos tipped with balls the millionaire desnoyers never forgot that trip to america forty-three days navigating in a little worn-out steamer that rattled like a heap of old iron groaned in all its joints at the slightest roughness of the sea and had to stop four times for repairs at the mercy of the winds and waves in montevideo he learned of the reverses suffered by his country and that the french empire no longer existed he felt a little ashamed when he heard that the nation was now self-governing defending itself gallantly behind the walls of paris and he had fled months afterwards 
the events of the commune consoled him for his flight if he had remained wrath at the national downfall his relations with his co-laborers the air in which he lived everything would surely have dragged him along to revolt in that case he would have been shot or consigned to a colonial prison like so many of his former comrades so his determination crystallized and he stopped thinking about the affairs of his mother country the necessities of existence in a foreign land whose language he was beginning to pick up made him think only of himself the turbulent and adventurous life of these new nations compelled him to most absurd expedients and varied occupations yet he felt himself strong with an audacity and self-reliance which he never had in the old world i am equal to everything he said if they only give me time to prove it although he had fled from his country in order not to take up arms he even led a soldier's life for a brief period in his adopted land receiving a wound in one of the many hostilities between the whites and reds in the unsettled districts in buenos aires he again worked as a wood carver the city was beginning to expand breaking its shell as a large village desnoyers spent many years ornamenting salons and facades it was a laborious existence sedentary and remunerative but one day he became tired of this slow saving which could only bring him a mediocre fortune after a long time he had gone to the new world to become rich like so many others and at twenty-seven he started forth again a full-fledged adventurer avoiding the cities wishing to snatch money from untapped natural sources he worked farms in the forests of the north but the locusts obliterated his crops in a few hours he was a cattle driver with the aid of only two peons driving a herd of oxen and mules over the snowy solitudes of the andes to bolivia and chile in this life making journeys of many months duration across interminable plains he lost exact account of time and space just as he thought himself on the verge of winning a fortune he lost it all by an unfortunate speculation and in a moment of failure and despair being now thirty years old he became an employee of julio madariaga he knew of this rustic millionaire through his purchases of flocks a spaniard who had come to the country when very young adapting himself very easily to its customs and living like a cowboy after he had acquired enormous properties the country folk wishing to put a title of respect before his name called him don madariaga comrade he said to desnoyers one day when he happened to be in a good humor a very rare thing for him you must have passed through many ups and downs your lack of silver may be smelled a long ways off why lead such a dog's life trust in me frenchy and remain here i am growing old and i need a man after the frenchman had arranged to stay with madariaga every landed proprietor living within fifteen or twenty leagues of the ranch stopped the new employee on the road to prophesy all sorts of misfortune you will not stay long nobody can get along with don madariaga we have lost count of his overseers he is a man who must be killed or deserted soon you will go too desnoyers did not doubt but that there was some truth in all this madariaga was an impossible character but feeling a certain sympathy with the frenchman had tried not to annoy him with his irritability he's a regular pearl this frenchy said the plainsman as though trying to excuse himself for his considerate treatment of his latest acquisition i like him because he is very serious that is the way i like a man desnoyers did not know exactly what this much admired seriousness could be but he felt a secret pride in seeing him aggressive with everybody else even his family whilst he took with him a tone of paternal bluffness the family consisted of his wife misia petrona whom he always called the china 
and two grown daughters who had gone to school in buenos aires but on returning to the ranch had reverted somewhat to their original rusticity madariaga's fortune was enormous he had lived in the field since his arrival in america when the white race had not dared to settle outside the towns for fear of the indians he had gained his first money as a fearless trader taking merchandise in a cart from fort to fort he had killed indians was twice wounded by them and for a while had lived as a captive with an indian chief whom he finally succeeded in making his staunch friend with his earnings he had bought land much land almost worthless because of its insecurity devoting it to the raising of cattle that he had to defend gun in hand from the pirates of the plains then he had married his china a young half-breed who was running around barefoot but owned many of her forefathers fields they had lived in an almost savage poverty on their property which would have taken many a day's journey to go around afterwards when the government was pushing the indians towards the frontiers and offering the abandoned lands for sale considering it a patriotic sacrifice on the part of any one wishing to acquire them madariaga bought and bought at the lowest figure and the longest terms to get possession of vast tracts and populate it with blooded stock became the mission of his life at times galloping with desnoyers through his boundless fields he was not able to repress his pride tell me something frenchy they say that further up the country there are some nations about the size of my ranches is that so the frenchman agreed the lands of madariaga were indeed greater than many principalities this put the old plainsman in a rare good humor and he exclaimed in the cowboy vernacular which had become second nature to him then it wouldn't be absurd to proclaim myself king some day just imagine it frenchy don madariaga the first the worst of it all is that i would also be the last for the china will not give me a son she is a weak cow end of section seven recording by tony oliva albuquerque new mexico section eight part one chapter two continued of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez this librivox recording is in the public domain the fame of his vast territories and his wealth in stock reached even to buenos aires every one knew of madariaga by name although very few had seen him when he went to the capital he passed unnoticed because of his country aspect the same leggings that he was used to wearing in the fields his poncho wrapped around him like a muffler above which rose the aggressive points of a necktie a tormenting ornament imposed by his daughters who in vain arranged it with loving hands that he might look a little more respectable one day he entered the office of the richest merchant of the capital sir i know that you need some young bulls for the european market and i have come to sell you a few the man of affairs looked haughtily at the poor cowboy he might explain his errand to one of the employees he could not waste his time on such small matters but the malicious grin on the rustic's face awoke his curiosity and how many are you able to sell my good man About about thirty thousand sir it was not necessary to hear more the supercilious merchant sprang from his desk and obsequiously offered him a seat you can be no other than don madariaga at the service of god and yourself sir he responded in the manner of a spanish countryman that was the most glorious moment of his existence in the outer door of the directors of the bank the clerks offered him a seat until the personage the other side of the door should deign to receive him but scarcely was his name announced than that same director ran to admit him and the employee was stupefied to 
here the ranchman say by way of greeting i have come to draw out three hundred thousand dollars i have abundant pasturage and i wish to buy a ranch or two in order to stock them his arbitrary and contradictory character weighed upon the inhabitants of his lands with both cruel and good-natured tyranny no vagabond ever pass by the ranch without being rudely assailed by its owner from the outset don't tell me any of your hard luck stories friend he would yell as if he were going to beat him under the shed is a skinned beast cut and eat as much as you wish and so help yourself to continue your journey but no more of your yarns and he would turn his back upon the tramp after giving him a few dollars one day he became infuriated because a peon was nailing the wire fencing too deliberately on the posts everybody was robbing him the following day he spoke of a large sum of money that he would have to pay for having endorsed the note of an acquaintance completely bankrupt poor fellow his luck is worse than mine upon finding in the road the skeleton of a recently killed sheep he was beside himself with indignation it was not because because of the loss of the meat hunger knows no law and god has made meat for mankind to eat but they might at least have left the skin and he would rage against such wickedness always repeating lack of religion and good habits the next time the bandits stripped the flesh off the three cows leaving the skins in full view and the ranchman said smiling that is the way i like people honorable and doing no wrong his vigor as a tireless centaur had helped him powerfully in his task of populating his lands he was capricious despotic and with the same paternal instincts as his compatriots who centuries before when conquering the new world had clarified its native blood like the castilian conquistadors he had a fancy for copper-colored beauty with oblique eyes and straight hair when desnoyers saw him going off on some sudden pretext putting his horse at full gallop toward a neighboring ranch he would say to himself smilingly he is going in search of a new peon who will help work his land fifteen years from now the personnel of the ranch often used to comment on the resemblance of certain youths laboring here the same as the others galloping from the first streak of dawn over the fields attending to the various duties of pasturing the overseer celedonio a half-breed thirty years old generally detested for his hard and avaricious character also bore a distant resemblance to the patron almost every year some woman from a great distance dirty and bad-faced presented herself at the ranch leading by the hand a little mongrel with eyes like live coals she would ask to speak with the proprietor alone and upon being confronted with her he usually recalled a trip made ten or twelve years before in order to buy a herd of cattle you remember patron that you passed the night on my ranch because the river had risen the patron did not remember anything about it but a vague instinct warned him that the woman was probably telling the truth well what of it patron here he is it is better for him to grow to manhood by your side than in any other place and she presented him with the little hybrid one more and offered with such simplicity lack of religion and good habits then with sudden modesty he doubted the woman's veracity why must it necessarily be his but his wavering was generally short-lived if it's mine put it with the others the mother went away tranquilly seeing the youngster's future assured because this man so lavish in violence was equally so in generosity in time there would be a bit of land and a good flock of sheep for the urchin these adoptions at first aroused in missia petrona a little rebellion the only ones of her life but the centaur soon reduced her to terrified silence and you dare to complain of me you weak cow a woman who has only given me daughters you ought to be ashamed of yourself the same hand that negligently extracted from its pocket a wad of bills rolled into a ball giving them away capriciously without knowing just how much also wore a lash hanging from the wrist it was supposed to be for his horse but it was used with equal facility when any of his peons incurred his wrath 
i strike because i can he would say to pacify himself one day the man receiving the blow took a step backward hunting for the knife in his belt you are not going to beat me patron i was not born in these parts i come from corrientes the patron remained with upraised thong is it true that you were not born here then you are right i cannot beat you here are five dollars for you when desnoyers came on the place madariaga was beginning to lose count of those who were under his dominion in the old latin sense and could take his blows there were so many that confusion often reigned the frenchman admired the patron's expert eye for his business it was enough for him to contemplate for a few moments a herd of cattle to know its exact number he would go galloping along with an indifferent air around an immense group of horned and stamping beasts and then would suddenly begin to separate the different animals he had discovered that they were sick with a buyer like madariaga all the tricks and sharp practice of the drovers came to naught his serenity before trouble was also admirable a drought suddenly strewed his plains with dead cattle making the land seem like an abandoned battlefield everywhere great black hulks in the air great spirals of crows coming from leagues away at other times it was the cold an unexpected drop in the thermometer would cover the ground with dead bodies ten thousand animals fifteen thousand perhaps more all perished what a knockout madariaga would exclaim with resignation without such troubles this earth would be a paradise now the thing to do is to save the skins and he would rail against the false pride of the immigrants against the new customs among the poor which prevented his securing enough hands to strip the victims quickly so that thousands of hides had to be lost their bones whitened the earth like heaps of snow the peoncitos little peons went around putting the skulls of cows with crumpled horns on the posts of the wire fences a rustic decoration which suggested a procession of grecian liars it is lucky that the land is left anyway added the ranchman he loved to race around his immense fields when they were beginning to turn green in the late rains he had been among the first to convert these virgin wastes into rich meadowlands supplementing the natural pasturage with alfalfa where one beast had found sustenance before he now had three the table is set he would chuckle we must now go in search of the guests and he kept on buying at ridiculous prices herds dying of hunger in others uncultivated fields constantly increasing his opulent lands and stock one morning desnoyers saved his life the old ranchman had raised his lash against a recently arrived peon who returned the attack knife in hand madariaga was defending himself as best he could convinced from one minute to another that he was going to receive the deadly knife thrust when desnoyers arrived and drawing his revolver overcame and disarmed the adversary thanks frenchy said the ranchman much touched you are an all-round man and i am going to reward you from this day i shall speak to you as i do of my family desnoyers did not know just what this familiar talk might amount to for his employer was so peculiar certain personal favors nevertheless immediately began to improve his position he was no longer allowed to eat in the administration building the proprietor insisting imperiously that henceforth desnoyers should sit at his own table and thus he was admitted into the intimate life of the madariaga family End of section 8. Recording by Tony Oliva, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Section 9, Part 1, Chapter 2 Continued of the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse by Vicente Blasco Ibanez. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain the wife was always silent when her husband was present she was used to rising in the middle of the night in order to oversee the breakfasts of the peons the distribution of biscuit and the boiling of the great black kettles of coffee or shrub tea she looked after the chattering and lazy maids who so easily managed to get lost in the nearby groves 
in the kitchen too she made her authority felt like a regular house mistress but the minute that she heard her husband's voice she shrank into a respectful and timorous silence upon sitting down at table the china would look at him with devoted submission her great round eyes fixed on him like an owl's desnoyers felt that in this mute admiration was mingled great astonishment at the energy with which the ranchman already over seventy was continuing to bring new occupants to live on his domain the two daughters luisa and elena accepted with enthusiasm the new arrival who came to enliven the monotonous conversations in the dining-room so often cut short by their father's wrathful outbursts besides he was from paris paris sighed elena the younger one rolling her eyes and desnoyers was henceforth consulted in all matters of style every time they ordered any confections from the shops of buenos aires the interior of the house reflected the different tastes of the two generations the girls had a parlor with a few handsome pieces of furniture placed against the cracked walls and some showy lamps that were never lighted the father with his boorishness often invaded this room so cherished and admired by the two sisters making the carpets look shabby and faded under his muddy boot tracks upon the gilt centre table he loved to lay his lash samples of maize scattered its grains over a silk sofa which the young ladies tried to keep very choice as though they feared it might break near the entrance to the dining-room was a weighing machine and madariaga became furious when his daughters asked him to remove it to the offices he was not going to trouble himself to go outside every time that he wanted to know the weight of a leather skin a piano came into the ranch and elena passed the hours practicing exercises with desperate good will heavens and earth she might at least play the jota or the perican or some other lively spanish dance and the irate father at the hour of siesta betook himself to the nearby eucalyptus trees to sleep upon his poncho this younger daughter whom he dubbed la romantica was the special victim of his wrath and ridicule where had she picked up so many tastes which he and his good china never had had music books were piled on the piano in a corner of the absurd parlor were some wooden boxes that had held preserves which the ranch carpenter had been made to press into service as a bookcase look here frenchy scoffed madariaga all these are novels and poems pure lies hot air he had his private library vastly more important and glorious and occupying less space in his desk adorned with guns thongs and chaps studded with silver was a little compartment containing deeds and various legal documents which the ranchman surveyed with great pride pay attention now and hear marvellous things announced the master to desnoyers as he took out one of his memorandum books this volume contained the pedigree of the famous animals which had improved his breeds of stock the genealogical trees the patents of nobility of his aristocratic beasts he would have to read its contents to him since he did not permit even his family to touch these records and with his spectacles on the end of his nose he would spell out the credentials of each animal celebrity diamond three grandson of diamond one owned by the king of england son of diamond two winner in the races his diamond had cost him many thousands but the finest horses on the ranch those which brought the most marvellous prices were his descendants that horse had more sense than most people he only lacked the power to talk he's the one that's stuffed near the door of the parlor the girls wanted him thrown out just let them dare to touch him i'd chuck them out first then he would continue reading the history of a dynasty of bulls with distinctive names and a succession of roman numbers the same as kings animals acquired by the stubborn ranchman in the great cattle fairs of england he had never been there but he had used the cable in order to compete 
in pounds sterling with the british owners who wished to keep such valuable stock in their own country thanks to these blue-blooded sires that had crossed the ocean with all the luxury of millionaire passengers he had been able to exhibit in the concourses of buenos aires animals which were veritable towers of meat edible elephants with their sides as fit and sleek as a table that book amounts to something don't you think so frenchy it is worth more than all those pictures of moons lakes lovers and other gewgaws that my romantica puts on the walls to catch the dust and he would point out in contrast the precious diplomas which were adorning his desk the metal vases and other trophies won in the fairs by the descendants of his blooded stock luisa the elder daughter called chicha in the south american fashion was much more respected by her father she is my poor china right over again he said the same good nature and the same faculty for work but more of a lady desnoyers entirely agreed with him and yet the father's description seemed to him weak and incomplete he could not admit that the pale modest girl with the great black eyes and smile of childish mischief bore the slightest resemblance to the respectable matron who had brought her into existence the great fiesta for chicha was the sunday mass it represented a journey of three leagues to the nearest village a weekly contact with people unlike those of the ranch a carriage drawn by four horses took the senora and the two senoritas in the latest suits and hats arrived via buenos aires from europe at the suggestion of chicha desnoyers accompanied them in the capacity of driver the father remained at home taking advantage of this opportunity to survey his fields in their sunday solitude thus keeping a closer oversight on the shiftlessness of his hands he was very religious religion and good manners you know but had he not given thousands of dollars toward building the neighboring church a man of his fortune should not be submitted to the same obligations as ragamuffins during the sunday lunch the young ladies were apt to make comments upon the persons and merits of the young men of the village and neighboring ranches who had lingered at the church door in order to chat with them don't fool yourselves girls observed the father shrewdly you believe that they want you for your elegance don't you what those shameless fellows really want are the dollars of old Madara and once they had them they would probably give you a daily beating for a while the ranch received numerous visitors some were young men of the neighborhood who arrived on spirited steeds performing all kinds of tricks of fancy horsemanship they wanted to see don julio on the most absurd pretexts and at the same time improved the opportunity to chat with chicha and luisa at other times they were youths from buenos aires asking for a lodging at the ranch as they were just passing by don madariaga would growl another good-for-nothing scamp who comes in search of the spanish ranchman if he doesn't move on soon i'll kick him out but the suitor did not stand long on the order of his going intimidated by the ominous silence of the patron this silence of late had persisted in an alarming manner in spite of the fact that the ranch was no longer receiving visitors madariaga appeared abstracted and all the family including desnoyers respected and feared his taciturnity he ate scowling with lowered head suddenly he would raise his eyes looking at chicha then at desnoyers finally fixing them upon his wife as though asking her to give an account of things his romantica simply did not exist for him the only notice that he ever took of her was to give an ironical snort when he happened to see her leaning at sunset against the doorway looking at the reddening glow one elbow on the door frame and her cheek in her hand in imitation of the posture of a certain white lady that she had seen in a chromo awaiting the night of her dreams desnoyers had been five years in the house when one day he entered his master's private office with the brusque air of a timid person who has suddenly reached a decision don julio 
i am going to leave and i would like our accounts settled madariaga looked at him slyly going to leave eh what for but in vain he repeated his questions the frenchman was floundering through a series of incoherent explanations i'm going i've got to go ah you thief you false prophet shouted the ranchman in stentorian tones but desnoyers did not quail before the insults he had often heard his patron use these same words when holding somebody up to ridicule or haggling with certain cattle drovers ah you thief you false prophet do you suppose that i do not know why you are going do you suppose old madariaga has not seen your languishing looks and those of my dead fly of a daughter clasping each other's hands in the presence of poor china who is blinded in her judgment it's not such a bad stroke frenchy by it you would be able to get possession of half of the old spaniard's dollars and then say that you had made it in america and while he was storming or rather howling all this he had grasped his lash and with the butt end kept poking his manager in the stomach with such insistence that it might be construed in an affectionate or hostile way for this reason i have come to bid you good-bye said desnoyers haughtily i know that my love is absurd and i wish to leave the gentleman would go away the ranchman continued spluttering the gentleman believes that here one can do what one pleases no siree here nobody commands but old madariaga and i order you to stay ah these women they only serve to antagonize men and yet we can't live without them he took several turns up and down the room as though his last words were making him think of something very different from what he had just been saying desnoyers looked uneasily at the thong which was still hanging from his wrist suppose he should attempt to whip him as he did the peons he was still undecided whether to hold his own against a man who had always treated him with benevolence or while his back was turned to take refuge in discreet flight when the ranchman planted himself before him you really love her really he asked are you sure that she loves you be careful what you say for love is blind and deceitful i too when i married my china was crazy about her do you love her honestly and truly well then take her you devilish frenchy somebody has to take her and may she not turn out a weak cow like her mother let us have the ranch full of grandchildren in voicing this stock raiser's wish again appeared the great breeder of beasts and men and as though he considered it necessary to explain his concession he added i do this because i like you and i like you because you're serious end of section nine recording by tony oliva albuquerque new mexico section ten part one chapter two continued of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez this librivox recording is in the public domain again the frenchman was plunged in doubt not knowing in just what this greatly appreciated seriousness consisted at his wedding desnoyers thought much of his mother if only the poor old woman could witness this extraordinary stroke of good fortune but she had died the year before believing her son enormously rich because he had been sending her sixty dollars every month taken from the wages that he had earned on the ranch desnoyers entrance into the family made his father-in-law pay less attention to business city life with all its untried enchantments and snares now attracted madariaga and he began to speak with contempt of country women poorly groomed and inspiring him with disgust he had given up his cowboy attire and was displaying with childish satisfaction the new suits in which a tailor of the capital was trying to disguise him when he wished to accompany him to buenos aires he would wriggle out of it trumping up some absorbing business no you go with your mother 
the fate of his fields and flocks gave him no uneasiness his fortune managed by desnoyers was in good hands he is very serious again affirmed the old spaniard to his family assembled in the dining-room as serious as i am nobody can make a fool of him and finally the frenchman concluded that when his father-in-law spoke of seriousness he was referring to his strength of character according to the spontaneous declaration of madariaga he had from the very first day that he had dealings with desnoyers perceived in him a nature like his own more hard and firm perhaps but without splurges of eccentricities on this account he had treated him with such extraordinary circumspection foreseeing that a clash between the two could never be adjusted their only disagreements were about the expenses established by madariaga during his regime since the son-in-law was managing the ranches the work was costing less and the people working more diligently and that too without yells and without strong words and deeds with only his presence and brief orders the old man was the only one defending the capricious system of a blow followed by a gift he revolted against a minute and mechanical administration always the same without any arbitrary extravagance or good-natured tyranny very frequently some of the half-breed peons whom a malicious public supposed to be closely related to the ranchman would present themselves before desnoyers with senor manager the old patron say that you are to give me five dollars the senor manager would refuse and soon after madariaga would rush in in a furious temper but measuring his words nevertheless remembering that his son-in-law's disposition was as serious as his own i like you very much my son but here no one overrules me ah frenchy you are like all the rest of your countrymen once you get your claws on a penny it goes into your stocking and never more sees the light of day even though they crucify you did i say five dollars give him ten i command it and that is enough the frenchman paid shrugging his shoulders whilst his father-in-law satisfied with his triumph fled to buenos aires it was a good thing to have it well understood that the ranch still belonged to madariaga the spaniard from one of these trips he returned with a companion a young german who according to him knew everything and could do everything his son-in-law was working too hard this karl hartrott would assist him in the bookkeeping desnoyers accepted the situation and in a few days felt increasing esteem for the new incumbent although they belonged to two unfriendly nations it didn't matter there are good people everywhere and this karl was a subordinate worth considering he kept his distance from his equals and was hard and inflexible toward his inferiors all his faculties seemed concentrated in service and admiration for those above him scarcely would madariaga open his lips before the german's head began nodding in agreement anticipating his words if he said anything funny his clerk's laugh would break forth in scandalous roars with desnoyers he appeared more taciturn working without stopping for hours at a time as soon as he saw the manager entering the office he would leap from his seat holding himself erect with military precision he was always ready to do anything whatever unasked he spied on the workmen reporting their carelessness and mistakes this last service did not especially please his superior officer but he appreciated it as a sign of interest in the establishment the old old man bragged triumphantly of the new acquisition urging his son-in-law also to rejoice a very useful fellow isn't he these gringos from germany work well know a good many things and cost little then too so disciplined so servile i am sorry to praise him so to you because you are a frenchy and your nation has in them a very powerful enemy his people are a hard-shelled race desnoyers replied with a shrug of indifference his country was far away and so was germany who knew if they would ever return they were both argentinians now and ought to interest themselves in present affairs and not bother about the past and how little pride they have 
sneered madariaga in an ironical tone every one of these gringos when he is a clerk at the capital sweeps the shop prepares the meals keeps the books sells to the customers works the typewriter translates four or five languages and dances attendance on the proprietor's lady friend as though she were a grand senora all for twenty-five dollars a month who can compete with such people you frenchy you are like me very serious and would die of hunger before passing through certain things but mark my words on this very account they are going to become a terrible people after brief reflection the ranchman added perhaps they are not so good as they seem just see how they treat those under them it may be that they affect this simplicity without having it and when they grin at receiving a kick they are saying inside just wait till my turn comes and i'll give you three then he suddenly seemed to repent of his suspicions at any rate this carl is a poor fellow a mealy-mouthed simpleton who the minute i say anything opens his jaws like a flycatcher he insists that he comes from a great family but who knows anything about these gringos all of us dead with hunger when we reach america claim to be sons of princes madariaga had placed himself on a familiar footing with his teutonic treasure not through gratitude as with desnoyers but in order to make him feel his inferiority he had also introduced him on an equal footing in his home but only that he might give piano lessons to his younger daughter the romantica was no longer framing herself in the doorway in the gloaming watching the sunset reflections when karl had finished his work in the office he was now coming to the house and seating himself beside elena who was tinkling away with a persistence worthy of a better fate at the end of the hour the german accompanying himself on the piano would sing fragments from wagner in such a way that it put madariaga to sleep in his armchair with his great paraguay cigar sticking out of his mouth elena meanwhile was contemplating with increasing interest the singing gringo he was not the knight of her dreams awaited by the fair lady he was almost a servant a blonde immigrant with reddish hair fat heavy and with bovine eyes that reflected an eternal fear of disagreeing with his chiefs but day by day she was finding in him something which rather modified these impressions his feminine fairness except where he was burned by the sun the increasingly martial aspect of his mustachios the agility with which he mounted his horse his air of a troubadour intoning with a rather weak tenor voluptuous romances whose words she did not understand one night just before supper the impressionable girl announced with a feverish excitement which she could no longer repress that she had made a grand discovery papa karl is of noble birth he belongs to a great family the plainsman made a gesture of indifference other things were vexing him in those days but during the evening feeling the necessity of venting on somebody the wrath which had been gnawing at his vitals since his last trip to buenos aires he interrupted the singer see here gringo what's all this nonsense about nobility which you have been telling my girl karl left the piano that he might draw himself up to the approved military position before responding under the influence of his recent song his pose suggested lohengrin about to reveal the secret of his life his father had been general von hartrott one of the commanders in the war of seventy the emperor had rewarded his services by giving him a title one of his uncles was an intimate counsellor of the king of prussia his older brothers were conspicuous in the most select regiments he had carried a sword as a lieutenant bored with all this grandeur madariaga interrupted him lies nonsense hot air the very idea of a gringo talking to him about nobility he had left europe when very young in order to cast in his lot with the revolting democracies of america and although nobility now seemed to him something out of date and incomprehensible still he stoutly maintained that the only true nobility was that of his own country he would yield first place to the gringos for the invention of machinery and ships and for breeding priceless animals but all the counts and marquises of gringoland appeared to him to be fictitious 
fictitious characters all tomfoolery he blustered there isn't any nobility in your country nor have you five dollars all told to rub against each other if you had you wouldn't come over here to play the gallant to women who are you know what they are as well as i do to the astonishment of desnoyers the german received this onslaught with much humility nodding his head in agreement with the patron's last words if there is any truth in all this twaddle about titles continued madariaga implacably swords and uniforms what did you come here for what in the devil did you do in your own country that you had to leave it now karl hung his head confused and stuttering papa papa pleaded elena the poor little fellow how can you humiliate him so just because he is poor and she felt a deep gratitude toward her brother-in-law when he broke through his usual reserve in order to come to the rescue of the german oh yes of course he's a good enough fellow said madariaga excusing himself but he comes from a land that i detest when desnoyers made a trip to buenos aires a few days afterward the cause of the old man's wrath was explained it appeared that for some months past madariaga had been the financial guarantor and devoted swain of a german prima donna stranded in south america with an italian opera company it was she who had recommended karl an unfortunate countryman who after wandering through many parts of the continent was now living with her as a sort of gentlemanly singer madariaga had joyously expended upon this courtesan many thousands of dollars a childish enthusiasm had accompanied him in this novel existence midst urban dissipations until he happened to discover that his fraulein was leading another life during his absence laughing at him with the parasites of her retinue whereupon he arose in his wrath and bade her farewell to the accompaniment of blows and broken furniture end of section ten recording by tony oliva albuquerque new mexico section eleven part one chapter two continued of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez this librivox recording is in the public domain the last adventure of his life desnoyers suspected his abdication upon hearing him admit his age for the first time he did not intend to return to the capital it was all false glitter existence in the country surrounded by all his family and doing good to the poor was the only sure thing and the terrible centaur expressed himself with the idyllic tenderness and firm virtue of seventy-five years already insensible to temptation after his scene with karl he had increased the german's salary trying as usual to counteract the effects of his violent outbreaks with generosity that which he could not forget was his dependent's nobility constantly making it the subject of new jests that glorious boast had brought to his mind the genealogical trees of the illustrious ancestry of his prize cattle the german was a pedigreed fellow and thenceforth he called him by that nickname seated on summer nights under the awning he surveyed his family around him with a sort of patriarchal ecstasy in the evening hush could be heard the buzzing of insects and the croaking of the frogs from the distant ranches floated the songs of the peons as they prepared their suppers it was harvest time and great bands of immigrants were encamped in the fields for the extra work madariaga had known many of the hard old days of wars and violence upon his arrival in south america he had witnessed the last years of the tyranny of rosas he loved to enumerate the different provincial and national revolutions in which he had taken part but all this had disappeared and would never return these were the times of peace 
peace work and abundance just think of it frenchy he said driving away the mosquitoes with the puffs of his cigar i am spanish you french carl german my daughters argentinians the cook russian his assistant greek the stable boy english the kitchen servants chinas natives galicians or italians and among the peons there are many castes and laws and yet we all live in peace in europe we would probably have been in a grand fight by this time but here we are all friends he took much pleasure in listening to the music of the laborers laments from italian songs to the accompaniment of the accordion spanish guitars and creole choruses wild voices chanting of love and death this is a regular noah's ark exulted the vainglorious patriarch he means the tower of babel thought desnoyers to himself but it's all the same thing to the old man i believe he rambled on that we live thus because in this part of the world there are no kings and a very small army and mankind is thinking only of enjoying itself as much as possible thanks to its work i also believe that we live so peacefully because there is such abundance that every one gets his share how quickly we would spring to arms if the rations were less than the people again he fell into reflective silence shortly after announcing the result of his meditations be that as it may be we must recognize that here life is more tranquil than in the other world men are taken for what they are worth and mingle together without thinking whether they came from one country or another over here fellows do not come in droves to kill other fellows whom they do not know and whose only crime is that they were born in an unfriendly country man is a bad beast everywhere i know that but here he eats owns more land than he needs so that he can stretch himself and he is good with the goodness of a well-fed dog over there there are too many they live in heaps getting in each other's way and easily run amuck hurrah for peace frenchy and the simple life where a man can live comfortably and runs no danger of being killed for things he doesn't understand there is his real homeland and as though an echo of the rustic's reflections carl seated at the piano began chanting in a low voice one of beethoven's hymns we sing the joy of life we sing of liberty will ne'er betray our fellow-man though great the guerdon be peace a few days afterward desnoyers recalled bitterly the old man's illusion for war domestic war broke loose in this idyllic stage setting of ranch life run senor manager the old patron has unsheathed his knife and is going to kill the german and desnoyers had hurried from his office warned by the peon's summons madariaga was chasing carl knife in hand stumbling over everything that blocked his way only his son-in-law dared to stop him and disarm him that shameless pedigreed fellow bellowed the livid old man as he writhed in desnoyers firm clutch half famished all he thinks he has to do is come to my house and take away my daughters and dollars let me go i tell you let me loose that i may kill him and in order to free himself from desnoyers he tried further to explain the difficulty he had accepted the frenchman as a husband for his daughter because he was to his liking modest honest and serious but this singing pedigreed fellow with all his airs he was a man that he had gotten from well he didn't wish to say just where and the frenchman though knowing perfectly well what his introduction to karl had been pretended not to understand him as the german had by this time made good his escape the ranchman consented to being pushed toward his house talking all the time about giving a beating to the romantica and another to the china for not having informed him of the courtship 
he had surprised his daughter and the gringo holding hands and exchanging kisses in a grove near the house he's after my dollars howled the irate father he wants america to enrich him quickly at the expense of the old spaniard and that is the reason for so much truckling so much psalm singing and so much nobility impostor musician and he repeated the word musician with contempt as though it were the sum and substance of everything vile very firmly and with few words desnoyers brought the wrangling to an end while her brother-in-law protected her retreat the romantica clinging to her mother had taken refuge in the top of the house sobbing and moaning oh the poor little fellow everybody against him her sister meanwhile was exerting all the powers of a discreet daughter with the rampageous old man in the office and desnoyers had gone in search of karl finding that he had not yet recovered from the shock of his terrible surprise he gave him a horse advising him to betake himself as quickly as possible to the nearest railway station although the german was soon far from the ranch he did not long remain alone in a few days the romantica followed him isolt of the white hands went in search of tristan the knight this event did not cause madariaga's desperation to break out as violently as his son-in-law had expected for the first time he saw him weep his gay and robust old age had suddenly fallen from him the news having clapped ten years on to his fourscore like a child whimpering and tremulous he threw his arms around desnoyers moistening his neck with tears he has taken her away that son of a great flea he has taken her away this time he did not lay all the blame on his china he wept with her and as if trying to console her by a public confession kept saying over and over it's my fault it has all been because of my very very great sins now began for desnoyers a period of difficulties and conflicts the fugitives on one of his visits to the capital threw themselves on his mercy imploring his protection the romantica wept declaring that only her brother-in-law the most knightly man in the world could save her karl gazed at him like a faithful hound trusting in his master these trying interviews were repeated on all his trips then on returning to the ranch he would find the old man ill-humoured moody looking fixedly ahead of him as though seeing invisible power and wailing it's my punishment the punishment for my sins the memory of the discreditable circumstances under which he had made karl's acquaintance before bringing him into his home tormented the old centaur with remorse some afternoons he would have a horse saddle going full gallop toward the neighboring village but he was no longer hunting hospitable ranches he needed to pass some time in the church speaking alone with the images that were there only for him since he had footed the bills for them through my sin through my very great sin but in spite of his self-reproach desnoyers had to work very hard to get any kind of a settlement out of the old penitent whenever he suggested legalizing the situation and making the necessary arrangements for their marriage the old tyrant would not let him go on do what you think best but don't say anything to me about it several months passed by one day the frenchman approached him with a certain air of mystery elena has a son and has named him julio after you and you you great useless hulk stormed the ranchman and that weak cow of a wife of yours you dare to live tranquilly on without giving me a grandson ah frenchy that is why the germans will finally overwhelm you you see it right here that bandit has a son while you after four years of marriage nothing i want a grandson do you understand that and in order to console himself for this lack of little ones around his own hearth he betook himself to the ranch of his overseer celedonio where a band of little half-breeds gathered tremblingly and hopefully about him suddenly china died the poor misia petrona passed away as discreetly as she had lived 
trying even in her last hours to avoid all annoyance for her husband asking his pardon with an imploring look for any trouble which her death might cause him elena came to the ranch in order to see her mother's body for the last time and desnoyers who for more than a year had been supporting them behind his father-in-law's back took advantage of this occasion to overcome the old man's resentment well i'll forgive her said the ranchman finally i'll do it for the sake of my poor wife and for you she may remain on the ranch and that shameless gringo may come with her but he would have nothing to do with him the german was to be an employee under desnoyers and they could live in the office building as though they did not belong to the family he would never say a word to karl but scarcely had the german returned before he began giving him orders rudely as though he were a perfect stranger at other times he would pass by him as though he did not know him upon finding elena in the house with his oldest daughter he would go on without speaking to her in vain his romantica transfigured by maternity improved all opportunities for putting her child in his way calling him loudly by name julio julio they want that brat of a singing gringo that carrot top with a face like a skinned kid to be my grandson i prefer celedonios and by way of emphasizing his protest he entered the dwelling of his overseer scattering among his dusky brood handfuls of dollars after seven years of marriage the wife of desnoyers found that she too was going to become a mother her sister already had three sons but what were they worth to madariaga compared to the grandson that was going to come it will be a boy he announced positively because i need one so it shall be named julio and i hope that it will look like my poor dead wife since the death of his wife he no longer called her the china feeling something of a posthumous love for the poor woman who in her lifetime had endured so much so timidly and silently now my poor dead wife cropped out every other instant in the conversation of the remorseful ranchman his desires were fulfilled luisa gave birth to a boy who bore the name of julio and although he did not show in his somewhat sketchy features any striking resemblance to his grandmother still he had the black hair and eyes and olive skin of a brunette welcome this was a grandson in the generosity of his joy he even permitted the german to enter the house for the baptismal ceremony when julio desnoyers was two years old his grandfather made the rounds of his estates holding him on the saddle in front of him he went from ranch to ranch in order to show him to the copper-colored populace like an ancient monarch presenting his heir later on when the child was able to say a few words he entertained himself for hours at a time talking with the tot under the shade of the eucalyptus tree a certain mental failing was beginning to be noticed in the old man although not exactly in his dotage his aggressiveness was becoming very childish even in his most affectionate moments he used to contradict everybody and hunt up ways of annoying his relatives come here you false prophet he would say to julio you are a frenchy the grandchild protested as though he had been insulted his mother had taught him that he was an argentinian and his father had suggested that she also add spanish in order to please the grandfather very well then if you are not a frenchy shout down with napoleon and he looked around him to see if desnoyers might be near believing that this would displease him greatly but his son-in-law pursued the even tenor of his way shrugging his shoulders down with napoleon repeated julio and he instantly held out his hand while his grandfather went through his pockets end of section eleven recording by tony oliva albuquerque new mexico section twelve part one chapter two continued of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez this librivox recording is in the public domain
carl's sons now four in number used to circle around their grandparent like a humble chorus kept at a distance and stared enviously at these gifts in order to win his favor they one day when they saw him alone came boldly up to him shouting in unison down with napoleon you insolent gringos ranted the old man that's what that shameless father has taught you if you say that again i'll chase you with a cat o nine tails the very idea of insulting a great man in that way while he tolerated this blond brood he never would permit the slightest intimacy desnoyers and his wife often had to come to their rescue accusing the grandfather of injustice and in order to pour the vials of his wrath out on someone the old plainsman would hunt up celedonio the best of his listeners who invariably replied yes patron that's so patron they're not to blame agreed the old man but i can't abide them besides they are so like their father so fair with hair like a shredded carrot and the two oldest wearing specks as if they were court clerks they don't seem like folks with those glasses they look like sharks madariaga had never seen any sharks but he imagined them without knowing why with round glassy eyes like the bottoms of bottles by the time he was eight years old julio was a famous little equestrian to horse peoncito his grandfather would cry and away they would race streaking like lightning across the fields midst thousands and thousands of horned herds the peoncito proud of his title obeyed the master in everything and so learned to whirl the lasso over the steers leaving them bound and conquered upon making his pony take a deep ditch or creep along the edge of the cliffs he sometimes fell under his mount but clambered up gamely ah fine cowboy Boy, exclaimed the grandfather bursting with pride in his exploits here are five dollars for you to give a handkerchief to some china the old man in his increasing mental confusion did not gauge his gifts exactly with the lad's years and the infantile horseman while keeping the money was wondering what china was referred to and why he should make her a present desnoyers finally had to drag his son away from the baleful teachings of his grandfather it was simply useless to have masters come to the house or to send julio to the country school madariaga would always steal his grandson away and then they would scour the plains together so when the boy was eleven years old his father placed him in a big school in the capital the grandfather then turned his attention to julio's three-year-old sister exhibiting her before him as he had her brother as he took her from ranch to ranch everybody called chicha's little girl chichi but the grandfather bestowed on her the same nickname that he had given her brother the peoncito and chichi who was growing up wild vigorous and wilful breakfasting on meat and talking in her sleep of roast beef readily fell in with the old man's tastes she was dressed like a boy rode astride like a man and in order to win her grandfather's praises as fine cowboy carried a knife in the back of her belt the two raced in the fields from sun to sun madariaga following the flying pigtail of the little amazon as though it were a flag when nine years old she too could lasso the cattle with much dexterity what most irritated the ranchman was that his family would remember his age he received as insults his son-in-law's counsels to remain quietly at home becoming more aggressive and reckless as he advanced in years exaggerating his activity as if he wished to drive death away he accepted no help except from his harem scarum peoncito when carl's children great hulking youngsters hastened to his assistance and offered to hold his stirrup he would repel them with snorts of indignation so you think i'm no longer able to help myself eh there's still enough life in me to make those who are waiting for me to die so as to grab my dollars chew their disappointment a long while yet 
since the german and his wife were kept pointedly apart from the family life they had to put up with these allusions in silence Karl, needing protection constantly shadowed the frenchman improving every opportunity to overwhelm him with his eulogies he never could thank him enough for all that he had done for him he was his only champion he longed for a chance to prove his gratitude to die for him if necessary his wife admired him with enthusiasm as the most gifted knight in the world and desnoyers received their devotion in gratified silence accepting the german as an excellent comrade as he controlled absolutely the family fortune he aided karl very generously without arousing the resentment of the old man he also took the initiative in bringing about the realization of karl's pet ambition a visit to the fatherland so many years in america for the very reason that desnoyers himself had no desire to return to europe he wished to facilitate karl's trip and gave him the means to make the journey with his entire family the father-in-law had no curiosity as to who paid the expenses let them go he said gleefully and may they never return their absence was not a very long one for they spent their year's allowance in three months karl who had apprised his parents of the great fortune which his marriage had brought him wished to make an impression as a millionaire in full enjoyment of his riches elena returned radiant speaking with pride of her relatives of the baron colonel of the hussars of the captain of the guard of the councillor at court asserting that all countries were most insignificant when compared with her husband's she even affected a certain condescension toward desnoyers praising him as a very worthy man but without ancient lineage or distinguished family and french besides karl on the other hand showed the same devotion as before keeping himself submissively in the background when his brother-in-law who had the keys of the cash-box and was his only defence against the brow-beating old patron he had left his two older sons in a school in germany years afterwards they reached an equal footing with the other grandchildren of the spaniard who always begrudged them their existence perfect frights with carroty hair and eyes like a shark suddenly the old man became very lonely for they had also carried off his second peoncito the good chicha could not tolerate her daughters growing up like a boy parading round on horseback all the time and glibly repeating her grandfather's vulgarities so she was now in a convent in the capital where the sisters had to battle valiantly in order to tame the mischievous rebellion of their wild little pupil when julio and chichi returned to the ranch for their vacations the grandfather again concentrated his fondness on the first as though the girl had merely been a substitute desnoyers was becoming indignant at his son's dissipated life he was no longer at college and his existence was that of a student in a rich family who makes up for parental parsimony with all sorts of imprudent borrowings but madariaga came to the defence of his grandson ah the fine cowboy seeing him again on the ranch he admired the dash of the good-looking youth testing his muscles in order to convince himself of their strength and making him to recount his nightly escapades as ringleader of a band of toughs in the capital he longed to go to buenos aires himself just to see the youngster in the midst of this gay wild life but alas he was not seventeen like his grandson he had already passed eighty come here you false prophet tell me how many children you have you must have a great many children you know father protested chicha who was always hanging around fearing her parents bad teachings stop nagging at me yelled the irate old fellow in a towering temper i know what i'm saying paternity figured largely in all his amorous fancies he was almost blind and the loss of his sight was accompanied by an increasing mental upset his crazy senility took on a lewd character expressing itself in language which scandalized or amused the community oh you rascal 
what a pretty fellow you are he said leering at julio with eyes which could no longer distinguish things except in a shadowy way you are the living image of my poor dead wife have a good time for grandpa is always here with his money if you could only count on what your father gives you you would live like a hermit these frenchies are a close-fisted lot but i am looking out for you peoncito spend and enjoy yourself that's what your granddaddy has piled up the silver for when the desnoyers children returned to the capital he spent his lonesome hours in going from ranch to ranch a young half-breed would set the water for his shrub tea to boiling on the hearth and the old man would wonder confusedly if she were his daughter another fifteen years old would offer him a gourd filled with the bitter liquid and a silver pipe with which to sip it a grandchild perhaps he wasn't sure and so he passed the afternoon silent and sluggish drinking gourd after gourd of shrub tea surrounded by families who stared at him with admiration and fear every time he mounted his horse for these excursions his older daughter would protest at eighty-four years would it not be better for him to remain quietly at home some day something terrible would happen and the terrible thing did happen one evening the patron's horse came slowly home without its rider the old man had fallen on the sloping highway and when they found him he was dead thus died the centaur as he had lived with the lash hanging from his wrist with his legs bowed by the saddle a spanish notary almost as old as he produced the will the family was somewhat alarmed at seeing what a voluminous document it was what terrible bequests had madariaga dictated the reading of the first part tranquilized karl and elena the old father had left considerable more to the wife of desnoyers but there still remained an enormous share for the romantica and her children i do this he said in memory of my poor dead wife and so that people won't talk after this came eighty-six legacies eighty-five dark-hued individuals women and men who had lived on the ranch for many years as tenants and retainers were to receive the last paternal munificence of the old patriarch at the head of these was celedonio whom madariaga had greatly enriched in his lifetime for no heavier work than listening to him and repeating that's so patron that's true more than a million dollars were represented by these bequests in lands and herds the one who completed the list of beneficiaries was julio desnoyers the grandfather had made special mention of this namesake leaving him a plantation to meet his private expenses making up for that which his father would not give him but that represents hundreds of thousands of dollars protested karl who had been making himself almost obnoxious in his efforts to assure himself that his wife had not been overlooked in the will the days following the reading of this will were very trying ones for the family elena and her children kept looking at the other group as though they had just waked up contemplating them in an entirely new light they seemed to forget what they were going to receive in their envy of the much larger share of their relatives desnoyers benevolent and conciliatory had a plan an expert in administrative affairs he realized that the distribution among the heirs was going to double the expenses without increasing the income he was calculating besides the complications and disbursements necessary for a judicial division of nine immense ranches hundreds of thousands of cattle deposits in the banks houses in the city and debts to collect would it not be better for them all to continue living as before had they not lived most peaceably as a united family the german received this suggestion by drawing himself up haughtily no to each one should be given what was his let each live in his own sphere he wished to establish himself in europe spending his wealth freely there it was necessary for him to return to his world as they looked squarely at each other desnoyers saw an unknown karl a karl whose existence he had never suspected when he was under his protection timid and servile the frenchman too was beginning to see things in a new light very well he assented 
let each take his own that seems fair to me end of section twelve recording by tony oliva albuquerque new mexico section thirteen part one chapter three of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three the desnoyers family the madariagan succession as it was called in the language of the legal men interested in prolonging it in order to augment their fees was divided into two groups separated by the ocean the desnoyers moved to buenos aires the hartrotts moved to berlin as soon as karl could sell all the legacy to reinvest it in lands and industrial enterprises in his own country desnoyers no longer cared to live in the country for twenty years now he had been the head of an enormous agricultural cultural and stock-raising business overseeing hundreds of men in the various ranches the parceling out of the old man's fortune among elena and the other legatees had considerably constricted the radius of his authority and it angered him to see established on the neighboring lands so many foreigners almost all germans who had bought of karl furthermore he was getting old his wife's inheritance amounted to about twenty millions of dollars and perhaps his brother-in-law was showing the better judgment in returning to europe so he leased some of the plantations handed over the superintendence of others to those mentioned in the will who considered themselves left-handed members of the family of which desnoyers as the patron received their submissive allegiance and moved to buenos aires by this move he was able to keep an eye on his son who continued living a dissipated life without making any headway in his engineering studies then too chichi was now almost a woman her robust development making her look older than she was and it was not expedient to keep her on the estate to become a rustic senorita like her mother dona luisa had also tired of ranch life the social triumphs of her sister making her a little restless she was incapable of feeling jealous but material ambitions made her anxious that her children should not bring up the rear of the procession in which the other grandchildren were cutting such a dashing figure during the year most wonderful reports from germany were finding their way to the desnoyers home in the capital the aunt from berlin as the children called her kept sending long letters filled with accounts of dances dinners hunting parties and titles many high-sounding and military titles our brother the colonel our cousin the baron our uncle the intimate counsellor our great-uncle the truly intimate all the extravagances of the german social ladder which incessantly manufactures new titles in order to satisfy the thirst for honors of a people divided into castes were enumerated with delight by the old romantica she even mentioned her husband's secretary a nobody who through working in the public offices had acquired the title of Rechnungarath counsellor of calculations she also referred with much pride to the retired oberpetel which she had in her house explaining that it meant superior porter the news about her children was no less glorious the oldest was the wise one of the family he was devoted to philology and the historical sciences but his sight was growing weaker all the time because of his omnivorous reading soon he would be a doctor and before he was thirty a herr professor the mother lamented that he had not military aspirations considering that his tastes had somewhat distorted the lofty destinies of the family professorships science and literature were more properly the perquisites of the jews unable because of their race to obtain preferment in the army but she was trying to console herself by keeping in mind that a celebrated professor could in time acquire a social rank 
almost equal to that of a colonel her other four sons would become officers their father was preparing the ground so that they might enter the guard or some aristocratic regiment without any of the members being able to vote against their admission the two daughters would surely marry when they had reached a suitable age with officers of the hussars whose names bore the magic fon of petty nobility haughty and charming gentlemen about whom the daughter of missia petrona waxed most enthusiastic the establishment of the hartrotts was in keeping with these new relationships in the home in berlin the servants wore knee breeches and white wigs on the nights of great banquets karl had bought an old castle with pointed towers ghosts in the cellars and various legends of assassinations assaults and abductions which enlivened its history in an interesting way an architect decorated with many foreign orders and bearing the title of counsellor of construction was engaged to modernize the medieval edifice without sacrificing its terrifying aspect the romantica described in anticipation the receptions in the gloomy salon the light diffused by electricity simulating torches the crackling of the emblazoned hearth with its imitation logs bristling with flames of gas all the splendor of modern luxury combined with the souvenirs of an epoch of omnipotent nobility the best according to her in history and the hunting parties the future hunting parties in an annex of sandy and loose soil with pine woods in no way comparable to the rich ground of their native ranch but which had the honor of being trodden centuries ago by the princes of brandenburg founders of the reigning house of prussia and all this advancement in a single year they had of course to compete with other oversea families who had amassed enormous fortunes in the united states brazil or the pacific coast but these were germans without lineage coarse plebeians who were struggling in vain to force themselves into the great world by making donations to the imperial works with all their millions the very most that they could ever hope to attain would be to marry their daughters with ordinary soldiers whilst karl the relatives of karl and the romantica let her pen run on glorifying a family in whose bosom she fancied she had been born from time to time were enclosed with elena's effusions brief crisp notes directed to desnoyers the brother-in-law continued giving an account of his operations the same as when living on the ranch under his protection but with this deference was now mixed a badly concealed pride an evident desire to retaliate for his times of voluntary humiliation everything that he was doing was grand and glorious he had invested his millions in the industrial enterprises of modern germany he was stockholder of munition factories as big as towns and of navigation companies launching a ship every half year the emperor was interesting himself in these works looking benevolently on all those who wished to aid him besides this karl was buying land at first sight it seemed foolish to have sold the fertile fields of their inheritance in order to acquire sandy prussian wastes that yielded only to much artificial fertilizing but by becoming a landowner he now belonged to the agrarian party the aristocratic and conservative group par excellence and thus he was living in two different but equally distinguished worlds that of the great industrial friends of the emperor and that that of the junkers knights of the countryside guardians of the old traditions and the supply source of the officials of the king of prussia on hearing of these social strides desnoyers could not but think of the pecuniary sacrifices which they must represent he knew karl's past for on the ranch under an impulse of gratitude the german had one day revealed to the frenchman the cause of his coming to america he was a former officer in the german army but the desire of living ostentatiously without other resources than his salary had dragged him into committing such reprehensible acts 
as abstracting funds belonging to the regiment incurring debts of honor and paying for them with forged signatures these crimes had not been officially prosecuted through consideration of his father's memory but the members of his division had submitted him to a tribunal of honor his brothers and friends had advised him to shoot himself as the only remedy but he loved life and had fled to south america where in spite of humiliations he had finally triumphed wealth effaces the spots of the past even more rapidly than time the news of his fortune on the other side of the ocean made his family give him a warm reception on his first voyage home introducing him again into their world nobody could remember shameful stories about a few hundred marks concerning a man who was talking about his father-in-law's lands more extensive than many german principalities now upon installing himself definitely in his country all was forgotten but oh the contributions levied upon his vanity desnoyers shrewdly guessed at the thousands of marks poured with both hands into the charitable works of the empress into the imperialistic propagandas into the societies of veterans into the clubs of aggression and expansion organized by german ambition the frugal frenchman thrifty in his expenditures and free from social ambitions smiled at the grandeurs of his brother-in-law he considered karl an excellent companion although of a childish pride he recalled with satisfaction the years that they had passed together in the country he could not forget the german who was always hovering around him affectionate and submissive as a younger brother when his family commented with a somewhat envious vivacity upon the glories of their berlin relatives desnoyers would say smilingly leave them in peace they are paying very dear for their whistle but the enthusiasm which the letters from germany breathed finally created an atmosphere of disquietude and rebellion chichi led the attack why were they not going to europe like the other folks all their friends had been there even the italian and spanish shopkeepers were making the voyage while she the daughter of a frenchman had never seen paris oh paris the doctors in attendance on melancholy ladies were announcing the existence of a new and terrible disease the mania for paris dona luisa supported her daughter why had she not gone to live in europe like her sister since she was the richer of the two even julio gravely declared that in the old world he could study to better advantage america is not the land of the learned infected by the general unrest the father finally began to wonder why the idea of going to europe had not occurred to him long before thirty-four years without going to that country which was not his it was high time to start he was living too near to his business in vain the retired ranchman had tried to keep himself indifferent to the money market everybody was coining money around him in the club in the theatre wherever he went the people were talking about purchases of lands of sales of stock of quick negotiations with triple profit of portentous balances the amount of money that he was keeping idle in the banks was beginning to weigh upon him he finally ended by involving himself in some speculation like a gambler who cannot see the roulette wheel without putting his hand in his pocket his family was right to paris for in the desnoyers mind to go to europe meant of course to go to paris let the aunt from berlin keep on chanting the glories of her husband's country it's sheer nonsense exclaimed julio who had made grave geographical and ethnic comparisons in his nightly forays there is no place but paris chichi saluted with an ironical smile the slightest doubt of it perhaps they make as elegant fashions in germany as in paris bah dona luisa took up her children's cry paris never had it even occurred to her to go to a lutheran land to be protected by her sister let it be paris then said the frenchman as though he were speaking of an unknown city End of section thirteen Recording by Tony Oliva, Albuquerque, New Mexico.
section fourteen part one chapter three continued of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez this librivox recording is in the public domain he had accustomed himself to believe that he would never return to it during the first years of his life in america the trip would have been an impossibility because of the military service which he had evaded then he had vague news of different amnesties after the time for conscription had long since passed an inertness of will had made him consider a return to his country as somewhat absurd and useless on the other side nothing remained to attract him he had even lost track of those country relatives with whom his mother had lived in his heaviest hours he had tried to occupy his activity by planning an enormous mausoleum all of marble in la recoleta the cemetery of the rich in order to move thither the remains of madariaga as founder of the dynasty following him with all his own when their hour should come he was beginning to feel the weight of age he was nearly seventy years old and the rude life of the country the horseback rides in the rain the rivers forded upon his swimming horse the nights passed in the open air had brought on a rheumatism that was torturing his best days his family however reawakened his enthusiasm to paris he began to fancy see that he was twenty again and forgetting his habitual parsimony wished his household to travel like royalty in the most luxurious staterooms and with personal servants two copper-hued country girls born on the ranch and elevated to the rank of maids to the senora and her daughter accompanied them on the voyage their oblique eyes betraying not the slightest astonishment before the greatest novelties once in paris desnoyers found himself quite bewildered he confused the names of streets proposed visits to buildings which had long since disappeared and all his attempts to prove himself an expert authority on paris were attended with disappointment his children guided by recent reading up knew paris better than he he was considered a foreigner in his own country at first he even felt a certain strangeness in using his native tongue for he had remained on the ranch without speaking a word of his language for years at a time he was used to thinking in spanish and translating his ideas into the speech of his ancestors spattered his french with all kinds of creole dialect where a man makes his fortune and raises his family there is his true country he said sententiously remembering madariaga the image of that distant country dominated him with insistent obsession as soon as the impressions of the voyage had worn off he had no french friends and upon going into the street his feet instinctively took him to the places where the argentinians gathered together it was the same with them they had left their country only to feel with increasing intensity the desire to talk about it all the time there he read the papers commenting on the rising prices in the fields on the prospects for the next harvests and on the sales of cattle returning home his thoughts were still in america and he chuckled with delight as he recalled the way in which the two chinas had defied the professional dignity of the french cook preparing their native stews and other dishes in creole style he had settled the family in an ostentatious house in the avenida victor hugo for which he paid a rental of twenty-eight thousand francs dona luisa had to go and come many times before she could accustom herself to the imposing aspect of the concierges he decorated with gold trimmings on his black uniform and wearing white whiskers like a notary in a comedy she with a chain of gold upon her exuberant bosom and receiving the tenants in a red and gold salon in the rooms above was ultra-modern luxury gilded and glacial with white walls and glass doors with tiny panes which exasperated desnoyers who longed for the complicated carvings and rich furniture in vogue during his youth he himself directed the arrangements and furnishings of the various rooms which always seemed empty 
chichi protested against her father's avarice when she saw him buying slowly and with much calculation and hesitation avarice no he retorted it is because i know the worth of things nothing pleased him that he had not acquired at one-third of its value beating down those who overcharged but proved the superiority of the buyer paris offered him one delightful spot which he could not find anywhere else in the world the hotel Drouot. he would go there every afternoon that he did not find other important auctions advertised in the papers for many years there was no famous failure in parisian life with its consequent liquidation from which he did not carry something away the use and need of these prizes were matters of secondary interest the great thing was to get them for ridiculous prices so the trophies from the auction rooms now began to inundate the apartment which at the beginning he had been furnishing with such desperate slowness his daughter now complained that the home was getting overcrowded the furnishings and ornaments were handsome but too many far too many the white walls seemed to scowl at the magnificent sets of chairs and the overflowing glass cabinets rich and velvety carpets over which had passed many generations covered all the compartments showy curtains not finding a vacant frame in the salons adorned the doors leading into the kitchen the wall mouldings gradually disappeared under an overlay of pictures placed close together like the scales of a cuirass who now could accuse desnoyers of avarice he was investing far more than a fashionable contractor would have dreamed of spending the underlying idea still was to acquire all this for a fourth of its price an exciting bait which lured the economical man into continuous dissipation he could sleep well only when he had driven a good bargain during the day he bought at auction thousands of bottles of wine consigned by bankrupt firms and he who scarcely ever drank packed his wine cellars to overflowing advising his family to use the champagne as freely as ordinary wine the failure of a furrier induced him to buy for fourteen thousand francs pelts worth ninety thousand in consequence the entire desnoyers family seemed suddenly to be suffering as frightfully from cold as though a polar iceberg had invaded the avenida victor hugo the father kept only one fur coat for himself but ordered three for his son chichi and dona luisa appeared arrayed in all kinds of silky and luxurious skins one day chinchilla other days blue fox martin or seal the enraptured buyer would permit no one but himself to adorn the walls with his new acquisitions using the hammer from the top of a step-ladder in order to save the expense of a professional picture hanger he wished to set his children the example of economy in his idle hours he would change the position of the heaviest pieces of furniture trying every kind of combination this employment reminded him of those happy days when he handled great sacks of wheat and bundles of hides on the ranch whenever his son noticed that he was looking thoughtfully at a monumental sideboard or heavy piece he prudently betook himself to other haunts desnoyers stood a little in awe of the two housemen very solemn correct creatures always in dress suit who could not hide their astonishment at seeing a man with an income of more than a million francs engaged in such work finally it was the two coppery maids who aided their patron the three working contentedly together like companions in exile four automobiles completed the luxuriousness of the family the children would have been more content with one small and dashing in the very latest style but desnoyers was not the man to let a bargain slip past him so one after the other he had picked up the four tempted by the price they were as enormous and majestic as coaches of state their entrance into a street made the passers-by turn and stare the chauffeur needed two assistants to help him keep his flock of mastodons in order but the proud owner thought only of the skill with which he had gotten the best of the sales 
salesmen anxious to get such monuments out of their sight to his children he was always recommending simplicity and economy we are not as rich as you suppose we own a good deal of property but it produces a scanty income and then after refusing a domestic expenditure of two hundred francs he would put five thousand into an unnecessary purchase just because it would mean a great loss to the seller julio and his sister kept protesting to their mother dona luisa chichi even going so far as to announce that she would never marry a man like her father hush hush exclaimed the scandalized creole he has his little peculiarities but he is very good never has he given me any cause for complaint i only hope that you may be lucky enough to find his equal her husband's quarrelsomeness his irritable character and his masterful will all sank into insignificance when she thought of his unvarying fidelity in so many years of married life nothing his faithfulness had been unexceptional even in the country where many surrounded by beasts and intent on increasing their flocks had seemed to become contaminated by the general animalism she remembered her father only too well even her sister was obliged to live in apparent calmness with the vainglorious karl quite capable of disloyalty not because of any special lust but just to imitate the doings of his superiors desnoyers and his wife were plodding through life in a routine affection reminding dona luisa in her limited imagination of the yokes of oxen on the ranch who refused to budge whenever another animal was substituted for the regular companion her husband certainly was quick-tempered holding her responsible for all the whims with which he exasperated his children yet he could never bear to have her out of his sight the afternoons at the hotel drouot would be most insipid for him unless she was at his side the confidant of his plans and wrathful outbursts to-day there's to be a sale of jewels shall we go he would make this proposition in such a gentle and coaxing voice the voice that dona luisa remembered in their first talks around the old home and so they would go together but by different routes she in one of the monumental vehicles because accustomed to the leisurely carriage rides of the ranch she no longer cared to walk and desnoyers although owner of the four automobiles heartily abominating them because he was conservative and uneasy with the complications of new machinery on foot under the pretext that through lack of work his body needed exercise when they met in the crowded salesrooms they proceeded to examine the jewels together fixing beforehand the price they would offer but he quick to become exasperated by opposition always went further hurling numbers at his competitors as though they were blows after such excursions the senora would appear as majestic and dazzling as a basilica of byzantium ears and neck decorated with great pearls her bosom a constellation of brilliance her hands radiating points of light of all colors of the rainbow too much mamma chichi would protest they will take you for a pawnbroker's lady but the creole satisfied with her splendor the crowning glory of a humble life attributed her daughter's fault-finding to envy chichi was only a girl now but later on she would thank her for having collected all these gems for her already the home was unable to accommodate so many purchases in the cellars were piled up enough paintings furniture statues and draperies to equip several other dwellings don marcelo began to complain of the cramped space in an apartment costing twenty eight thousand francs a year in reality large enough for a family four times the size of his he was beginning to deplore being obliged to renounce some very tempting furniture bargains when a real estate agent smelled out the foreigner and relieved him of his embarrassment why not buy a castle the entire family was delighted with the idea 
a historic castle the most historic that could be found would supplement their luxurious establishment chichi paled with pride some of her friends had castles others of old colonial family who were accustomed to look down upon her for her country bringing up would now cry with envy upon learning of this acquisition which was almost a patent of nobility the mother smiled in the hope of months in the country which would recall the simple and happy life of her youth julio was less enthusiastic the old man would expect him to spend much time away from paris but he consoled himself by reflecting that the suburban place would provide excuse for frequent automobile trips desnoyers thought of the relatives in berlin why should he not have his castle like the others the bargains were alluring historic mansions by the dozens were offered him their owners exhausted by the expense of maintaining them were more than anxious to sell so he bought the castle of villeblanche sur marne built in the time of the religious wars a mixture of palace and fortress with an italian renaissance facade gloomy towers with pointed hoods and moats in which swans were swimming end of section fourteen recording by tony oliva albuquerque new mexico section fifteen part one chapter three continued of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez this librivox recording is in the public domain he could now live with some tracts of land over which to exercise his authority struggling again with the resistance of men and things besides the vast proportions of the rooms of the castle were very tempting and bare of furniture this opportunity for placing the overflow from his cellars plunged him again into buying with this atmosphere of lordly gloom the antiques would harmonize beautifully without that cry of protest which they always seem to make when placed in contact with the glaring white walls of modern habitations the historic residence required an endless outlay on that account it had changed owners so many times but he and the land understood each other beautifully so at the same time that he was filling the salons he was going to begin farming and stock raising in the extensive parks a reproduction in miniature of his enterprises in south america the property ought to be made self-supporting not that he had any fear of the expenses but he did not intend to lose money on the proposition the acquisition of the castle brought desnoyers a true friendship the chief advantage in the transaction he became acquainted with a neighbor senator lacour who twice had had been minister of state and was now vegetating in the senate silent during its sessions but restless and voluble in the corridors in order to maintain his influence he was a prominent figure of the republican nobility an aristocrat of the new regime that had sprung from the agitations of the revolution just as the titled nobility had won their spurs in the crusades his great-grandfather had belonged to the convention his father had figured in the republic of eighteen forty eight he as the son of an exile who had died in banishment had when very young marched behind the grandiloquent figure of gambetta and always spoke in glowing terms of the master in the hope that some of his rays might be reflected on his disciple his son rene a pupil of the ecole centrale regarded his father as a rare old sport laughing a little at his romantic and humanitarian republicanism he nevertheless was counting much on that same official protection treasured by four generations of lacours dedicated to the service of the republic to assist him when he became an engineer don marcelo 
who used to look uneasily upon any new friendship fearing a demand for a loan gave himself up with enthusiasm to intimacy with this grand man the personage admired riches and recognized besides a certain genius in this millionaire from the other side of the sea accustomed to speaking of limitless pastures and immense herds their intercourse was more than the mere friendliness of a country neighborhood and continued on after their return to paris finally rene visited the home on the avenida victor hugo as though it were his own the only disappointments in desnoyers new life came from his children chichi irritated him because of the independence of her tastes she did not like antiques no matter how substantial and magnificent they might be much preferring the frivolities of the latest fashion she accepted all her father's gifts with great indifference before an exquisite blonde piece of lace centuries old picked up at auction she made a wry face saying i would much rather have had a new dress costing three hundred francs she and her brother were solidly opposed to everything old now that his daughter was already a woman he had confided her absolutely to the care of dona luisa but the former peoncito was not showing much respect for the advice and commands of the good-natured creole she had taken up roller skating with enthusiasm regarding it as the most elegant of diversions she would go every afternoon to the ice palace dona luisa chaperoning her although to do this she was obliged to give up accompanying her her husband to his sails oh the hours of deadly weariness before that frozen oval ring watching the white circle of balancing human monkeys gliding by on runners to the sound of an organ her daughter would pass and repass before her tired eyes rosy from the exercise spirals of hair escaped from her hat streaming out behind the folds of her skirt swinging above her skates handsome athletic and amazonian with the rude health of a child who according to her father had been weaned on beefsteaks finally dona luisa rebelled against this troublesome vigilance preferring to accompany her husband on his hunt for underpriced riches chichi went to the skating rink with one of the dark-skinned maids passing the afternoons with her sporty friends of the new world together they ventilated their ideas under the glare of the easy life of paris freed from the scruples and conventions of their native land they all thought themselves older than they were delighting to discover in each other unsuspected charms the change from the other hemisphere had altered their sense of values some were even writing verses in french and desnoyers became alarmed giving free rein to his bad humor when chichi of evenings would bring forth as aphorisms that which she and her friends had been discussing as a summary of their readings and observations life is life and one must live i will marry the man i love no matter who he may be but the daughter's independence was as nothing compared to the worry which the other child gave the desnoyers ay that other one julio upon arriving in paris had changed the bent of his aspirations he no longer thought of becoming an engineer he wished to become an artist don marcelo objected in great consternation but finally yielded let it be painting the important thing was to have some regular profession the father while he considered property and wealth as sacred rights felt that no one should enjoy them who had not worked to acquire them recalling his apprenticeship as a wood carver he began to hope that the artistic instincts which poverty had extinguished in him were perhaps reappearing in his son what if this lazy boy this lively genius hesitating before taking up his walk in life should turn out to be a famous painter after all so he agreed to all of julio's caprices the budding artist insisting that for his first efforts in drawing and coloring he needed a separate apartment 
where he could work with more freedom his father therefore established him near his home in the rue de la pompe in the former studio of a well-known foreign painter the workroom and its annexes were far too large for an amateur but the owner had died and desnoyers improved the opportunity offered by the heirs and bought at a remarkable bargain the entire plant pictures and furnishings dona luisa at first visited the studio daily like a good mother caring for the well-being of her son that he may work to better advantage taking off her gloves she emptied the brass trays filled with cigar stubs and dusted the furniture powdered with the ashes fallen from the pipes julio's visitors long-haired young men who spoke of things that she could not understand seemed to her rather careless in their manners later on she also met their women very lightly clad and was received with scowls by her son wasn't his mother ever going to let him work in peace so the poor lady starting out in the morning toward the rue de la pompe stopped midway and went instead to the church of saint honore des Lyaux. the father displayed more prudence a man of his years could not expect to mingle with the chums of a young artist in a few months time julio passed entire weeks without going to sleep under the paternal roof finally he installed himself permanently in his studio occasionally making a flying trip home that his family might know that he was still in existence some mornings desnoyers would arrive at the rue de la pompe in order to ask a few questions of the concierge it was ten o'clock the artist was sleeping upon returning at midday he learned that the heavy sleep still continued soon after lunch another visit to get better news it was two o'clock the young gentleman was just arising so the father would retire muttering stormily but when does this painter ever paint at first julio had tried to win renown with his brush believing that it would prove an easy task in true artist fashion he collected his friends around him south american boys with nothing to do but enjoy life scattering money ostentatiously so that everybody might know of their generosity with serene audacity the young canvas dauber undertook to paint portraits he loved good painting distinctive painting with the cloying sweetness of a romance that copied only the forms of women he had money a good studio his father was standing behind him ready to help why shouldn't he accomplish as much as many others who lacked his opportunities so he began his work by coloring a canvas entitled the dance of the hours a mere pretext for copying pretty girls and selecting buxom models those he would sketch at a mad speed filling in the outlines with blobs of multicolored paint and up to this point all went well then he would begin to vacillate remaining idle before the picture only to put it in the corner in hope of later inspiration it was the same way with his various studies of feminine heads finding that he was never able to finish anything he soon became resigned like one who pants with fatigue before an obstacle waiting for a providential interposition to save him the important thing was to be a painter even though he might not paint anything this afforded him the opportunity on the plea of lofty aestheticism of sending out cards of invitation and asking light women to his studio he lived during the night don marcelo upon investigating the artist's work could not contain his indignation every morning the two desnoyers were accustomed to greet the first hours of dawn the father leaping from his bed the son on his way home to his studio to throw himself upon his couch not to wait till midday the credulous dona luisa would invent the most absurd explanations to defend her son who could tell perhaps he had the habit of painting during the night utilizing it for original work men resort to so many devilish things desnoyers knew very well what these nocturnal gusts of genius were amounting to scandals in the restaurants of montmartre and scrimmages many scrimmages he and his gang who believed that at seven a full dress or tuxedo was indispensable were like a band of indians bringing to paris the wild customs of the plains champagne always made them quarrelsome 
so they broke and paid but their generosities were almost invariably followed by a scuffle no one could surpass julio in the quick slap and the ready card his father heard with a heavy heart the news brought him by some friends thinking to flatter his vanity his son was always victorious in these gentlemanly encounters he it was who always scratched the enemy's skin the painter knew more about fencing than art he was a champion with various weapons he could box and was even skilled in the favorite blows of the prize-fighters of the slums useless as a drone and as dangerous too fretted his father and yet in the back of his troubled mind fluttered an irresistible satisfaction an animal pride in the thought that this hare-brained terror was his own for a while he thought that he had hit upon a way of withdrawing his son from such an existence the relatives in berlin had visited the desnoyers in their castle of villeblanche with good-natured superiority karl von hartrott had appreciated the rich and rather absurd accumulations of his brother-in-law they were not bad he admitted that they gave a certain cachet to the home in paris and to the castle they smacked of the possessions of titled nobility but germany the comforts and luxuries in his country he just wished his brother-in-law to admire the way he lived and the noble friendships that embellished his opulence and so he insisted in his letters that the desnoyers family should return their visit this change of environment might tone julio down a little perhaps his ambition might waken on seeing the diligence of his cousins each with a career the frenchman had besides an underlying belief in the more corrupt influence of paris as compared with the purity of the customs in patriarchal germany they were there four months in a little while desnoyers felt ready to retreat each to his own kind he would never be able to understand such people exceedingly amiable with an abject amiability and evident desire to please but constantly blundering through a tactless desire to make their grandeur felt the high-toned friends of hartrott emphasized their love for france but it was the pious love that a weak and mischievous child inspires needing protection and they would accompany their affability with all manner of inopportune memories of the wars in which france had been conquered everything in germany a monument a railroad station a simple dining-room device instantly gave rise to glorious comparisons in france you do not have this of course you never saw anything like this in america don marcelo came away fatigued by so much condescension and his wife and daughter refused to be convinced that the elegance of berlin could be superior to paris chichi with audacious sacrilege scandalized her cousins by declaring that she could not abide the corseted officers with immovable monocle who bowed to the women with such automatic rigidity blending their gallantries with an air of superiority End of section fifteen recording by tony oliva albuquerque new mexico section sixteen part one chapter three continued of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez this librivox recording is in the public domain julio guided by his cousins was saturated in the virtuous atmosphere of berlin with the oldest the sage he had nothing to do he was a poor creature devoted to his books who patronized all the family with a protecting air it was the others the sub-lieutenants or military students who proudly showed him the rounds of german joy julio was accordingly introduced to all the night restaurants imitations of those in paris but on a much larger scale the women who in paris might be counted by the dozens appeared here in hundreds the scandalous drunkenness here never came by chance but always by design as an indispensable part of the gaiety all was grandiose 
glittering colossal the libertines diverted themselves in platoons the public got drunk in companies the harlots presented themselves in regiments he felt a sensation of disgust before these timid and servile females accustomed to blows who were so eagerly trying to reimburse themselves for the losses and exposures of their business for him it was impossible to celebrate with hoarse ha ha's like his cousins the discomfiture of these women when they realized that they had wasted so many hours without accomplishing more than abundant drinking the gross obscenity so public and noisy like a parade of riches was loathsome to julio there is nothing like this in paris his cousins repeatedly exulted as they admired the stupendous salons the hundreds of men and women in pairs the thousands of tipplers no there certainly was nothing like that in paris he was sick of such boundless pretension he seemed to be attending a fiesta of hungry mariners anxious at one swoop to make amends for all former privations like his father he longed to get away it offended his aesthetic sense don marcelo returned from this visit with melancholy resignation those people had undoubtedly made great strides he was not such a blind patriot that he could not admit what was so evident within a few years they had transformed their country and their industry was astonishing but well it was simply impossible to have anything to do with them each to his own but may they never take a notion to envy their neighbor then he immediately repelled this last suspicion with the optimism of a business man they are going to be very rich he thought their affairs are prospering and he that is rich does not hunt quarrels that war of which some crazy fools are always dreaming would be an impossible thing young desnoyers renewed his parisian existence living entirely in the studio and going less and less to his father's home dona luisa began to speak of a certain argensola a very learned young spaniard believing that his counsels might prove most helpful to julio she did not know exactly whether this new companion was friend master or servant the studio habitues also had their doubts the literary ones always spoke of argensola as a painter the painters recognized only his ability as a man of letters he was among those who used to come up to the studio of winter afternoons attracted by the ruddy glow of the stove and the wine secretly provided by the mother holding forth authoritatively before the often renewed bottle and the box of cigars lying open on the table one night he slept on the divan as he had no regular quarters after that first night he lived entirely in the studio julio soon discovered in him an admirable reflex of his own personality he knew that argensola had come third class from madrid with twenty francs in his pocket in order to capture glory to use his own words upon observing that the spaniard was painting with as much difficulty as himself with the same wooden and childish strokes which are so characteristic of the make-believe artists and pot-boilers the routine workers concerned themselves with color and other rank fads argensola was a psychological artist a painter of souls and his disciple felt astonished and almost displeased on learning what a comparatively simple thing it was to paint a soul upon a bloodless countenance with a chin as sharp as a dagger the gifted spaniard would trace a pair of nearly round eyes and at the centre of each pupil he would aim a white brush stroke a point of light the soul then planting himself before the canvas he would proceed to classify this soul with his inexhaustible imagination attributing to it almost every kind of stress and extremity so great was the sway of his rapture that julio too was able to see all that the artist flattered himself into believing that he had put into the owlish eyes he also would paint souls souls of women in spite of the ease with which he developed his psychological creations argensola preferred to talk 
stretched on a divan or to read hugging the fire while his friend and protector was outside another advantage this fondness for reading gave young desnoyers was that he was no longer obliged to open a volume scanning the index and last pages just to get the idea formerly when frequenting society functions he had been guilty of coolly asking an author which was his best book his smile of a clever man giving the the writer to understand that he merely inquired so as not to waste time on the other volumes now it was no longer necessary to do this argensola would read for him as soon as julio would see him absorbed in a book he would demand an immediate share tell me the story so the secretary not only gave him the plots of comedies and novels but also detailed the argument of schopenhauer or of nietzsche dona luisa almost wept on hearing her visitors with that benevolence which wealth always inspires speak of her son as a rather gay young man but wonderfully well read in exchange for his lessons argensola received much the same treatment as did the greek slaves who taught rhetoric to the young patricians of decadent rome in the midst of a dissertation his lord and friend would interrupt him with get my dress suit ready i am invited out this evening at other times when the instructor was luxuriating in bodily comfort with a book in one hand near the roaring stove seeing through the windows the gray and rainy afternoon his disciple would suddenly appear saying quick get out there's a woman coming and argensola like a dog who gets up and shakes himself would disappear to continue his reading in some miserable little coffee-house in the neighbourhood in his official capacity this widely gifted man often descended from the peaks of intellectuality to the vulgarities of everyday life he was the steward of the lord of the manor the intermediary between the pocket-book and those who appeared bill in hand money he would say laconically at the end of the month and desnoyers would break out into complaints and curses where on earth was he to get it he would like to know his father was as regular as a machine and would never allow the slightest advance upon the following month he had to submit to a rule of misery three thousand francs a month what could any decent person do with that he was even trying to cut that down to tighten the band interfering in the running of his house so that dona luisa could not make presents to her son in vain he had appealed to the various usurers of paris telling them of his property beyond the ocean these gentlemen had the youth of their own country in the hollow of their hand and were not obliged to risk their capital in other lands the same hard luck pursued him when with sudden demonstrations of affection he had tried to convince don marcelo that three thousand francs a month was but a niggardly trifle the millionaire fairly snorted with indignation three thousand francs a trifle and the debts besides that he often had to pay for his son why when i was your age he would begin saying but julio would suddenly bring the dialogue to a close he had heard his father's story too many times ah the stingy old miser what he had been giving him all these months was no more than the interest on his grandfather's legacy and by the advice of argensola he ventured to get control of the field he was planning to hand over the management of his land to celedonio the old overseer who was now such a grandee in his country that julio ironically called him my uncle desnoyers accepted this rebellion coldly it appears just to me you are now of age then he promptly reduced to extremes his oversight of his home forbidding dona luisa to handle any money henceforth he regarded his son as an adversary treating him during his lightning apparitions at the avenue victor hugo with glacial courtesy as though he were a stranger for a while a transitory opulence enlivened the studio julio had increased his expenses 
considering himself rich but the letters from his uncle in america soon dissipated these illusions at first the remittances exceeded very slightly the monthly allowance that his father had made him then it began to diminish in an alarming manner according to celedonio all the calamities on earth seemed to be falling upon his plantation the pasture land was yielding scantily sometimes for lack of rain sometimes because of floods and the herds were perishing by hundreds julio required more income and the crafty half-breed sent him what he asked for but simply as a loan reserving the return until they should adjust their accounts in spite of such aid young desnoyers was suffering great want he was gambling now in an elegant circle thinking thus to compensate for his periodical scrimpings but this resort was only making the remittances from america disappear with greater rapidity that such a man as he was should be tormented for the lack of a few thousand francs what else was a millionaire father for if the creditors began threatening the poor youth had to bring the secretary into play ordering him to see the mother immediately he himself wished to avoid her tears and reproaches so argensola would slip like a pickpocket up the service stairway of the great house on the avenue victor hugo the place in which he transacted his ambassadorial business was the kitchen with great danger that the terrible desnoyers might happen in there on one of his perambulations as a laboring man and surprise the intruder dona luisa would weep touched by the heart-rending tales of the messenger what could she do she was as poor as her maids she had jewels many jewels but not a franc then argensola came to the rescue with a solution worthy of his experience he would smooth the way for the good mother leaving some of her jewels at the mont de piete he knew the way to raise money on them so the lady accepted his advice giving him however only jewels of medium value as she suspected that she might never see them again later scruples made her at times refuse flatly suppose don marcelo should ever find it out what a scene but the spaniard deemed it unseemly to return empty-handed and always bore away a basket of bottles from the well-stocked wine cellar of the desnoyers every morning dona luisa went to saint honor de lo to pray for her son she felt that this was her own church it was a hospitable and familiar island in the unexplored ocean of paris here she could exchange discreet salutations with her neighbors from the different republics of the new world she felt nearer to god and the saints when she could hear in the vestibule conversations in her language it was moreover a sort of salon in which took place the great events of the south american colony one day was a wedding with flowers orchestra and chanting chorales with chichi beside her she greeted those she knew congratulating the bride and groom another day it was the funeral of an ex-president of some republic or some other foreign dignitary ending in paris his turbulent existence poor president poor general dona luisa remembered the dead man she had seen him many times in that church devoutly attending mass and she was indignant at the evil tongues which under the cover of a funeral oration recalled the shootings and bank failures in his country such a good and religious gentleman may god receive his soul in glory and upon going out into the square she would look with tender eyes upon the young men and women on horseback going to the bois de boulogne the luxurious automobiles the morning radiant in the sunshine all the primeval freshness of the early hours realizing what a beautiful thing it is to live her devout expression of gratitude for mere existence usually included the monument in the centre of the square all bristling with wings as if about to fly away from the ground victor hugo it was enough for her to have heard this name on the lips of her son to make her contemplate the statue with a family interest the only thing that she knew about the poet was that he had died of this she was almost sure and she imagined that in life he was a great friend of julio's because she had so often heard her son repeat his name ay her son 
all her thoughts her conjectures her desires converged on him and her strong-willed husband she longed for the men to come to an understanding and put an end to a struggle in which she was the principal victim would not god work this miracle like an invalid who goes from one sanitarium to another in pursuit of health she gave up the church on her street to attend the spanish chapel on the avenue friedland here she considered herself even more among her own end of section sixteen Recording by Tony Oliva, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Section 17, Part 1, Chapter 3, Continued, of The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, by Vicente Blasco Ibáñez. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain in the midst of the fine and elegant south american ladies who looked as if they had just escaped from a fashion sheet her eyes sought other women not so well dressed fat with theatrical ermine and antique jewelry when these high-born dames met each other in the vestibule they spoke with heavy voices and expressive gestures emphasizing their words energetically the daughter of the ranch ventured to salute them because she had subscribed to all their pet charities and upon seeing her greeting returned she felt a satisfaction which made her momentarily forget her woes they belonged to those families which her father had so greatly admired without knowing why they came from the mother country and to the good chicha were all excellentissimas or altissimas related to kings she did not know whether to give them her hand or bend the knee as she had vaguely heard was the custom at court but soon she recalled her preoccupation and went forward to wrestle in prayer with god ay that he would mercifully remember her that he would not long forget her son it was glory that remembered julio stretching out to him her arms of light so that he suddenly awoke to find himself surrounded by all the honors and advantages of celebrity fame cunningly surprises mankind on the most crooked and unexpected of roads neither the painting of souls nor a fitful existence full of extravagant love affairs and complicated duels had brought desnoyers this renown it was glory that put him on his feet a new pleasure for the delight of humanity had come from the other side of the seas people were asking one another in the mysterious tones of the initiated who wish to recognize a familiar spirit do you know how to tango the tango had taken possession of the world it was the heroic hymn of a humanity that was suddenly concentrating its aspirations on the harmonious rhythm of the thigh joints measuring its intelligence by the agility of its feet an incoherent and monotonous music of african inspiration was satisfying the artistic ideals of a society that required nothing better the world was dancing 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 a negro dance from cuba introduced into south america by mariners who shipped jerked beef to the antilles conquered the entire earth in a few months completely encircling it bounding victoriously from nation to nation like the marseillaise it was even penetrating into the most ceremonious courts overturning all traditions of conservation and etiquette like a song of the revolution the revolution of frivolity the pope even had become a master of the dance recommending the furlana instead of the tango since all the christian world regardless of sex was united in the common desire to agitate its feet with the tireless frenzy of the possessed of the middle ages julio desnoyers upon meeting this dance of his childhood in full swing in paris devoted himself to it with the confidence that an old love inspires who could have foretold that when as a student he was frequenting the lowest dance halls in buenos aires watched by the police that he was really serving an apprenticeship to glory from five to seven in the salons of the champ d'elysees where it cost five francs for a cup of tea and the privilege of joining in the sacred dance hundreds of eyes followed him with admiration he has the key 
said the women appraising his slender elegance medium stature and muscular springs and he in abbreviated jacket and expansive shirt bosom with his small girlish feet encased in high-heeled patent leathers with white tops danced gravely thoughtfully silently like a mathematician working out a problem under the lights that shed bluish tones upon his plastered glossy locks ladies asked to be presented to him in the sweet hope that their friends might envy them when they beheld them in the arms of the master invitations simply rained upon julio the most exclusive salons were thrown open to him so that every afternoon he made a dozen new acquaintances the fashion had brought over professors from the other side of the sea compatriots from the slums of buenos aires haughty and confused at being applauded like famous lecturers or tenors but julio triumphed over these vulgarians who danced for money and the incidents of his former life were considered by the women as deeds of romantic gallantry you are killing yourself argensola would say you are dancing too much the glory of his friend and master was only making more trouble for him his placid readings before the fire were now subject to daily interruptions it was impossible to read more than a chapter the celebrated man was continually ordering him to betake himself to the street a new lesson sighed the parasite and when he was alone in the studio numerous callers all women some inquisitive and aggressive others sad with a deserted air were constantly interrupting his thoughtful pursuits one of them terrified the occupants of the studio with her insistence she was a north american of uncertain age somewhere between thirty-two and fifty-nine with short skirts that whenever she sat down seemed to fly up as if moved by a spring various dances with desnoyers and a visit to the rue de la pompe she seemed to consider as her sacred rights and she pursued the master with the desperation of an abandoned zealot julio had made good his escape upon learning that this beauty of youthful elegance when seen from the back had two grandchildren master desnoyers has gone out argensola would invariably say upon receiving her and thereupon she would burst into tears and threats longing to kill herself then and there that her corpse might frighten away those other women who would come to rob her of what she considered her special privilege now it was argensola who sped his companion to the street when he wished to be alone he had only to remark casually i believe that yankee is coming and the great man would beat a hasty retreat oftentimes in his desperate flight availing himself of the back stairs at this time began to develop the most important event in julio's existence the desnoyers family was to be united with that of senator lacour rene his only son had succeeded in awakening in chichi a certain interest that was almost love the dignitary enjoyed thinking of his son allied to the boundless plains and immense herds whose description always affected him like a marvellous tale he was a widower but he enjoyed giving at his home famous banquets and parties every new celebrity immediately suggested to him the idea of giving a dinner no illustrious person passing through paris polar explorer or famous singer could escape being exhibited in the dining-room of la cour the son of desnoyers at whom he had scarcely glanced before now inspired him with sudden interest the senator was a thoroughly up-to-date man who did not classify glory nor distinguish reputations it was enough for him that a name should be on everybody's lips for him to accept it with enthusiasm when julio responded to his invitation he presented him with pride to his friends and came very near to calling him dear master the tango was monopolizing all conversation nowadays even in the academy they were taking it up in order to demonstrate that the youth of ancient athens had diverted itself in a somewhat similar way and lacour had dreamed all his life of an athenian republic 
at these reunions desnoyers became acquainted with the lauriers he was an engineer who owned a motor factory for automobiles in the outskirts of paris a man about thirty-five tall rather heavy and silent with a deliberate air as though he wished to see deeply into men and things she was of a light frivolous character loving life for the satisfactions and pleasures which it brought her appearing to accept with smiling conformity the silent and grave adoration of her husband she could not well do less with a man of his merits besides she had brought to the marriage a dowry of three hundred thousand francs a capital which had enabled the engineer to enlarge his business the senator had been instrumental in arranging this marriage he was interested in laurier because he was the son of an old friend upon marguerite laurier the presence of julio flashed like a ray of sunlight in the tiresome salon of lacour she was dancing the fad of the hour and frequenting the tango teas where reigned the adored desnoyers and to think that she was being entertained with this celebrated and interesting man that the other women were raving about in order that he might not take her for a mere middle-class woman like the other guests at the senator's party she spoke of her modistes all up from the rue de la paix declaring gravely that no woman who had any self-respect could possibly walk through the streets wearing a gown costing less than eight hundred francs and that the hat of a thousand francs but a few years ago an astonishing novelty was nowadays a very ordinary affair this acquaintanceship made the little laurier as her friends called her notwithstanding her tallness much sought by the master of the dance in spite of the looks of wrath and envy hurled at her by the others what a triumph for the wife of a simple engineer who was used to going everywhere in her mother's automobile julio at first had supposed her like all the others who were languishing in his arms following the rhythmic complications of the dance but he soon found that she was very different her coquetry after the first confidential words but increased his admiration he really had never before been thrown with a woman of her class those of his first social period were the habitues of the night restaurants paid for their witchery now glory was tossing into his arms ladies of high position but with an unconfessable past anxious for novelties although exceedingly mature this middle-class woman who would advance so confidently toward him and then retreat with such capricious outbursts of modesty was a new type for him the tango salons soon began to suffer a great loss desnoyers was permitting himself to be seen there with less frequency handing glory over to the professionals sometimes entire weeks slipped by without the five to seven devotees being able to admire his black locks and his tiny patent leathers twinkling under the lights in time with his graceful movements marguerite was also avoiding these places the meetings of the two were taking place in accordance with what she had read in the love stories of paris she was going in search of julio fearing to be recognized tremulous with emotion selecting her most inconspicuous suit and covering her face with a close veil the veil of adultery as her friends called it they had their trysts in the least frequented squares of the district frequently changing the places like timid birds that at the slightest disturbance fly to the perch a little further away sometimes they would meet in the butte chaumont at others they preferred the gardens on the left bank of the seine the luxembourg and even the distant parc de montsouris she was always in tremors of terror lest her husband might surprise them although she well knew that the industrious engineer was in his factory a great distance away her agitated aspect her excessive precautions in order to slip by unseen only served to attract the attention of the passers-by although julio was waxing impatient with the annoyance of this wandering love affair which only amounted to a few fugitive kisses he finally held his peace dominated by marguerite's pleadings she did not wish merely to be one of the procession of his sweethearts it was necessary to convince herself first that this love 
love was going to last for ever it was her first slip and she wanted it to be the last i her former spotless reputation what would people say the two returned to their adolescent period loving each other as they had never loved before with the confident and childish passion of fifteen-year-olds julio had leaped from childhood to libertinism taking his initiation into life at a single bound she had desired marriage in order to acquire the respect and liberty of a married woman but feeling toward her husband only a vague gratitude we end where others begin she said to desnoyers their passion took the form of an intense reciprocal and vulgar love they felt a romantic sentimentality in clasping hands or exchanging kisses on a garden bench in the twilight he was treasuring a ringlet of marguerite's although he doubted its genuineness with a vague suspicion that it might be one of the latest wisps of fashion she would cuddle down with her head on his shoulder as though imploring his protection although always in the open air if julio ever attempted greater intimacy in a carriage madame would repel him most vigorously a contradictory duality appeared to inspire her actions every morning on awaking she would decide to yield but then when near him her middle-class respectability jealous of its reputation kept her faithful to her mother's teachings one day she agreed to visit his studio with the interest that the haunts of the loved one always inspires promise that you will not take advantage of me he readily promised swearing that everything should be as marguerite wished but from that day they were no longer seen in the gardens nor wandering around persecuted by the winter winds they preferred the studio and argensola had to rearrange his existence seeking the stove of another artist friend in order to continue his reading end of section seventeen recording by tony oliva albuquerque new mexico section eighteen part one chapter three continued of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez this librivox recording is in the public domain this state of things lasted two months they never knew what secret force suddenly disturbed their tranquillity perhaps one of her friends guessing at the truth had told the husband anonymously perhaps it was she herself unconsciously with her inexpressible happiness her tardy returns home when dinner was already served and the sudden aversion which she showed toward the engineer in their hours alone trying to keep her heart faithful to her lover to divide her interests between her legal companion and the man she loved was a torment that her simple and vehement enthusiasm could not tolerate while she was hurrying one night through the rue de la pompe looking at her watch and trembling with impatience at not finding an automobile or even a cab a man stood in front of her etienne laurier she always shuddered with fear on recalling that hour for a moment she believed that he was going to kill her serious men quiet and diffident are most terrible in their explosions of wrath her husband knew everything with the same patience that he employed in solving his industrial problems he had been studying her day by day without her ever suspecting the watchfulness behind that impassive countenance then he had followed her in order to complete the evidence of his misfortune marguerite had never supposed that he could be so common and noisy in his anger she had expected that he would accept the facts coldly with that slight tinge of philosophical irony usually shown by distinguished men as the husbands of her friends had done but the poor engineer who outside of his work saw only his wife loving her as a woman and adoring her as a dainty and superior being a model of grace and elegance could not endure the thought of her downfall and cried and threatened without reserve so that the scandal became known throughout their entire circle of friends the senator felt greatly annoyed in remembering that it was in his exclusive home 
that the guilty ones had become acquainted but his displeasure was visited upon the husband what lack of good taste women will be women and everything is capable of adjustment but before the imprudent outbursts of this frantic devil no elegant solution was possible and there was now nothing to do but to begin divorce proceedings desnoyers senior was very indignant upon learning of this last escapade of his son he had always had a great liking for laurier that instinctive bond which exists between men of industry patient and silent had made them very congenial at the senator's receptions he had always talked with the engineer about the progress of his business interesting himself in the development of that factory of which he always spoke with the affection of a father the millionaire in spite of his reputation for miserliness had even volunteered his disinterested support if at any time it should become necessary to enlarge the plant and it was this good man's happiness that his son a frivolous and useless answer was going to steal at first laurier spoke of a duel his wrath was that of a workhorse who breaks the tight reins of his laboring outfit tosses his mane neighs wildly and bites the father was greatly distressed at the possibility of such an outcome one scandal more julio had dedicated the greater part of his existence to the handling of arms he will kill the poor man he said to the senator i am sure that he will kill him it is the logic of life the good-for-nothing always kill those who amount to anything but there was no killing the father of the republic knew how to handle the clashing parties with the same skill that he always employed in the corridors of the senate during a ministerial crisis the scandal was hushed up marguerite went to live with her mother and took the first steps for a divorce some evenings when the studio clock was striking seven she would yawn and say sadly i must go i have to go although this is my true home ah oh, what a pity that we are not married and he feeling a whole garden of bourgeois virtues hitherto ignored burst into bloom repeated in a tone of conviction that's so why are we not married their wishes could be realized the husband was facilitating the step by his unexpected intervention so young desnoyers set forth for south america in order to raise the money and marry marguerite End of section eighteen recording by tony oliva albuquerque new mexico section nineteen part one chapter four of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four the cousin from berlin the studio of julio desnoyers was on the top floor both the stairway and the elevator stopping before his door the two tiny apartments at the back were lighted by an interior court their only means of communication being the service stairway which went on up to the garrets while his comrade was away argensola had made the acquaintance of those in the neighboring lodgings the largest of the apartments was empty during the day its occupants not returning till after they had taken their evening meal in a restaurant as both husband and wife were employed outside they could not remain at home except on holidays the man vigorous and of a martial aspect was superintendent in a big department store he had been a soldier in africa wore a military decoration and had the rank of sub-lieutenant in the reserves she was a blonde heavy and rather anemic with bright eyes and a sentimental expression on holidays she spent long hours at the piano playing musical reveries always the same at other times argensola saw her through the interior window working in the kitchen aided by her companion the two laughing over their clumsiness and inexperience in preparing the sunday dinner the concierge thought that this woman was a german but she herself said that she was a swiss she was a cashier in a shop not the one in which her husband was employed in the mornings they left home together separating in the place d'etoile at seven in the evening they met here greeting each other with a kiss like lovers 
who meet for the first time and then after supper they return to their nest in the rue de la pompe all argensola's attempts at friendliness with these neighbors were repulsed because of their self-centeredness they responded with freezing courtesy they lived only for themselves the other apartment of two rooms was occupied by a single man he was a russian or pole who almost always returned with a package of books and passed many hours riding near the patio window from the very first the spaniard took him to be a mysterious man probably a very distinguished one a true hero of a novel the foreign appearance of this chernoff made a great impression upon him his dishevelled beard and oily locks his spectacles upon a large nose that seemed deformed by a dagger thrust there emanated from him like an invisible nimbus an odour of cheap wine and soiled clothing when argensolas caught a glimpse of him through the service door he would say to himself ah friend chernoff is returning and thereupon he would saunter out to the stairway in order to have a chat with his neighbour for a long time the stranger discouraged all approach to his quarters which fact led the spaniard to infer that he devoted himself to alchemy and kindred mysteries when he finally was allowed to enter he saw only books many books books everywhere scattered on the floor heaped upon benches piled in corners overflowing on to broken-down chairs old tables and a bed that was only made up now and then when the owner alarmed by the increasing invasion of dust and cobwebs was obliged to call in the aid of his friend the concierge argensola finally realized not without a certain disenchantment that there was nothing mysterious in the life of the man what he was writing near the window were merely translations some of them ordered others volunteer work for the socialist periodicals the only marvellous thing about him was the quantity of languages that he knew he knows them all said the spaniard when describing their neighbor to desnoyers he has only to hear of a new one to master it he holds the key the secret of all languages living or dead he speaks castilian as well as we do and yet he has never been in a spanish-speaking country argensola again felt a thrill of mystery upon reading the titles of many of the volumes the majority were old books many of them in languages that he was not able to decipher picked up for a song at second-hand shops or in the bookstands installed upon the parapets of the same only a man holding the key of tongues could get together such volumes an atmosphere of mysticism of superhuman insight of secrets intact for many centuries appeared to emanate from these heaps of dusty volumes with worm-eaten leaves and mixed with these ancient tomes were others red and conspicuous pamphlets of socialistic propaganda leaflets in all the languages of europe and periodicals many periodicals with revolutionary titles Chernoff did not appear to enjoy visits and conversation he would smile enigmatically into his black beard and was very sparing with his words so as to shorten the interview but argensola possessed the means of winning over this sullen personage it was only necessary for him to wink one eye with the expressive invitation do we go and the two would soon be settled on a bench in the kitchen of desnoyers studio opposite a bottle which had come from the avenue victor hugo the costly wines of don marcelo made the russian more communicative although in spite of this aid the spaniard learned little of his neighbor's real existence sometimes he would mention jaurès and other socialistic orators his surest means of existence was the translation of periodicals or party papers on various occasions the name of siberia escaped from his lips and he admitted that he had been there a long time but he did not care to talk about a country visited against his will he would merely smile modestly showing plainly that he did not wish to make any further revelations 
the morning after the return of julio desnoyers while argensola was talking on the stairway with tchernoff the bell rang how annoying the russian who was well up in advanced politics was just explaining the plans advanced by jaurès there were still many who hoped that war might be averted he had his motives for doubting it he tchernoff was commenting on these illusions with the smile of a flat-nosed sphinx when the bell rang for a second time so that argensola was obliged to break away from his interesting friend and run to open the main door a gentleman wished to see julio he spoke very correct french though his accent was a revelation for argensola upon going into the bedroom in search of his master who was just arising he said confidently it's the cousin from berlin who has come to say good-bye it could not be any one else when the three came together in the studio desnoyers presented his comrade in order that the visitor might not make any mistake in regard to his social status i have heard him spoken of the gentleman is argensola a very deserving youth dr julius von hartrott said this with the self-sufficiency of a man who knows everything and wishes to be agreeable to an inferior conceding him the alms of his attention the two cousins confronted each other with a curiosity not altogether free from distrust although closely related they knew each other very slightly tacitly admitting complete divergence in opinions and tastes after slowly examining the sage argensola came to the conclusion that he looked like an officer dressed as a civilian he noticed in his person an effort to imitate the soldierly when occasionally discarding uniform the ambition of every german burgher wishing to be taken for the superior class his trousers were narrow as though intended to be tucked into cavalry boots his coat with the two rows of buttons had the contracted waist with very full skirt and upstanding lapels suggesting vaguely a military greatcoat the reddish mustachios strong jaw and shaved head completed his would-be martial appearance but his eyes large dark circled and near-sighted were the eyes of a student taking refuge behind great thick glasses which gave him the aspect of a man of peace desnoyers knew that he was an assistant professor of the university that he had published a few volumes fat and heavy as bricks and that he was a member of an academic society collaborating in documentary research directed by a famous historian in his lapel he was wearing the badge of a foreign order julio's respect for the learned member of the family was not unmixed with contempt he and his sister chichi had from childhood felt an instinctive hostility toward the cousins from berlin it annoyed him too to have his family everlastingly holding up as a model this pedant who only knew life as it is in books and passed his existence investigating what men had done in other epochs in order to draw conclusions in harmony with germany's views while young desnoyers had great facility for admiration and reverenced all those whose arguments argensola had doled out to him he drew the line at accepting the intellectual grandeur of this illustrious relative during his stay in berlin a german word for vulgar invention had enabled him to classify this prig heavy books of minute investigation were every month being published by the dozens in the fatherland there was not a professor who could resist the temptation of constructing from the simplest detail an enormous volume written in a dull involved style the people therefore appreciating that these near-sighted authors were incapable of any genial vision of comradeship called them sitzfleisch haben because of the very long sittings which their works represented that was what this cousin was for him a mere sitzfleisch haben dr von hartrott on explaining his visit spoke in spanish he availed himself of this language used by the family during his childhood as a precaution looking around repeatedly as if he feared to be heard he had come to bid his cousin farewell his mother had told him of his return and he had not wished to leave paris without seeing him he was leaving in a few hours since matters were growing more strained 
but do you really believe that there will be war asked desnoyers war will be declared to-morrow or the day after nothing can prevent it now it is necessary for the welfare of humanity silence followed this speech julio and argensola looking with astonishment at this peaceable-looking man who had just spoken with such martial arrogance the two suspected that the professor was making this visit in order to give vent to his opinions and enthusiasms at the same time perhaps he was trying to find out what they might think and know as one of the many viewpoints of the people in paris you are not french he added looking at his cousin you were born in argentina so before you i may speak the truth and were you not born there asked julio smiling the doctor made a gesture of protest as though he had just heard something insulting no i am a german no matter where a german may be born he always belongs to his mother country then turning to argensola this gentleman too is a foreigner he comes from noble spain which owes to us the best that it has the worship of honor the knightly spirit the spaniard wished to remonstrate but the sage would not permit adding in an oracular tone you were miserable celts sunk in the vileness of an inferior and mongrel race whose domination by rome but made your situation worse fortunately you were conquered by the goths and others of our race who implanted in you a sense of personal dignity do not forget young man that the vandals were the ancestors of the prussians of to-day again argensola tried to speak but his friend signed to him not to interrupt the professor who appeared to have forgotten his former reserve and was working up to an enthusiastic pitch with his own words we are going to witness great events he continued fortunate are those born in this epoch the most interesting in history at this very moment humanity is changing its course now the true civilization begins the war according to him was going to be of a brevity hitherto unseen germany had been preparing herself to bring about this event without any long economic world disturbance a single month would be enough to crush france the most to be feared of their adversaries then they would march against russia who with her slow clumsy movements could not oppose an immediate defence finally they would attack haughty england so isolated in its archipelago that it could not obstruct the sweep of german progress this would make a series of rapid blows and overwhelming victories requiring only a summer in which to play this magnificent role the fall of the leaves in the following autumn would greet the definite triumph of germany with the assurance of a professor who does not expect his dictum to be refuted by his hearers he explained the superiority of the german race all mankind was divided into two groups dolicephalus and the brachycephalus according to the shape of the skull another scientific classification divided men into the light-haired and dark-haired the dolicephalus arched heads represented purity of race and superior mentality the brachycephalus flat heads were mongrels with all the stigma of degeneration the german dolicephalus par excellence was the only descendant of the primitive aryans all the other nations especially those of the south of europe called latins belonged to a degenerate humanity the spaniard could not contain himself any longer but no person with any intelligence believes any more in those antique theories of race what if there no longer existed a people of absolutely pure blood owing to thousands of admixtures due to historical conquests many germans bore the identical ethnic marks which the professor was attributing to the inferior races there is something in that admitted hartrott but although the german race may not be perfectly pure it is the least impure of all races and therefore should have dominion over the world his voice took on an ironic and cutting edge when speaking of the celts inhabitants of the lands of the south 
they had retarded the progress of humanity deflecting it in the wrong direction the celt is individualistic and consequently an ungovernable revolutionary who tends to socialism furthermore he is a humanitarian and makes a virtue of mercy defending the existence of the weak who do not amount to anything the illustrious german places above everything else method and power elected by nature to command the impotent races he possesses all the qualifications that distinguish the superior leader the french revolution was merely a clash between teutons and celts the nobility of france were descended from germanic warriors established in the country after the so-called invasion of the barbarians the middle and lower classes were the gallic celtic element the inferior race had conquered the superior disorganizing the country and perturbing the world celtism was the inventor of democracy of the doctrines of socialism and anarchy now the hour of germanic retaliation was about to strike and the northern race would re-establish order since god had favored it by demonstrating its indisputable superiority a nation he added can aspire to great destinies only when it is fundamentally teutonic the less german it is the less its civilization amounts to we represent the aristocracy of humanity the salt of the earth as our williams said end of section nineteen recording by tony oliva albuquerque new mexico section twenty part one chapter four continued of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez this librivox recording is in the public domain argensola was listening with astonishment to this outpouring of conceit all the great nations had passed through the fever of imperialism the greeks aspired to world rule because they were the most civilized and believed themselves the most fit to give civilization to the rest of mankind the romans upon conquering countries implanted law and rule of justice the french of the revolution and the empire justified their invasions on the plea that they wished to liberate mankind and spread abroad new ideas even the spaniards of the sixteenth century when battling half of europe for religious unity and the extermination of heresy were working toward their ideals obscure and perhaps erroneous but disinterested all the nations of history had been struggling for something which they had considered generous and above their own interests germany alone according to this professor was trying to impose itself upon the world in the name of racial superiority a superiority that nobody had recognized that she was arrogating to herself coating her affirmations with a varnish of false science until now wars have been carried on by the soldiery continued hartrott that which is now going to begin will be waged by a combination of soldiers and professors in its preparation the university has taken as much part as the military staff german science leader of all sciences is united forever with what the latin revolutionists disdainfully term militarism force mistress of the world is what creates right that which our truly unique civilization imposes our armies are the representatives of our culture and in a few weeks we shall free the world from its decadence completely rejuvenating it the vision of the immense future of his race was leading him on to expose himself with lyrical enthusiasm william I, bismarck all the heroes of past victories inspired his veneration but he spoke of them as dying gods whose hour had passed they were glorious ancestors of modest pretensions who had confined their activities to enlarging the frontiers and to establishing the unity of the empire afterwards opposing themselves with the prudence of valetudinarians to the daring of the new generation their ambitions went no further than a continental hegemony but now william second had leaped into the arena the complex hero that the country required 
lamprecht my master has pictured his greatness it is tradition and the future method and audacity like his grandfather the emperor holds the conviction of what monarchy by the grace of god represents but his vivid and modern intelligence recognizes and accepts modern conditions at the same time that he is romantic feudal and a supporter of the agrarian conservatives he is also an up-to-date man who seeks practical solutions and shows a utilitarian spirit in him are correctly balanced instinct and reason germany guided by this hero had according to hartrott been concentrating its strength and recognizing its true path the university supported him even more unanimously than the army why store up so much power and maintain it without employment the empire of the world belongs to the german people the historians and philosophers disciples of treitschke were taking it upon themselves to frame the rights that would justify this universal domination and lamprecht the psychological historian like the other professors was launching the belief in the absolute superiority of the germanic race it was just that it should rule the world since it only had the power to do so this tellurian germanization was to be of immense benefit to mankind the earth was going to be happy under the dictatorship of a people born for mastery the german state tentacular potency would eclipse with its glory the most imposing empire of the past and present gott mit uns who will be able to deny as my master says that there exists a christian german god the great ally who is showing himself to our enemies the foreigners as a strong and jealous divinity desnoyers was listening to his cousin with astonishment and at the same time looking at argensola who with a flutter of his eyes seemed to be saying to him he is mad these germans are simply mad with pride meanwhile the professor unable to curb his enthusiasm continued expounding the grandeur of his race from his viewpoint the providential kaiser had shown inexplicable weakenings he was too good and too kind delicie generis humani as had said professor lasson another of hartrott's masters able to overthrow everything with his annihilating power the emperor was limiting himself merely to maintaining peace but the nation did not wish to stop there and was pushing its leader until it had him started it was useless now to put on the brakes he who does not advance recedes that was the cry of pan-germanism to the emperor he must press on in order to conquer the entire world and now war comes continued the pedant we need the colonies of the others even though bismarck through an error of his stubborn old age exacted nothing at the time of universal distribution letting england and france get possession of the best lands we must control all countries that have germanic blood and have been civilized by our forebears hartrott enumerated these countries holland and belgium were german france through the franks was one-third teutonic blood italy here the professor hesitated recalling the fact that this nation was still an ally certainly a little insecure but still united by diplomatic bonds he mentioned nevertheless the longobards and other races coming from the north spain and portugal had been populated by the ruddy goth and also belonged to the dominant race and since the majority of the nations of america were of spanish and portuguese origin they should also be included in this recovery it is a little premature to think of these last nations just yet added the doctor modestly but some day the hour of justice will sound after our continental triumph we shall have time to think of their fate north america also should receive our civilizing influence for there are living millions of germans who have created its greatness he was talking of the future conquests as though they were marks of distinction with which his country was going to favor other countries these were to continue living politically the same as before with their individual governments but subject to the teutons like miners requiring the strong hand of a master 
they would form the universal united states with the hereditary and all-powerful president the emperor of germany receiving all the benefits of germanic culture working disciplined under his industrial direction but the world is ungrateful and human badness always opposes itself to progress we have no illusions sighed the professor with lofty sadness we have no friends all look upon us with jealousy as dangerous beings because we are the most intelligent the most active and have proved ourselves superior to all others but since they no longer love us let them fear us as my friend mann says although culture is the spiritual organization of the world it does not exclude bloody savagery when that becomes necessary culture sanctifies the demon within us and is above morality reason and science we are going to impose culture by force of the cannon argensola continued saying with his eyes they are crazy crazy with pride what can the world expect of such people desnoyers here intervened in order to brighten this gloomy monologue with a little optimism war had not yet been positively declared the diplomats were still trying to arrange matters perhaps it might all turn out peaceably in the last minute as had so often happened before his cousin was seeing things entirely distorted by an aggressive enthusiasm oh the ironical ferocious and cutting smile of the doctor argensola had never known old madariaga but it nevertheless occurred to him that in this fashion sharks must smile although he too had never seen a shark it is war boomed hartrott when i left germany fifteen days ago i knew that war was inevitable the certainty with which he said this dissipated all julio's hope moreover this man's trip on the pretext of seeing his mother disquieted him on what mission had dr julius von hartrott come to paris well then asked desnoyers why so many diplomatic interviews why does the german government intervene at all although in such a lukewarm way in the struggle between austria and servia would it not be better to declare war right out the professor replied with simplicity our government undoubtedly wishes that the others should declare the war the role of outraged dignity is always the most pleasing one and justifies all ulterior resolutions however extreme they may seem there are some of our people who are living comfortably and do not desire war it is expedient to make them believe that those who impose it upon us are our enemies so that they may feel the necessity of defending themselves only superior minds reach the conviction of the great advancement that can be accomplished by the sword alone and that war as our grand Treschke says is the highest form of progress again he smiled with a ferocious expression morality from his point of view should exist among individuals only to make them more obedient and disciplined for morality per se impedes governments and should be suppressed as a useless obstacle for the state there exists neither truth nor falsehood it only recognizes the utility of things the glorious bismarck in order to consummate the war with france the base of german grandeur had not hesitated to falsify a telegraphic dispatch and remember that he is the most glorious hero of our time history looks leniently upon his heroic feat who would accuse the one who triumphs professor hans delbruck has written with reason blessed be the hand that falsified the telegram of ems it was convenient to have the war break out immediately in order that events might result favorably for germany whose enemies are totally unprepared preventive war was recommended by general bernhardi and other illustrious patriots it would be dangerous indeed to defer the declaration of war until the enemies had fortified themselves so that they should be the one ones to make war besides to the germans what kind of deterrence could law and other fictions invented by weak nations possibly be no they had the power and power creates new laws if they proved to be the victors history would not investigate too closely the means by which they had conquered 
it was germany that was going to win and the priests of all cults would finally sanctify with their chants the blessed war if it led to triumph we are not making war in order to punish the servian regicides nor to free the poles nor the others oppressed by russia stopping there in admiration of our disinterested magnanimity we wish to wage it because we are the first people of earth and should extend our activity over the entire planet germany's hour has sounded we are going to take our place as the powerful mistress of the world the place which spain occupied in former centuries afterwards france and england to-day what those people accomplished in a struggle of many years we are going to bring about in four months the storm flag of the empire is now going to wave over nations and oceans the sun is going to shine on a great slaughter old rome sick unto death called barbarians the germans who opened the grave the world to-day also smells death and will surely call us barbarians so be it when tangiers and toulouse ambert and calais have become submissive to german barbarism then we will speak further of this matter we have the power and who has that needs neither to hesitate nor to argue power that is the beautiful word the only word that rings true and clear power one sure stab and all argument is answered forever but are you so sure of victory asked desnoyers sometimes destiny gives us great surprises there are hidden forces that we must take into consideration or they may overturn the best laid plans the smile of the doctor became increasingly scornful and arrogant everything had been foreseen and studied out long ago with the most minute germanic method what had they to fear the enemy most to be reckoned with was france incapable of resisting the enervating moral influences the sufferings the strain and privations of war a nation physically debilitated and so poisoned by revolutionary spirit that it had laid aside the use of arms through an exaggerated love of comfort our generals he announced are going to leave her in such a state that she will never again cross our path there was russia too to consider but her amorphous masses were slow to assemble and unwieldy to move the executive staff of berlin had timed everything by measure for crushing france in four weeks and would then lead its enormous forces against the russian empire before it could begin action we shall finish with the bear after killing the cock affirmed the professor triumphantly but guessing some objection from his cousin he hastened on i know what you are going to tell me there remains another enemy one that has not yet leaped into the lists but which all the germans are waiting for that one inspires more hatred than all the others put together because it is of our blood because it is a traitor to the race ah how we loathe it and in the tone in which these words were uttered throbbed an expression of hatred and a thirst for vengeance which astonished both listeners even though england attack us continued hartrott we shall conquer notwithstanding this adversary is not more terrible than the others for the past century she has ruled the world upon the fall of napoleon she seized the continental hegemony and will fight to keep it but what does her energy amount to as our bernhardi says the english people are merely a nation of renters and sportsmen Their army is formed from the dregs of the nation the country lacks military spirit we are a people of warriors and it will be an easy thing for us to conquer the english debilitated by a false conception of life the doctor paused then added we are counting on the internal corruption of our enemies on their lack of unity god will aid us by sowing confusion among these detested people in a few days you will see his hand revolution is going to break out in france at the same time as war the people of paris will build barricades in the streets and the scenes of the commune will repeat themselves 
tunis algiers and all their other possessions are about to rise against the metropolis argensola seized the opportunity to smile with an aggressive incredulity i repeat it insisted hartrott that this country is going to have internal revolution and colonial insurrection i know perfectly well what i am talking about russia will also break out into revolution with a red flag that will force the czar to beg for mercy on his knees you have only to read the papers of the recent strikes in st petersburg and the manifestations of the strikers with the pretext of president poincare's visit england will see her appeals to her colonies completely ignored india is going to rise against her and egypt too will seize this opportunity for her emancipation julio was beginning to be impressed by these affirmations enunciated with such oracular certainty and he felt almost irritated at the incredulous argensola who continued looking insolently at the seer repeating with his winking eyes he is insane insane with with pride the man certainly must have strong reasons for making such awful prophecies his presence in paris just at this time was difficult for desnoyers to understand and gave to his words a mysterious authority but the nations will defend themselves he protested to his cousin victory will not be such a very simple thing as you imagine yes they will defend themselves and the struggle will be fiercely contested it appears that of late years france has been paying some attention to her army we shall undoubtedly encounter some resistance triumph may be somewhat difficult but we are going to prevail you have no idea to what extent the offensive power of germany has attained nobody knows with certainty beyond the frontiers if our foes should comprehend it in all its immensity they would fall on their knees beforehand to beg for mercy thus obviating the necessity for useless sacrifices End of section twenty recording by tony oliva albuquerque new mexico section twenty one part one chapter four continued of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez this librivox recording is in the public domain there was a long silence julius von hartrott appeared lost in reverie the very thought of the accumulated strength of his race submerged him in a species of mystic adoration the preliminary victory he suddenly exclaimed we gained some time ago our enemies therefore hate us and yet they imitate us all that bears the stamp of germany is in demand throughout the world the very countries that are trying to resist our arms copy our methods in their universities and admire our theories even those which do not attain success in germany oftentimes we laugh among ourselves like the roman augurs upon seeing the servility with which they follow us and yet they will not admit our superiority for the first time argensola's eyes and general expression approved the words of hartrott what he had just said was only too true the world was a victim of the german superstition an intellectual cowardice the fear of force had made it admire en masse and indiscriminately everything of teutonic origin just because of the intensity of its glitter gold mixed with talcum the so-called latins dazed with admiration were with unreasonable pessimism becoming doubtful of their ability and thus were the first to decree their own death and the conceited germans merely had to repeat the words of these pessimists in order to strengthen their belief in their own superiority with that southern temperament which leaps rapidly from one extreme to another many latins had proclaimed that in the world of the future there would be no place for the latin peoples now in their death agony adding that germany alone preserved the latent forces of civilization the french who declaimed among themselves with the greatest exaggeration unconscious that folks were listening the other side of the door had proclaimed repeatedly for many years past that france was degenerating rapidly and would soon vanish from the earth 
then why should they resent the scorn of their enemies why shouldn't the germans share their beliefs the professor in misinterpreting the silent agreement of the spaniard who until then had been listening with such a hostile smile added now is the time to try out in france the german culture implanting it there as conquerors here argensola interrupted and what if there is no such thing as german culture as a celebrated teuton says it had become necessary to contradict this pedant who had become insufferable with his egotism hartrott almost jumped from his chair on hearing such a doubt what german is that nietzsche the professor looked at him pityingly nietzsche had said to mankind be harsh affirming that a righteous war sanctifies every cause he had exalted bismarck he had taken part in the war of seventy he was glorifying germany when he spoke of the smiling lion and the blond beast but argensola listened with the tranquillity of one sure of his ground oh hours of placid reading near the studio chimney listening to the rain beating against the pane the philosopher did say that he admitted and he said many other very different things like all great thinkers his doctrine is one of pride but of individual pride not that of a nation or race he always spoke against the insidious fallacy of race argensola recalled his philosophy word for word culture according to nietzsche was unity of style in all the manifestations of life science did not necessarily include culture great knowledge might be accompanied by great barbarity by the absence of style or by the chaotic confusion of all styles germany according to the philosopher had no genuine culture owing to its lack of style the french he had said were at the head of an authentic and fruitful culture whatever their valor might be and until now everybody had drawn upon it their hatreds were concentrated within their own country i cannot endure germany the spirit of servility and pettiness penetrates everywhere i believe only in french culture and what the rest of europe calls culture appears to me to be a mistake the few individual cases of lofty culture that i met in germany were of french origin you know continued argensola that in quarrelling with wagner about the excess of germanism in his art nietzsche proclaimed the necessity of mediterraneanizing music his ideal was a culture for all europe but with a latin base julius von hartrott replied most disdainfully to this repeating the spaniard's very words men who thought much said many things besides nietzsche was a poet completely demented at his death and was no authority among the university sages his fame had only been recognized in foreign lands and he paid no further attention to the youth ignoring him as though he had evaporated into thin air after his presumption all the professor's attention was now concentrated on desnoyers this country he resumed is dying from within how can you doubt that revolution will break out the minute war is declared have you not noticed the agitation of the boulevard on account of the caillot trial reactionaries and revolutionists have been assaulting each other for the past three days i have seen them challenging one another with shouts and songs as if they were going to come to blows right in the middle of the street this division of opinion will become accentuated when our troops cross the frontier it will then be civil war the anti-militarists are clamoring mournfully believing that it is in the power of the government to prevent the clash a country degenerated by democracy and by the inferiority of the triumphant celt greedy for full liberty we are the only free people on earth because we know how to obey this paradox made julio smile germany the only free people it is so persisted hartrott energetically we have the liberty best suited to a great people economical and intellectual liberty and political liberty the professor received this question with a scornful shrug political liberty only decadent and ungovernable people inferior races anxious for equality and democratic confusion talk about political liberty we germans do not need it 
we are a nation of masters who recognize the sacredness of government and we wish to be commanded by those of superior birth we possess the genius of organization that according to the doctor was the grand german secret and the teutonic race upon taking possession of the world would share its discovery with all the nations would then be so organized that each individual would give the maximum of service to society humanity banded in regiments for every class of production obeying a superior officer like machines contributing to the greatest possible output of labor there you have the perfect state liberty was a purely negative idea if not accompanied with a positive concept which would make it useful the two friends listened with astonishment to this description of the future which teutonic superiority was offering to the world every individual submitted to intensive production the same as a bit of land from which its owner wishes to get the greatest number of vegetables mankind reduced to mechanics no useless operations that would not produce immediate results and the people who heralded this awful idea were the very philosophers and idealists who had once given contemplation and reflection the first place in their existence Hartrott again harked back to the inferiority of their racial enemies in order to combat successfully it required self-assurance an unquenchable confidence in the superiority of their own powers at this very hour in berlin every one is accepting war every one is believing that victory is sure while here i do not say that the french are afraid they have a brave past that galvanizes them at certain times but they are so depressed that it is easy to guess that they will make almost any sacrifices in order to evade what is coming upon them the people first will shout with enthusiasm as it always cheers that which carries it to perdition the upper classes have no faith in the future they are keeping quiet but the presentiment of disaster may easily be conjectured yesterday i was talking with your father he is french and he is rich he was indignant against the government of his country for involving the nation in the european conflict in order to defend a distant and uninteresting people he complains of the exalted patriots who have opened the abyss between germany and france preventing a reconciliation he says that alsace and lorraine are not worth what a war would cost in men and money he recognizes our greatness and is convinced that we have progressed so rapidly that the other countries cannot come up to us and as your father thinks so do many others all those who are wrapped in creature comfort and fear to lose it believe me a country that hesitates and fears war is conquered before the first battle julio evinced a certain disquietude as though he would like to cut short the conversation just leave my father out of it he speaks that way to-day because war is not yet an accomplished fact and he has to contradict and vent his indignation on whoever comes near him to-morrow he will say just the opposite my father is a latin the professor looked at his watch he must go there were still many things which he had to do before going to the station the germans living in paris had fled in great bands as though a secret order had been circulating among them that afternoon the last of those who had been living ostensibly in the capital would depart i have come to see you because of our family interest because it was my duty to give you fair warning you are a foreigner and nothing holds you here if you are desirous of witnessing a great historic event remain but it will be better for you to go the war is going to be ruthless very ruthless and if paris attempts resistance as formerly we shall see terrible things modes of offence have greatly changed desnoyers made a gesture of indifference the same as your father observed the professor last night he and all your family responded in the same way even my mother prefers to remain with her sister saying that the germans are very good very civilized and there is nothing to apprehend in their triumph this good opinion seemed to be troubling the doctor they don't understand what modern warfare means they ignore the fact that our generals have studied the art of overcoming the enemy and they will apply it mercilessly ruthlessness is the only means 
since it perturbs the intelligence of the enemy paralyzes his action and pulverizes his resistance the more ferocious the war the more quickly it is concluded to punish with cruelty is to proceed humanely therefore germany is going to be cruel with a cruelty hitherto unseen in order that the conflict may not be prolonged he had risen and was standing cane and straw hat in hand argensola was looking at him with frank hostility the professor obliged to pass near him did so with a stiff and disdainful nod then he started toward the door accompanied by his cousin the farewell was brief i repeat my counsel if you do not like danger go it may be that i am mistaken and that this nation convinced of the uselessness of defence may give itself up voluntarily at any rate we shall soon see i shall take great pleasure in returning to paris when the flag of the empire is floating over the eiffel tower a mere matter of three or four weeks certainly by the beginning of september france was going to disappear from the map to the doctor her death was a foregone conclusion paris will remain he admitted benevolently the french will remain because a nation is not easily suppressed but they will not retain their former place we shall govern the world they will continue to occupy themselves in inventing fashions in making life agreeable for visiting foreigners and in the intellectual world we shall encourage them to educate good actresses to produce entertaining novels and to write witty comedies nothing more desnoyers laughed as he shook his cousin's hand pretending to take his words as a paradox i mean it insisted hartrott the last hour of the french republic as an important nation has sounded i have studied it at close range and it deserves no better fate license and lack of confidence above sterile enthusiasm below upon turning his head he again caught argensola's malicious smile we know all about that kind of study he added aggressively we are accustomed to examine the nations of the past to dissect them fibre by fibre so that we recognize at a glance the psychology of the living the bohemian fancied that he saw a surgeon talking self-sufficiently about the mysteries of the will before a corpse what did this pedantic interpreter of dead documents know about life when the door closed he approached his friend who was returning somewhat dismayed argensola no longer considered dr julius von hartrott crazy what a brute he exclaimed throwing up his hands and to think that they are at large these originators of gloomy errors who would ever believe that they belong to the same land that produced kant the pacifist the serene goethe and beethoven to think that for so many years we have believed that they were forming a nation of dreamers and philosophers occupied in working disinterestedly for all mankind the sentence of a german geographer recurred to him the german is bicephalous with one head he dreams and poetizes while with the other he thinks and executes desnoyers was now beginning to feel depressed at the certainty of war this professor seemed to him even worse than the herr counsellor and the other germans that he had met on the steamer his distress was not only because of his selfish thought as to how the catastrophe was going to affect his plans with marguerite he was suddenly discovering that in this hour of uncertainty he loved france he recognized it as his father's native land and the scene of the great revolution although he had never mixed in political campaigns he was a republican at heart and had often ridiculed certain of his friends who adored kings and emperors thinking it a great sign of distinction argensola tried to cheer him up who knows this is a country of surprises one must see the frenchman when he tries to remedy his want of foresight let that barbarian of a cousin of yours say what he will there is order there is enthusiasm worse off than we were those who lived in the days before valmy entirely disorganized their only defence battalions of labourers and countrymen handling a gun for the first time but nevertheless the europe of the old monarchies could not for twenty years free themselves from these improvised warriors end of section twenty one recording by tony oliva albuquerque new mexico
section twenty two part one chapter five of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five in which appear the four horsemen the two friends now lived a feverish life considerably accelerated by the rapidity with which events succeeded each other every hour brought forth an astonishing bit of news generally false which changed opinions very suddenly as soon as the danger of war seemed arrested the report would spread that mobilization was going to be ordered within a few minutes within each twenty-four hours were compressed the disquietude anxiety and nervous waste of a normal year and that which was aggravating the situation still more was the uncertainty the expectation of the event feared but still invisible the distress on account of a danger continually threatening but never arriving history in the making was like a stream overflowing its banks events overlapping each other like the waves of an inundation austria was declaring war with servia while the diplomats of the great powers were continuing their efforts to stem the tide the electric web girdling the planet was vibrating incessantly in the depths of the ocean and on the peaks of the continents transmitting alternate hopes and fears russia was mobilizing a part of its army germany with its troops in readiness under the pretext of maneuvers was decreeing a state of threatened war the austrians regardless of the efforts of diplomacy were beginning the bombardment of belgrade william the second fearing that the intervention of the powers might settle the differences between the czar and the emperor of austria was forcing the course of events by declaring war upon russia then germany began isolating herself cutting off railroad and telegraphic communications in order to shroud in mystery her invading forces france was watching this avalanche of events temperate in its words and enthusiasm a cool and grave resolution was noticeable everywhere two generations had come into the world informed as soon as they reached a reasonable age that some day there would undoubtedly be war nobody wanted it the adversary imposed it but all were accepting it with the firm intention of fulfilling their duty during the daytime paris was very quiet concentrating the mind on the work at hand only a few groups of exalted patriots following the tricolored flag were passing through the place de la concorde in order to salute the statue of strasbourg the people were accosting each other in a friendly way in the streets everybody seemed to know everybody else although they might not have met before eye attracted eye and smiles appeared to broaden mutually with the sympathy of a common interest the women were sad but speaking cheerily in order to hide their emotions in the long summer twilight the boulevards were filling with crowds those from the outlying districts were converging toward the centre of the city as in the remote revolutionary days banding together in groups forming an endless multitude from which came shouts and songs these manifestations were passing through the centre under the electric lights that were just being turned on the processions generally lasting until midnight with the national banner floating above the walking crowds escorted by the flags of other nations it was on one of these nights of sincere enthusiasm that the two friends heard an unexpected astonishing piece of news they have killed jaurès the groups were repeating it from one to another with an amazement which seemed to overpower their grief jaurès assassinated and what for the best popular element which instinctively seeks an explanation of every proceeding remained in suspense not knowing which way to turn the tribune dead at the very moment that his word as welder of the people was most needed argensola thought immediately of tchernoff 
what will our neighbors say the quiet orderly people of paris were fearing a revolution and for a few moments desnoyers believed that his cousin's auguries were about to be fulfilled this assassination with its retaliations might be the signal for civil war but the masses of the people worn out with grief at the death of their hero were waiting in tragic silence all were seeing beyond his dead body the image of the country by the following morning the danger had vanished the laboring classes were talking of generals and war showing each other their little military memorandums announcing the date of their departure as soon as the order of mobilization should be published i go the second day i the first those of the standing army who were on leave were recalled individually to the barracks all these events were tending in the same direction war the germans were invading luxembourg the germans were ordering their armies to invade the french frontier when their ambassador was still in paris making promises of peace on the day after the death of jaurès the first of august the people were crowding around some pieces of paper written by hand and in evident haste these papers were copies of other larger printed sheets headed by two crossed flags it has come it is now a fact it was the order for general mobilization all france was about to take up arms and chests seemed to expand with a sigh of relief eyes were sparkling with excitement the nightmare was at last over cruel reality was preferable to the uncertainty of days and days each as long as a week in vain president poincare animated by a last hope was explaining to the french that mobilization is not necessarily war that a call to arms may be simply a preventive measure it is war inevitable war said the populace with a fatalistic expression and those who were going to start that very night or the following day were the most eager and enthusiastic now those who seek us are going to find us vive la france the chant du départ the martial hymn of the volunteers of the first republic had been exhumed by the instinct of a people which seek the voice of art in its most critical moments the stanzas of the conservative chenier adapted to a music of warlike solemnity were resounding through the streets at the same time as the marseillaise la république nous appelle sachons vaincre ou sachons périr un français doit vivre pour elle pour elle un français doit mourir the mobilization began at midnight to the minute at dusk groups of men began moving through the streets towards the stations their families were walking beside them carrying the valise or bundle of clothes they were escorted by the friends of their district the tricolored flag borne aloft at the head of these platoons the reserves were donning their old uniforms which presented all the difficulties of suits long ago forgotten with new leather belts and their revolvers at their sides they were betaking themselves to the railway which was to carry them to the point of concentration one of their children was carrying an old sword in its cloth sheath the wife was hanging on his arm sad and proud at the same time giving her last counsels in a loving whisper street cars automobiles and cabs rolled by with crazy velocity nobody had ever seen so many vehicles in the paris streets yet if anybody needed one he called in vain to the conductors for none wished to serve mere civilians all means of transportation were for military men all roads ended at the railroad stations the heavy trucks of the administration filled with sacks were saluted with general enthusiasm hurrah for the army the soldiers in mechanics garb on top of the swaying pyramid replied to the cheers waving their arms and uttering shouts that nobody pretended to understand fraternity had created a tolerance hitherto unknown 
the crowds were pressing forward but in their encounters invariably preserved good order vehicles were running into each other and when the conductors resorted to the customary threats the crowds would intervene and make them shake hands three cheers for france the pedestrians escaping between the wheels of the automobiles were laughing and good-naturedly reproaching the chauffeur with would you kill a frenchman on his way to his regiment and the conductor would reply i too am going in a few hours this is my last trip as night approached cars and cabs were running with increasing irregularity many of the employees having abandoned their posts to take leave of their families and make the train all the life of paris was concentrating itself in a half dozen human rivers emptying in the stations desnoyers and argensola met in a boulevard cafe toward midnight both were exhausted by the day's emotions and under that nervous depression which follows noisy and violent spectacles they needed to rest war was a fact and now that it was a certainty they felt no anxiety to get further news remaining in the cafe proved impossible in the hot and smoky atmosphere the occupants were singing and shouting and waving tiny flags all the battle hymns of the past and present were here intoned in chorus to an accompaniment of glasses and plates the rather cosmopolitan clientele was reviewing the european nations all absolutely all were going to enroll themselves on the side of france hurrah hurrah an old man and his wife were seated at a table near the two friends they were tenants of an orderly humdrum walk in life who perhaps in all their existence had never been awake at such an hour in the general enthusiasm they had come to the boulevards in order to see war a little closer the foreign tongue used by his neighbors gave the husband a lofty idea of their importance do you believe that england is going to join us argensola knew as much about it as he but he replied authoritatively of course she will that's a sure thing the old man rose to his feet hurrah for england and he began chanting a forgotten patriotic song marking time with his arms in a spirited way to the great admiration of his old wife and urging all to join in the chorus that very few were able to follow the two friends had to take themselves home on foot they could not find a vehicle that would stop for them all were hurrying in the opposite direction toward the stations they were both in a bad humor but argensola couldn't keep his to himself ah these women desnoyers knew all about his relations so far honorable with a midinette from the rue des Boues. sunday strolls in the suburbs of paris various trips to the moving picture shows comments upon the fine points of the latest novel published in the sheets of a popular paper kisses of farewell when she took the night train from bois colombe in order to sleep at home that was all but argensola was wickedly counting on father time to mellow the sharpest virtues that evening they had taken some refreshment with a french friend who was going the next morning to join his regiment the girl had sometimes seen him with argensola without noticing him particularly but now she suddenly began admiring him as though he were another person she had given up the idea of returning home that night she wanted to see how a war begins the three had dined together and all her interest had centered upon the one who was going away she even took offence with sudden modesty when argensola tried as he had often done before to squeeze her hand under the table meanwhile she was almost leaning her head on the shoulder of the future hero enveloping him with admiring gaze and they have gone they have gone away together said the spaniard bitterly i had to leave them in order not to make my hard luck any worse to have worked so long for another he was silent for a few minutes then changing the trend of his ideas he added i recognize nevertheless that her behavior is beautiful the generosity of these women when they believe that the moment for sacrifice has come 
she is terribly afraid of her father and yet she stays away from home all night with a person whom she hardly knows and whom she was not even thinking of in the middle of the afternoon the entire nation feels gratitude toward those who are going to imperil their lives and she poor child wishing to do something too for those destined for death to give them a little pleasure in their last hour is giving the best she has that which she can never recover i have sketched her role poorly perhaps well, laugh at me if you want to but admit that it is beautiful desnoyers laughed heartily at his friend's discomfiture in spite of the fact that he too was suffering a good deal of secret annoyance he had seen marguerite but once since the day of his return the only news of her that he had received was by letter this cursed war what an upset for happy people marguerite's mother was ill she was brooding over the departure of her son an officer on the first day of the mobilization marguerite too was uneasy about her brother and did not think it expedient to come to the studio while her mother was grieving at home when was this situation ever to end end of section twenty two recording by tony oliva albuquerque new mexico section twenty three part one chapter five continued of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez this librivox recording is in the public domain that check for four hundred thousand francs which he had brought from america was also worrying him the day before the bank had declined to pay it for lack of the customary official advice afterward they said that they had received the advice but did not give him the money that very afternoon when the trust companies had closed their doors the government had already declared a moratorium in order to prevent a general bankruptcy due to the general panic when would they pay him perhaps when the war which had not yet begun was ended perhaps never he had no other money available except the two thousand francs left over from his travelling expenses all of his friends were in the same distressing situation unable to draw on the sums which they had in the banks those who had any money were obliged to go from shop to shop or form in line at the bank doors in order to get a bill changed oh this war this stupid war in the champs elysees they saw a man with a broad-brimmed hat who was walking slowly ahead of them and talking to himself argensola recognized him as he passed near the street lamp friend tchernoff upon returning their greeting the russian betrayed a slight odor of wine uninvited he had adjusted his steps to theirs accompanying them toward the arc de triomphe julio had merely exchanged silent nods with argensola's new acquaintance when encountering him in the vestibule but sadness softens the heart and makes us seek the friendship of the humble as a refreshing shelter tchernoff on the contrary looked at desnoyers as though he had known him all his life the man had interrupted his monologue heard only by the black masses of vegetation the blue shadows perforated by the reddish tremors of the street lights the summer night with its cupola of warm breezes and twinkling stars he took a few steps without saying anything as a mark of consideration to his companions and then renewed his arguments taking them up where he had broken off without offering any explanation as though he were still talking to himself and at this very minute they are shouting with enthusiasm the same as they are doing here honestly believing that they are going to defend their outraged country wishing to die for their families and firesides that nobody has threatened who are they tchernoff asked argensola the russian stared at him as though surprised at such a question they he said laconically the two understood they it could not be any one else i have lived ten years in germany he continued connecting up his words now that he had found himself listened to i was daily correspondent for a paper in berlin and i know these people passing along these thronged boulevards i have been seen in my imagination 
imagination what must be happening there at this hour they too are singing and shouting with enthusiasm as they wave their flags on the outside they seem just alike but oh what a difference within last night the people beset a few babblers in the boulevard who were yelling to berlin a slogan of bad memories and worse taste france does not wish conquests her only desire is to be respected to live in peace without humiliations or disturbances to-night two of the mobilized men said on leaving when we enter germany we are going to make it a republic a republic is not a perfect thing but it is better than living under an irresponsible monarchy by the grace of god it at least presupposes tranquillity and absence of the personal ambitions that disturb life i was impressed by the generous thought of these laboring men who instead of wishing to exterminate their enemies were planning to give them something better tchernoff remained silent a few minutes smiling ironically at the picture which his imagination was calling forth in berlin the masses are expressing their enthusiasm in the lofty phraseology befitting a superior people those in the lowest classes accustomed to console themselves for humiliations with a gross materialism are now crying nach paris we are going to drink champagne gratis the pietistic burgher ready to do anything to attain a new honor and the aristocracy which has given the world the greatest scandals of recent years are also shouting nach paris to them paris is the babylon of deadly sin the city of the moulin rouge and the restaurants of montmartre the only places that they know and my comrades of the social democracy they are also cheering but to another tune to-morrow to st petersburg russian ascendancy the menace of civilization must be obliterated the kaiser waving the tyranny of another country as a scarecrow to his people what a joke and the loud laugh of the russians sounded through the night like the noise of wooden clappers we are more civilized than the germans he said regaining his self-control desnoyers who had been listening with great interest now gave a start of surprise saying to himself this chernoff has been drinking civilization continued the socialist does not consist merely in great industry in many ships armies and numerous universities that only teach science that is material civilization there is another a superior one that elevates the soul and does not permit human dignity to suffer without protesting against continual humiliations a swiss living in his wooden chalet and considering himself the equal of the other men of his country is more civilized than the herr professor who gives precedence to a lieutenant or to a hamburg millionaire who in turn bends his neck like a lackey before those whose names are prefixed by a phone. here the spaniard assented as though he could guess what tchernoff was going to say we russians endure great tyranny i know something about that i know the hunger and cold of siberia but opposed to our tyranny has always existed a revolutionary protest part of the nation is half barbarian but the rest has a superior mentality a lofty moral spirit which faces danger and sacrifice because of liberty and truth and germany who there has ever raised a protest in order to defend human rights what revolutions have ever broken out of prussia the land of the great despots frederick william the founder of militarism when he was tired of beating his wife and spitting in his children's plates used to sally forth thong in hand in order to cowhide those subjects who did not get out of his way in time his son frederick the great declared that he died bored to death with governing a nation of slaves in two centuries of prussian history one single revolution the barricades of eighteen forty eight a bad berlinish copy of the paris revolution and without any results bismarck corrected with a heavy hand so as to crush completely the last attempts at protest if such ever really existed and when his friends were threatening him with revolution the ferocious junker merely put his hands on his hips and roared with the most insolent of horse laughs a revolution in prussia nothing at all as he knew his people end of section twenty three recording by tony oliva albuquerque new mexico
section twenty four part one chapter five continued of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasquibanes this librivox recording is in the public domain chernoff was not a patriot many a time argensola had heard him railing against his country but now he was indignant in view of the contempt with which teutonic haughtiness was treating the russian nation where in the last forty years of imperial grandeur was that universal supremacy of which the germans were everlastingly boasting excellent workers in science tenacious and short-sighted academicians each wrapped in his specialty benedictines of the laboratory who experimented painstakingly and occasionally hit upon something in spite of enormous blunders given out as truths because they were their own that was all and side by side with such patient laboriosity really worthy of respect what charlatanism what great names exploited as a shop sample how many sages turned into proprietors of sanatoriums a herr professor discovers the cure of tuberculosis and the tubercular keep on dying as before another labels with a number the invincible remedy for the most unconfessable of diseases and the genital scourge continues afflicting the world and all these errors were representing great fortunes each saving panacea bringing into existence an industrial corporation selling its products at high prices as though suffering were a privilege of the rich how different from the bluff pasteur and other clever men of the inferior races who have given their discoveries to the world without stooping to form monopolies german science continued tchernoff has given much to humanity i admit that but the science of other nations has done as much only a nation puffed up with conceit could imagine that it has done everything for civilization and the others nothing apart from their learned specialists what genius has been produced in our day by this germany which believes itself so transcendent wagner the last of the romanticists closes an epoch and belongs to the past nietzsche took pains to proclaim his polish origin and abominated germany a country according to him of middle-class pedants his slavism was so pronounced that he even prophesied the overthrow of the prussians by the slavs and there are others we although a savage people have given the world of modern times an admirable moral grandeur tolstoy and dochesky are world geniuses what names can the germany of william the second put ahead of these his country was the country of music but the russian musicians of to-day are more original than the mere followers of wagner the copyists who take refuge in orchestral exasperations in order to hide their mediocrity in its time of stress the german nation had men of genius before pan-germanism had been born when the empire did not exist goethe schiller beethoven were subjects of little principalities they received influence from other countries and contributed their share to the universal civilization like citizens of the world without insisting that the world should therefore become germanized czarism had committed atrocities tchernoff knew that by experience and did not need the germans to assure him of it but all the illustrious classes of russia were enemies of that tyranny and were protesting against it where in germany were the intellectual enemies of prussian czarism they were either holding their peace or breaking forth into adulation of the anointed of the lord a musician and comedian like nero of a sharp and superficial intelligence who believed that by merely skimming through anything he knew it all eager to strike a spectacular pose in history he had finally afflicted the world with the greatest of calamities why must the tyranny that weighs upon my country necessarily be russian the worst czars were imitators of prussia every time that the russian people of our day have attempted to revindicate their rights the reactionaries have used the kaiser as a threat proclaiming that he would come to their aid one half of the russian aristocracy is german 
german the functionaries who advise and support despotism are germans german too are the generals who have distinguished themselves by massacring the people german are the officials who undertake to punish the laborers strikes and the rebellion of their allies the reactionary slav is brutal but he has the fine sensibility of a race in which many princes have become nihilists he raises the lash with facility but then he repents and oftentimes weeps i have seen russian officials kill themselves rather than march against the people or through remorse for slaughter committed the german in the service of the czar feels no scruples nor laments his conduct he kills coldly with the minuteness and exactitude with which he does everything the russian is a barbarian who strikes and regrets german civilization shoots without hesitation our slav czar in a humanitarian dream favored the utopian idea of universal peace organizing the conference of the hag the kaiser of culture meanwhile has been working years and years in the erection and establishment of a destructive organ of an immensity heretofore unknown in order to crush all europe the russian is a humble christian socialistic democratic thirsting for justice the german prides himself upon his christianity but is an idolater like the german of other centuries his religion loves blood and maintains castes his true worship is that of odin only that nowadays the god of slaughter has changed his name and calls himself the state tchernoff paused an instant uh, perhaps in order to increase the wonder of his companions and then said with simplicity i am a christian argensola who already knew the ideas and history of the russian started with astonishment and julio persisted in his suspicion surely tchernoff is drunk it is true declared the russian earnestly that i do not worry about god nor do i believe in dogmas but my soul is christian as is that of all revolutionists the philosophy of modern democracy is lay christianity we socialists love the humble the needy the weak we defend their right to life and well-being as did the greatest lights of the religious world who saw a brother in every unfortunate we exact respect for the poor in the name of justice and others ask for it in the name of charity that only separates us but we strive that mankind may by common consent lead a better life that the strong may sacrifice for the weak the lofty for the lowly and the world be ruled by brotherliness seeking the greatest equality possible the slav reviewed the history of human aspirations greek thought had brought comfort a sense of well-being on the earth but only for the few for the citizens of the little democracies for the free men leaving the slaves and barbarians who constituted the majority in their misery christianity the religion of the lowly had recognized the right of happiness for all mankind but this happiness was placed in heaven far from this world this veil of tears the revolution and its heirs the socialists were trying to place happiness in the immediate realities of earth like the ancients but making all humanity participants in it like the christians where is the christianity of modern germany there is far more genuine christian spirit in the fraternal laity of the french republic defender of the weak than in the religiosity of the conservative junkers germany has made a god in her own image believing that she adores it but in reality adoring her own image the german god is a reflex of the german state which considers war as the first activity of a nation and the noblest of occupations other christian peoples when they have to go to war feel the contradiction that exists between their conduct and the teachings of the gospel and excuse themselves by showing the cruel necessity which impels them germany declares that war is acceptable to god i have heard german sermons proving that jesus was in favor of militarism teutonic pride and the conviction that its race is providentially destined to dominate the world brings into working unity their protestants catholics and jews 
far above their differences of dogma is that god of the state which is german the warrior god to whom william is probably referring as my worthy ally religions always tend toward universality their aim is to place humanity in relationship with god and to sustain these relations among mankind prussia has retrograded to barbarism creating for its personal use a second jehovah a divinity hostile to the greater part of the human race who makes his own the grudges and ambitions of the german people chernoff then explained in his own way the creation of this teutonic god ambitious cruel and vengeful the germans were comparatively recent christians their christianity was not more than six centuries old when the crusades were drawing to a close the prussians were still living in paganism pride of race impelling them to war had revived these dead divinities the god of the gospel was now adorned by the germans with lance and shield like the old teutonic god who was a military chief christianity in berlin wears helmet and riding boots god at this moment is seeing himself mobilized the same as otto fritz and franz in order to punish the enemies of his chosen people that the lord has commanded thou shalt not kill and his son has said to the world blessed are the peacemakers no longer matters christianity according to its german priests of all creeds can only influence the individual betterment of man mankind and should not mix itself in affairs of state the prussian god of the state is the old german god the lineal descendant of the ferocious germanic mythology a mixture of divinities hungry for war in the silence of the avenue the russian evoked the ruddy figures of the implacable gods that were going to awake that night upon hearing the hum of arms and smelling the acrid odor of blood thor the brutal god with the little head was stretching his biceps and clutching the hammer that crushed cities wotan was sharpening his lance which had the lightning for its handle the thunder for its blade odin the one-eyed was gaping with gluttony on the mountain tops awaiting the dead warriors that would crowd around his throne the dishevelled valkyries fat and perspiring were beginning to gallop from cloud to cloud hallooing to humanity that they might carry off the corpses doubled like saddlebags over the haunches of their flying nags german religiosity continued the russian is the disavowal of christianity in its eyes men are no longer equal before god their god is interested only in the strong and favors them with his support so that they may dare anything those born weak must either submit or disappear neither are nations equal but are divided into leaders and inferior races whose destiny is to be sifted out and absorbed by their superiors since god has thus ordained it is unnecessary to state that the grand world leader is germany argensola here interrupted to observe that german pride believed itself championed not only by god but by science too i know that interposed the russian without letting him finish generalization inequality selection the struggle for life and all that the germans so conceited about their special worth erect upon distant ground their intellectual monuments borrowing of the foreigner their foundation material whenever they undertake a new line of work a frenchman and an englishman gobineau and chamberlain have given them the arguments with which to defend the superiority of their race with the rubbish left over from darwin and spencer their old haeckel has built up his doctrine of monism which applied to politics scientifically consecrates prussian pride and recognizes its right to rule the world by force no a thousand times no he exclaimed after a brief silence the struggle for existence with its procession of cruelties may be true among the lower species but it should not be true among human creatures we are rational beings and ought to free ourselves from the fatality of environment moulding it to our convenience 
the animal does not know law justice or compassion he lives enslaved in the obscurity of his instincts we think and thought signifies liberty force does not necessarily have to be cruel it is strongest when it does not take advantage of its power and is kindly all have a right to the life into which they are born and since among individuals there exist the haughty and the humble the mighty and the weak so should exist nations large and small old and young the end of our existence is not combat nor killing in order that others may afterwards kill us and perhaps be killed themselves civilized people ought unanimously to adopt the idea of southern europe striving for the most peaceful and sweetest form of life possible a cruel smile played over the russian's beard but there exists that culture diametrically opposed to civilization which the germans wish to palm off upon us civilization is a refinement of spirit respect of one's neighbor tolerance of foreign opinion courtesy of manner culture is the action of a state that organizes and assimilates individuals and communities in order to utilize them for its own ends and these ends consist mainly in placing the state above other states overwhelming them with their grandeur or what is the same thing with their haughty and violent pride end of section twenty four recording by tony oliva albuquerque new mexico section twenty five part one chapter five continued of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez this librivox recording is in the public domain by this time the three had reached the place de l'etoile the dark outline of the arc de triomphe stood forth clearly in the starry expanse the avenues extended in all directions a double file of lights those around the monument illuminated its gigantic bases and the feet of the sculptured groups further up the vaulted spaces were so locked in shadow that they had the black density of ebony upon passing under the arch which greatly intensified the echo of their footsteps they came to a standstill the night breeze had a wintry chill as it whistled past and the curved masses seemed melting into the diffused blue of space instinctively the three turned to glance back at the champs elysees they saw only a river of shadow on which were floating rosaries of red stars among the two long black scarfs formed by the buildings but they were so well acquainted with this panorama that in imagination they mentally saw the majestic sweep of the avenue the double row of palaces the place de la concorde in the background with the egyptian obelisk and the trees of the tuileries how beautiful it is exclaimed tchernoff who was seeing something beyond the shadows an entire civilization loving peace and pleasure has passed through here a memory greatly affected the russian many an afternoon after lunch he had met in this very spot a robust man stocky with reddish beard and kindly eyes a man who looked like a giant who had just stopped growing he was always accompanied by a dog it was jaurès his friend jaurès who before going to the senate was accustomed to taking a walk toward the arch from his home in passy he liked to come just where we are now he loved to look at the avenues the distant gardens all of paris which can be seen from this height and filled with admiration he would often say to me this is magnificent one of the most beautiful perspectives that can be found in the entire world poor jaurès through association of ideas the russian evoked the image of his compatriot mikhail bakunin another revolutionist the father of anarchy 
weeping with emotion at a concert after hearing the symphony with beethoven chorales directed by a young friend of his named richard wagner when our revolution comes he cried clasping the hand of the master whatever else may perish this must be saved at any cost tchernoff roused himself from his reveries to look around him and say with sadness they have passed through here every time that he walked through the arch the same vision would spring up in his mind they were thousands of helmets glistening in the sun thousands of heavy boots lifted with mechanical rigidity at the same time horns fifes drums large and small clashing against the majestic silence of these stones the warlike march from lohengrin sounding in the deserted avenues before the closed houses he who was a foreigner always felt attracted by the spell exerted by venerable buildings guarding the glory of a bygone day he did not wish to know who had erected it as soon as its pride is flattered mankind tries immediately to solidify it then humanity intervenes with a broader vision that changes the original significance of the work enlarges it and strips it of its first egotistical import the greek statues models of the highest beauty had been originally mere images of the temple donated by the piety of the devotees of those times upon evoking roman grandeur everybody sees in imagination the enormous colosseum circle of butcheries or the arches erected to the glory of the inept caesars the representative works of nations have two significations the interior or immediate one which their creators gave them and the exterior or universal interest the symbolic value which the centuries have given them this arch continued tchernoff is french within with its names of battles and generals open to criticism on the outside it is the monument of the people who carried through the greatest revolution for liberty ever known the glorification of man is there below in the column of the place vendome here there is nothing individual its builders erected it to the memory of la grande armée and that grand army was the people in arms who spread revolution throughout europe the artists great inventors foresaw the true significance of this work the warriors of rude who are chanting the marseillaise in the group at the left are not professional soldiers they are armed citizens marching to work out their sublime and violent mission their nudity makes them appear to me like sans culottes in grecian helmets here there is more than the glory and egoism of a great nation all europe is awake to new life thanks to these crusaders of liberty the nations call to mind certain images if i think of greece i see the columns of the parthenon rome mistress of the world is the Colosseum and the arch of trajan and revolutionary france is the arc de triomphe the arch was even more according to the russian it represented a great historical retaliation the nations of the south called the latin races replying after many centuries to the invasion which had destroyed the roman jurisdiction the mediterranean peoples spreading themselves as conquerors through the lands of the ancient barbarians retreating immediately they had swept away the past like a tidal wave the great surf depositing all that it contained like the waters of certain rivers which fructify by overflowing this recession of the human tide had left the soil enriched with new and generous ideas if they should return added tchernoff with a look of uneasiness if they again should tread these stones before they were simple-minded folk stunned by their rapid good fortune who passed through here like a farmer through a salon they were content with money for the pocket and two provinces which should perpetuate the memory of their victory but now they will not be the soldiers only who march against paris at the tail of the armies come the maddened canteen keepers the herr professors 
carrying at the side the little keg of wine with the powder which crazes the barbarian the wine of culture and in the vans come also an enormous load of scientific savagery a new philosophy which glorifies force as a principle and sanctifier of everything denies liberty suppresses the weak and places the entire world under the charge of a minority chosen by god just because it possesses the surest and most rapid methods of slaughter humanity may well tremble for the future if again resounds under this archway the tramp of boots following a march of wagner or any other kapellmeister they left the arch following the avenue victor hugo tchernoff walking along in dogged silence as though the vision of this imaginary procession had overwhelmed him suddenly he continued aloud the course of his reflections and if they should enter what does it matter on that account the cause of right will not die it suffers eclipses but it is born again it may be ignored and trampled under foot but it does not therefore cease to exist and all good souls recognize it as the only rule of life a nation of madmen wishes to place might upon the pedestal that others have raised to right useless endeavor the eternal hope of mankind will ever be the increasing power of more liberty more brotherliness more justice the russian appeared to calm himself with this statement he and his friends spoke of the spectacle which paris was presenting in its preparation for war tchernoff bemoaned the great suffering produced by the catastrophe the thousands and thousands of domestic tragedies that were unrolling at that moment apparently nothing had changed in the centre of the city and around the stations there was unusual agitation but the rest of the immense city did not appear affected by the great overthrow of its existence the solitary street was presenting its usual aspect the breeze was gently moving the leaves a solemn peace seemed to be spreading itself through space the houses appeared wrapped in slumber but behind the closed windows might be surmised the insomnia of the reddened eyes the sighs from hearts anguished by the threatened danger the tremulous agility of the hands preparing the war outfit perhaps the last loving greetings exchanged without pleasure with kisses ending in sobs tchernoff thought of his neighbors the husband and wife who occupied the other interior apartment behind the studio she was no longer playing the piano the russian had overheard disputes the banging of doors locked with violence and the footsteps of a man in the middle of the night fleeing from a woman's cries there had begun to develop on the other side of the wall a regulation drama a repetition of hundreds of others all taking place at the same time she is a german volunteered the russian our concierge has ferreted out her nationality he must have gone by this time to join his regiment last night i could hardly sleep i heard the lamentations through the thin wall partition the steady desperate weeping of an abandoned child and the voice of a man who was vainly trying to quiet her ah oh, what a rain of sorrows is now falling upon the world that same evening on leaving the house he had met her by her door she appeared like another woman with an old look as though in these agonizing hours she had been suffering for fifteen years in vain the kindly tchernoff had tried to cheer her up urging her to accept quietly her husband's absence so as not to harm the little one who was coming for the unhappy creature is going to be a mother he said sadly she hides her condition with a certain modesty but from my window i have often seen her making the dainty layette the woman had listened to him as though she did not understand words were useless before her desperation she could only sob as though talking to herself i am a german he is gone he has to go away alone alone forever she is thinking all the time of her nationality which is separating her from her husband she is thinking of the concentration camp to which they will take her with her compatriots she is fearful of being abandoned in the enemy's country obliged to defend itself against the attack of her own country and all this 
when she is about to become a mother what miseries what agonies the three reached the rue de la pompe and on entering the house tchernoff began to take leave of his companions in order to climb the service stairs but desnoyers wished to prolong the conversation he dreaded being alone with his friend still chagrined over the evening's events the conversation with the russian interested him so they all went up in the elevator together argensola suggested that this would be a good opportunity to uncork one of the many bottles which he was keeping in the kitchen tchernoff could go home through the studio door that opened on the stairway end of section twenty five recording by tony oliva albuquerque new mexico section twenty six part one chapter five continued of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez this librivox recording is in the public domain the great window had its glass doors wide open the transoms on the patio side were also open a breeze kept the curtains swaying moving too the old lanterns moth-eaten flags and other adornments of the romantic studio they seated themselves around the table near a window some distance from the light which was illuminating the other end of the big room they were in the shadow with their backs to the interior court opposite them were tiled roofs and an enormous rectangle of blue shadow perforated by the sharp pointed stars the city lights were coloring the shadowy space with a bloody reflection tchernoff drank two glasses testifying to the excellence of the liquid by smacking his lips the three were silent with the wondering and thoughtful silence which the grandeur of the night imposes their eyes were glancing from star to star grouping them in fanciful lines forming them into triangles or squares of varying irregularity at times the twinkling radiance of a heavenly body appeared to broaden the rays of light almost hypnotizing them the russian without coming out of his reverie availed himself of another glass then he smiled with cruel irony his bearded face taking on the semblance of a tragic mask peeping between the curtains of the night i wonder what those men up there are thinking he muttered i wonder if any star knows that bismarck ever existed i wonder if the planets are aware of the divine mission of the german nation and he continued laughing some far away and uncertain noise disturbed the stillness of the night slipping through some of the chinks that cut the immense plain of roofs the three turned their heads so as to hear better the sound of voices cut through the thick silence of night a masculine chorus chanting a hymn simple monotonous and solemn they guessed at what it must be although they could not hear very well various single notes floating with greater intensity on the night wind enabled argensola to piece together the short song ending in a melodious triumphant yell a true war song c'est l'alsace la lorraine c'est l'alsace qu'il nous faut oh 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 a new band of men was going away through the streets below toward the railroad station the gateway of the war they must be from the outlying districts perhaps from the country and passing through silence wrapped paris they felt like singing of the great national hope that those who were watching behind the dark facades might feel comforted knowing that they were not alone just as it is in the opera said julio listening to the last notes of the invisible chorus dying away into the night tchernoff continued drinking but with a distracted air his eyes fixed on the red cloud that floated above the roofs the two friends conjectured his mental labor from his concentrated look and the low exclamations which were escaping him like the echoes of an interior monologue suddenly 
he leaped from thought to word without any forewarning continuing aloud the course of his reasoning and when the sun arises in a few hours the world will see coursing through its fields the four horsemen enemies of mankind already their wild steeds are pawing the ground with impatience already the ill-omened riders have come together and are exchanging the last words before leaping into the saddle what horsemen are these asked argensola those which go before the beast the two friends thought this reply as unintelligible as the preceding words desnoyers again said mentally he is drunk but his curiosity forced him to ask what beast is that that of the apocalypse there was a brief silence but the russian's terseness of speech did not last long he felt the necessity of expressing his enthusiasm for the dreamer on the island rock of patmos the poet of great and mystic vision was exerting across two thousand years his influence over this mysterious revolutionary tucked away on the top floor of a house in paris john had foreseen it all his visions unintelligible to the masses nevertheless held within them the mystery of great human events chernoff described the apocalyptic beast rising from the depths of the sea he was like a leopard his feet like those of a bear his mouth like the snout of a lion he had seven heads and ten horns and upon the horns were ten crowns and upon each of his heads the name of a blasphemy the evangelist did not say just what these blasphemies were perhaps they differed according to the epochs modified every thousand years when the beast made a new apparition the russian seemed to be reading those that were flaming on the heads of the monster blasphemies against humanity against justice against all that makes life sweet and bearable might is superior to right the weak should not exist be harsh in order to be great and the beast in all its hideousness was attempting to govern the world and make mankind render him homage but the four horsemen persisted desnoyers the four horsemen were preceding the appearance of the monster in john's vision the seven seals of the book of mystery were broken by the lamb in the presence of the great throne where was seated one who shone like jasper the rainbow round about the throne was in sight like unto an emerald twenty-four thrones were in a semicircle around the great throne and upon them twenty-four elders with white robes and crowns of gold four enormous animals covered with eyes and each having six wings seemed to be guarding the throne the sounding of trumpets was greeting the breaking of the first seal come and see cried one of the beasts in a stentorian tone to the vision-seeing poet and the first horseman appeared on a white horse in his hand he carried a bow and a crown was given unto him he was conquest according to some the plague according to others he might be both things at the same time he wore a crown and that was enough for chernoff come forth shouted the second animal removing his thousand eyes and from the broken seal leaped a flame-colored steed his rider brandished over his head an enormous sword he was war peace fled from the world before his furious gallop humanity was going to be exterminated and when the third seal was broken another of the winged animals bellowed like a thunderclap come and see and john saw a black horse he who mounted it held in his hand a scale in order to weigh the maintenance of mankind he was famine the fourth animal saluted the breaking of the fourth seal with a great roaring come and see and there appeared a pale colored horse his rider was called death and power was given him to destroy with the sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth the four horsemen were beginning their mad 
desolating course over the heads of terrified humanity tchernoff was describing the four scourges of the earth exactly as though he were seeing them the horseman on the white horse was clad in a showy and barbarous attire his oriental countenance was contracted with hatred as if smelling out his victims while his horse continued galloping he was bending his bow in order to spread pestilence abroad at his back swung the brass quiver filled with poisoned arrows containing the germs of all diseases those of private life as well as those which envenom the wounded soldier on the battlefield the second horseman on the red steed was waving the enormous two-edged sword over his hair bristling with the swiftness of his course he was young but the fierce scowl and the scornful mouth gave him a look of implacable ferocity his garments blown open by the motion of his wild race disclosed the form of a muscular athlete bald old and horribly skinny was the third horseman bouncing up and down on the raw boned back of his black steed his shrunken legs clanked against the thin flanks of the lean beast in one withered hand he was holding the scales symbol of the scarcity of food that was going to become as valuable as gold the knees of the fourth horseman sharp as spurs were pricking the ribs of the pale horse his parchment-like skin betrayed the lines and hollows of his skeleton the front of his skull-like face was twisted with the sardonic laugh of destruction his cane-like arms were whirling aloft a gigantic sickle from his angular shoulders was hanging a ragged filthy shroud and the furious cavalcade was passing like a hurricane over the immense assemblage of human beings the heavens showed above their heads a livid dark-edged cloud from the west horrible monsters and deformities were swarming in spirals above the furious horde like a repulsive escort poor humanity crazed with fear was fleeing in all directions on hearing the thundering pace of the plague war hunger and death men and women young and old were knocking each other down and falling to the ground overwhelmed by terror astonishment and desperation and the white horse the red the black and the pale were crushing all with their relentless iron tread the athletic man was hearing the crashing of his broken ribs the nursing babe was writhing at its mother's breast and the aged and feeble were closing their eyes forever with a childlike sob god is asleep forgetting the world continued the russian it will be a long time before he awakes and while he sleeps the four feudal horsemen of the beast will course through the land as its only lords tchernoff was overpowered by the intensity of his dramatic vision springing from his seat he paced up and down with great strides but his picture of the fourfold catastrophe revealed by the gloomy poet's trance seemed to him very weak indeed a great painter had given corporeal form to these terrible dreams i have a book he murmured a rare book and suddenly he left the studio and went to his own quarters he wanted to bring the book to show to his friends argensola accompanied him and they returned in a few minutes with the volume leaving the doors open behind them so as to make a stronger current of air among the hollows of the facades of the interior patio tchernoff placed his precious book under the light it was a volume printed in fifteen eleven with latin text and engravings desnoyers read the title the apocalypse illustrated the engravings were by albert duret a youthful effort when the master was only twenty-seven years old the three were fascinated by the picture portraying the wild career of the apocalyptic horseman the quadruple scourge on fantastic mounts seemed to be precipitating itself with a realistic sweep crushing panic-stricken humanity 
suddenly something happened which startled the three men from their contemplative admiration something unusual indefinable a dreadful sound which seemed to enter directly into their brains without passing through their ears a clutch at the heart instinctively they knew that something very grave had just happened they stared at each other silently for a few interminable seconds through the open door a cry of alarm came from the patio with a common impulse the three ran to the interior window but before reaching them the russian had a presentiment my neighbor it must be my neighbor perhaps she has killed herself looking down they could see lights below people moving around a form stretched out on the tiled floor the alarm had instantly filled all the court windows for it was a sleepless night a night of nervous apprehension when every one was keeping a sad vigil she has killed herself said a voice which seemed to come up from a well the german woman has committed suicide the explanation of the concierge leaped from window to window up to the top floor the russian was shaking his head with a fatalistic expression the unhappy woman had not taken the death leap of her own accord some one had intensified her desperation some one had pushed her the horsemen the four horsemen of the apocalypse already they were in the saddle already they were beginning their merciless gallop of destruction the blind forces of evil were about to let loose throughout the world the agony of humanity under the brutal sweep of the four horsemen was already begun End of section 26. Recording by Tony Oliva, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Section 27, Part 2, Chapter 1 of The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse by Vicente Blasco Ibáñez. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2 chapter one what don marcelo envied upon being convinced that war really was inevitable the elder desnoyers was filled with amazement humanity had gone crazy was it possible that war could happen in these days of so many railroads so many merchant marines so many inventions so much activity developed above and below the earth the nations would ruin themselves for ever they were now accustomed to luxuries and necessities unknown a century ago capital was master of the world and war was going to wipe it out in its turn war would be wiped out in a few months time through lack of funds to sustain it his soul of a business man revolted before the hundreds of thousands of millions that this foolhardy event was going to convert into smoke and slaughter as his indignation had to fix upon something close at hand he made his own countrymen responsible for this insanity too much talk about la revanche the very idea of worrying for forty-four years over the two lost provinces when the nation was mistress of enormous and undeveloped lands in other countries now they were going to pay the penalty for such exasperating and clamorous foolishness for him war meant disaster writ large he had no faith in his country france's day had passed now the victors were of the northern peoples and especially that germany which he had seen so close admiring with a certain terror its discipline and its rigorous organization the former working man felt the conservative and selfish instincts of all those who have amassed millions he scorned political ideals but through class interest he had of late years accepted the declarations against the scandals of the government what could a corrupt and disorganized republic do against the solid and strongest empire in the world we are going to our deaths he said to himself worse than seventy we are going to see horrible things 
the good order and enthusiasm with which the french responded to their country's call and transformed themselves into soldiers were most astonishing to him this moral shock made his national faith begin to revive the great majority of frenchmen were good after all the nation was as valiant as in former times forty-four years of suffering and alarm had developed their old bravery but the leaders where were they going to get leaders to march to victory many others were asking themselves the same question the silence of the democratic government was keeping the country in complete ignorance of their future commanders everybody saw the army increasing from hour to hour very few knew the generals one name was beginning to be repeated from mouth to mouth joffre joffre his first pictures made the curious crowd struggle to get a glimpse of them desnoyers studied them very carefully he looks like a very capable person his methodical instincts were gratified by the grave and confident look of the general of the republic suddenly he felt the great confidence that efficient-looking bank directors always inspired in him he could entrust his interests to this gentleman sure that he would not act impulsively finally against his will desnoyers was drawn into the whirlpool of enthusiasm and emotion like every one around him he lived minutes that were hours and hours that were years events kept on overlapping each other within a week the world seemed to have made up for its long period of peace the old man fairly lived in the street attracted by the spectacle of the multitude of civilians saluting the multitude of uniformed men departing for the seat of war at night he saw the processions passing through the boulevards the tricolored flag was fluttering its colors under the electric lights the cafes were overflowing with people sending forth from doors and windows the excited musical notes of patriotic songs suddenly amidst applause and cheers the crowd would make an opening in the street all europe was passing here all europe less the arrogant enemy and was saluting france in her hour of danger with hearty spontaneity flags of different nations were filing by of all tints of the rainbow and behind them were the russians with bright and mystical eyes the english with heads uncovered intoning songs of religious gravity the greeks and rumanians of aquiline profile the scandinavians white and red the north americans with the noisiness of a somewhat puerile enthusiasm the hebrews without a country friends of the nation of socialistic revolutions the italians as spirited as a choir of heroic tenors the spanish and south americans tireless in their huzzas they were students and apprentices who were completing their courses in the schools and workshops and refugees who like shipwrecked mariners had sought shelter on the hospitable strand of paris their cheers had no special significance but they were all moved by their desire to show their love for the republic and desnoyers touched by the sight felt that france was still of some account in the world that she yet exercised a moral force among the nations and that her joys and sorrows were still of interest to humanity in berlin and vienna too he said to himself they must also be cheering enthusiastically at this moment but germans only no others assuredly no foreigner is joining in their demonstrations the nation of the revolution legislator of the rights of mankind was harvesting the gratitude of the throngs but was beginning to feel a certain remorse before the enthusiasm of the foreigners who were offering their blood for france many were lamenting that the government should delay twenty days until after they had finished the operations of mobilization in admitting the volunteers and he a frenchman born a few hours before had been mistrusting his country in the daytime the popular current was running toward the gare de l'est 
crowded against the gratings was a surging mass of humanity stretching its tentacles through the nearby streets the station that was acquiring the importance of a historic spot appeared like a narrow tunnel through which a great human river was trying to flow with many rippling encounters and much heavy pressure against its banks a large part of france in arms was coursing through this exit from paris toward the battlefields at the frontier desnoyers had been in the station only twice when going and coming from germany others were now taking the same road the crowds were swarming in from the environs of the city in order to see the masses of human beings in geometric bodies uniformly clad disappearing within the entrance with flash of steel and the rhythm of clanking metal the crystal archways that were glistening in the sun like fiery mouths were swallowing and swallowing people when night fell the processions were still coming on by light of the electric lamps through the iron grills were passing thousands and thousands of draught horses men with their breasts crossed with metal and bunches of horsehair hanging from their helmets like paladins of bygone centuries enormous cases that were serving as cages for the aeronautic condors strings of cannon long and narrow painted gray and protected by metal screens more like astronomical instruments than mouths of death masses and masses of red kepis military caps moving in marching rhythm rows and rows of muskets some black and stark like reed plantations others ending in bayonets like shining spikes and over all these restless fields of seething throngs the flags of the regiments were fluttering in the air like colored birds a white body a blue wing or a red one a cravat of gold on the neck and above the metal tip pointing toward the clouds don marcelo would return home from these send-offs vibrating with nervous fatigue as one who had just participated in a scene of racking emotion in spite of his tenacious character which always stood out against admitting a mistake the old man began to feel ashamed of his former doubts the nation was quivering with life france was a grand nation appearances had deceived him as well as many others perhaps the most of his countrymen were of a light and flippant character given to excessive interest in the sensuous side of life but when danger came they were fulfilling their duty simply without the necessity of the harsh force to which the ironclad organizations were submitting their people End of section 27section twenty eight part two chapter one continued of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez this librivox recording is in the public domain on leaving home on the morning of the fourth day of the mobilization desnoyers instead of betaking himself to the centre of the city went in the opposite direction toward the rue de la pompe some imprudent words dropped by chichi and the uneasy looks of his wife and sister-in-law made him suspect that julio had returned from his trip he felt the necessity of seeing at least the outside of the studio windows as if they might give him news and in order to justify a trip so at variance with his policy of ignoring his son he remembered that the carpenter lived in the same street i must hunt up robert he promised a week ago that he would come here this robert was a husky fellow who to use his own words was emancipated from the boss tyranny and was working independently in his own home a tiny almost subterranean room was serving him for dwelling and workshop a woman he called my affinity was looking carefully after his hearth and home 
with a baby boy clinging to her skirts desnoyers was accustomed to humor robert's tirades against his fellow-citizens because the man had always humored his whimsies about the incessant rearrangement of his furniture in the luxurious apartment in the avenue victor hugo the carpenter would sing la internationale while using hammer and saw and his employer would overlook his audacity of speech because of the cheapness of his work upon arriving at the shop he found the man with cap over one ear broad trousers like a mameluke's hobnailed boots and various pennants and rosettes fastened to the lapels of his jacket you've come too late boss he said cheerily i am just going to close the factory the proprietor has been mobilized and in a few hours will join his regiment and he pointed to a written paper posted on the door of his dwelling like the printed cards on all establishments signifying that employer and employees had obeyed the order of mobilization it had never occurred to desnoyers that his carpenter might become a soldier since he was so opposed to all kinds of authority he hated the fleeks the paris police with whom he had more than once exchanged fisticuffs and clubbings militarism was his special aversion in the meetings against the despotism of the barracks he had always been one of the noisiest participants and was this revolutionary fellow going to war naturally and voluntarily robert spoke enthusiastically of his regiment of life among comrades with death but four steps away i believe in my ideas boss the same as before he explained as though guessing the other's thought but war is war and teaches many things among others that liberty must be accompanied with order and authority it is necessary that some one direct that the rest may follow willingly by common consent but they must follow when war actually comes one sees things very differently from when living at home doing as one pleases the night that they assassinated jaurès he howled with rage announcing that the following morning the murder would be avenged he had hunted up his associates in the district in order to inform them what retaliation was being planned against the malefactors but war was about to break out there was something in the air that was opposing civil strife that was placing private grievances in momentary abeyance concentrating all minds on the common wheel a week ago he exclaimed i was an anti-militarist how far away that seems now as if a year had gone by i keep thinking as before i love peace and hate war like all my comrades but the french have not offended anybody and yet they threaten us wishing to enslave us but we french can be fierce since they oblige us to be and in order to defend ourselves it is just that nobody should shirk that all should obey discipline does not quarrel with revolution remember the armies of the first republic all citizens generals as well as soldiers but hoche kleber and the others were rough-hewn unpolished benefactors who knew how to command and exact obedience the carpenter was well read besides the papers and pamphlets of the idea he had also read on stray sheets the views of michelet and other liberal actors on the stage of history we are going to make war on war he added we are going to fight so that this war will be the last this statement did not seem to be expressed with sufficient clearness so he recast his thought we are going to fight for the future we are going to die in order that our grandchildren may not have to endure a similar calamity if the enemy triumphs the war habit will triumph and conquest will be the only means of growth first they will overcome europe then the rest of the world later on those who have been pillaged will rise up in their wrath more wars we do not want conquests we desire to regain alsace and lorraine for their inhabitants wish to return to us and nothing more we shall not imitate the enemy appropriating territory and jeopardizing the peace of the world we had enough of that with napoleon we must not repeat that experience we are going to fight for our immediate security 
purity and at the same time for the security of the world for the life of the weaker nations if this were a war of aggression of mere vanity of conquest then we socialists would bethink ourselves of our anti-militarism but this is self-defense and the government has not been at fault since we are attacked we must be united in our defensive the carpenter who was also anti-clerical was now showing a more generous tolerance an amplitude of ideas that embraced all mankind the day before he had met at the administration office a reservist who was just leaving to join his regiment at a glance he saw that this man was a priest i am a carpenter he said to him by way of introduction and you comrade are working in the churches he employed this figure of speech in order that the priest might not suspect him of anything offensive the two had clasped hands i do not take much stock in the clerical cowl robert explained to desnoyers for some time i have not been on friendly terms with religion but in every walk of life there must be good people and the good people ought to understand each other in a crisis like this don't you think so boss the war coincided with his socialistic tendencies before this when speaking of future revolution he had felt a malign pleasure in imagining all the rich deprived of their fortunes and having to work in order to exist now he was equally enthusiastic at the thought that all frenchmen would share the same fate without class distinction all with knapsacks on their backs and eating at mess and he was even extending this military sobriety to those who remained behind the army war was going to cause great scarcity of provisions and all would have to come down to very plain fare you too boss who are too old to go to war you with all your millions will have to eat the same as i admit that it is a beautiful thing desnoyers was not offended by the malicious satisfaction that his future privations seemed to inspire in the carpenter he was very thoughtful a man of his stamp an enemy of existing conditions who had no property to defend was going to war to death perhaps because of a generous and distant ideal in order that future generations might never know the actual horrors of war to do this he was not hesitating at the sacrifice of his former cherished beliefs all that he had held sacred till now and he who belonged to the privileged class who possessed so many tempting things requiring defence had given himself up to doubt and criticism hours after he again saw the carpenter near the arc de triomphe he was one of a group of workmen looking much as he did and this group was joining others and still others that represented every social class well-dressed citizens stylish and anemic young men graduate students with worn jackets pale faces and thick glasses and youthful priests who were smiling rather shamefacedly as though they had been caught at some ridiculous escapade at the head of this human herd was a sergeant and as a rear-guard various soldiers with guns on their shoulders forward march reservists and a musical cry a solemn harmony like a greek chant menacing and monotonous surged up from this mass with open mouths swinging arms and legs that were opening and shutting like compasses robert was singing the martial chorus with such great energy that his eyes and gallic mustachios were fairly trembling in spite of his corduroy suit and his bulging linen handbag he had the same grand and heroic aspect as the figures by rude in the arc de triomphe the affinity and the boy were trudging along the sidewalk so as to accompany him to the station for a moment he took his eyes from them to speak with a companion in the line shaven and serious-looking undoubtedly the priest whom he had met the day before now they were talking confidentially intimately with that brotherliness which contact with death inspires in mankind the millionaire followed the carpenter with a look of respect immeasurably increased since he had taken his part in this human avalanche 
and this respect had in it something of envy the envy that springs from an uneasy conscience end of section twenty eight section twenty nine part two chapter one continued of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez this librivox recording is in the public domain whenever don marcelo passed a bad night suffering from nightmare a certain terrible thing always the same would torment his imagination rarely did he dream of mortal peril to his family or self the frightful vision was always that certain notes bearing his signature were presented for collection which he marcelo desnoyers the man always faithful to his bond with a past of immaculate probity was not able to pay such a possibility made him tremble and long after waking his heart would be oppressed with terror to his imagination this was the greatest disgrace that a man could suffer now that war was overturning his existence with its agitations the same agonies were reappearing completely awake with full powers of reasoning he was suffering exactly the same distress as when in his horrible dreams he saw his dishonored signature on a protested document all his past was looming up before his eyes with such extraordinary clearness that it seemed as though until then his mind must have been in hopeless confusion the threatened land of france was his native country fifteen centuries of history had been working for him in order that his opening eyes might survey progress and comforts that his ancestors did not even know many generations of desnoyers had prepared for his advent into life by struggling with the land and defending it that he might be born into a free family and fireside and when his turn had come for continuing this effort when his his time it arrived in the rosary of generations he had fled like a debtor evading payment on coming into his fatherland he had contracted obligations with the human group to whom he owed his existence this obligation should be paid with his arms with any sacrifice that would repel danger and he had eluded the acknowledgment of his signature fleeing his country and betraying his trust to his forefathers ah miserable coward the material success of his life the riches acquired in a remote country were comparatively of no importance there are failures that millions cannot blot out the uneasiness of his conscience was proving it now proof too was in the envy and respect inspired by this poor mechanic marching to meet his death with others equally humble all kindled with the satisfaction of duty fulfilled of sacrifice accepted the memory of madariaga came to his memory where we make our riches and found a family there is our country no the statement of the centaur was not correct in normal times perhaps far from one's native land when it is not exposed to danger one may forget it for a few years but he was living now in france and france was being obliged to defend herself against enemies wishing to overpower her the sight of all her people rising en masse was becoming an increasingly shameful torture for desnoyers making him think all the time of what he should have done in his youth of what he had dodged the veterans of seventy were passing through the streets with the green and black ribbon in their lapel souvenirs of the privations of the siege of paris and of heroic and disastrous campaigns the sight of these men satisfied with their past made him turn pale nobody was recalling his but he knew it and that was enough in vain his reason would try to lull this interior tempest those times were different then there was none of the present unanimity the empire was unpopular everything was lost but the recollection of a celebrated sentence was fixing itself in his mind as an obsession 
france still remained many had thought as he did in his youth but they had not therefore evaded military service they had stood by their country in a last and desperate resistance useless was his excuse-making reasoning nobler thoughts showed him the fallacy of this beating around the bush explanations and demonstrations are unnecessary to the understanding of patriotic and religious ideals true patriotism does not need them one's country is one's country and the laboring man skeptical and jesting the self-centered farmer the solitary pastor all had sprung to action at the sound of this conjuring word comprehending it instantly without previous instruction it is necessary to pay don marcelo kept repeating mentally i ought to pay my debt as in his dreams he was constantly feeling the anguish of an upright and desperate man who wishes to meet his obligations pay and how it was now very late for a moment the heroic resolution came into his head of offering himself as a volunteer of marching with his bag at his side in some one of the groups of future combatants the same as the carpenter but the uselessness of the sacrifice came immediately into his mind of what use would it be he looked robust and was well preserved for his age but he was over seventy and only the young make good soldiers combat is but one incident in the struggle equally necessary are the hardship and self-denial in the form of interminable marches extremes of temperature nights in the open air shoveling earth digging trenches loading carts suffering hunger no it was too late he could not even leave an illustrious name that might serve as an example instinctively he glanced behind he was not alone in the world he had a son who could assume his father's debt but that hope only lasted a minute his son was not french he belonged to another people half of his blood was from another source besides how could the boy be expected to feel as he did would he even understand if his father should explain it to him it was useless to expect anything from this lady-killing dancing clown from this fellow of senseless bravado who was constantly exposing his life in duels in order to satisfy a silly sense of honor oh the meekness of the bluff seor desnoyers after these reflections his family felt alarmed at seeing the humility and gentleness with which he moved around the house the two men-servants had gone to join their regiments and to them the most surprising result of the declaration of war was the sudden kindness of their master the lavishness of his farewell gifts the paternal care with which he supervised their preparations for departure the terrible don marcelo embraced them with moist eyes and the two had to exert themselves to prevent his accompanying them to the station outside of his home he was slipping about humbly as though mutely asking pardon of the many people around him to him they all appeared his superiors it was a period of economic crisis for the time being the rich also were experiencing what it was to be poor and worried the banks had suspended operations and were paying only a small part of their deposits for some weeks the millionaire was deprived of his wealth and felt restless before the uncertain future how long would it be before they could send him money from south america was war going to take away fortunes as well as lives and yet desnoyers had never appreciated money less nor disposed of it with greater generosity numberless mobilized men of the lower classes who were going alone toward the station met a gentleman who would timidly stop them put his hand in his pocket and leave in their right hand a bill of twenty francs fleeing immediately before their astonished eyes the working women who were returning weeping from saying good-bye to their husbands saw this same gentleman smiling at the children who were with them patting their cheeks 
and hastening away leaving a five-franc piece in their hands don marcelo who never smoked was now frequenting the tobacco shops coming out with hands and pockets filled in order that he might with lavish generosity press the packages upon the first soldier he met at times the recipient smiling courteously would thank him with a few words revealing his superior breeding afterwards passing the gift on to others clad in cloaks as coarse and badly cut as his own the mobilization universally obligatory often caused him to make these mistakes the rough hands pressing his with a grateful clasp left him satisfied for a few moments ah if only he could do more the government in mobilizing its vehicles had appropriated three of his monumental automobiles and desnoyers felt very sorry that they were not also taking the fourth mastodon of what use were they to him the shepherds of this monstrous herd the chauffeur and his assistants were now in the army everybody was marching away finally he and his son would be the only ones left two useless creatures he roared with wrath on learning of the enemy's entrance into belgium considering this the most unheard-of treason in history he suffered agonies of shame at remembering that at first he had held the exalted patriots of his country responsible for the war what perfidy methodically carried out after long years of preparation the accounts of the sackings fires and butcheries made him turn pale and gnash his teeth to him to marcelo desnoyers might happen the very same thing that belgium was enduring if the barbarian should invade france he had a home in the city a castle in the country and a family through association of ideas the women assaulted by the soldiery made him think of chichi and the dear dona luisa the mansions in flames called to his mind the rare and costly furnishings accumulated in his expensive dwellings the armorial bearings of his social elevation the old folk that were shot the women foully mutilated the children with their hands cut off all the horrors of a war of terror aroused the violence of his character and such things could happen with impunity in this day and generation in order to convince himself that punishment was near that vengeance was overtaking the guilty ones he felt the necessity of mingling daily with the people crowding around the gare de l'est although the greater part of the troops were operating on the frontiers that was not diminishing the activity in paris entire battalions were no longer going off but day and night soldiers were coming to the station singly or in groups these were reserves without uniform on their way to enroll themselves with their companies officials who until then had been busy with the work of the mobilization platoons in arms destined to fill the great gaps opened by death the multitude pressed against the railing was greeting those who were going off following them with their eyes while they were crossing the large square the latest editions of the daily papers were announced with hoarse yells and instantly the dark throng would be spotted with white all reading with avidity the printed sheets good news vive la france a doubtful dispatch foreshadowing calamity no matter we must press on at all costs the russians will close in behind them and while these dialogues inspired by the latest news were taking place many young girls were going among the groups offering little flags and tricolored cockades and passing through the patio men and still more men were disappearing behind the glass doors on their way to the war a sub-lieutenant of the reserves with his bag on his shoulder was accompanied by his father toward the file of policemen keeping the crowds back desnoyers saw in the young officer a certain resemblance to his son the father was wearing in his lapel the black and green ribbon of eighteen seventy a decoration which always filled desnoyers with remorse he was tall and gaunt but was still trying to hold himself erect with a heavy frown he wanted to show himself fierce inhuman 
in order to hide his emotion good-bye my boy do your best good-bye father they did not clasp hands and each was avoiding looking at the other the official was smiling like an automaton the father turned his back brusquely and threading his way through the throng entered a cafe where for some time he needed the most retired seat in the darkest corner to hide his emotion and don marcelo envied his grief end of section twenty nine section thirty part two chapter one continued of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez this librivox recording is in the public domain some of the reservists came along singing preceded by a flag they were joking and jostling each other betraying in excited actions long halts at all the taverns along the way one of them without interrupting his song was pressing the hand of an old woman marching beside him cheerful and dry-eyed the mother was concentrating all her strength in order with feigned happiness to accompany this strapping lad to the last minute others were coming along singly separated from their companies but not on that account alone the gun was hanging from the shoulder the back overlaid by the hump of the knapsack the red legs shooting in and out of the turned back folds of the blue cloak and the smoke of a pipe under the visor of the kepis in front of one of these men four children were walking along lined up according to size they kept turning their heads to admire their father suddenly glorified by his military trappings at his side was marching his wife affable and resigned feeling in her simple soul a revival of love an ephemeral spring born of the contact with danger the man a laborer of paris who a few months before was singing la internationale demanding the abolishment of armies and the brotherhood of all mankind was now going in quest of death his wife choking back her sobs was admiring him greatly affection and commiseration made her insist upon giving him a few last counsels in his knapsack she had put his best handkerchiefs the few provisions in the house and all the money her man was not to be uneasy about her and the children they would get along all right the government and kind neighbors would look after them the soldier in reply was jesting over the somewhat misshapen figure of his wife saluting the coming citizen and prophesying that he would be born in a time of great victory a kiss to the wife an affectionate hair pull for his offspring and then he had joined his comrades no tears courage vive la france the final injunctions of the departing were now heard nobody was crying but as the last red pantaloons disappeared many hands grasped the iron railing convulsively many handkerchiefs were bitten with gnashing teeth many faces were hidden in the arms with sobs of anguish and don marcelo envied these tears the old woman on losing the warm contact of her son's hand from her withered one turned in the direction which she believed to be that of the hostile country waving her arms with threatening fury ah the assassin the bandit in her wrathful imagination she was again seeing the countenance so often displayed in the illustrated pages of the periodicals mustaches insolently aggressive a mouth with the jaw and teeth of a wolf that laughed and laughed as men must have laughed in the time of the cavemen and don marcelo envied this wrath End of section thirty section thirty one part two chapter two of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two new life when marguerite was able to return to the studio in the rue de la pompe 
julio who had been living in a perpetual bad humor seeing everything in the blackest colors suddenly felt a return of his old optimism the war was not going to be so cruel as they all had at first imagined the day had passed by and the movements of the troops were beginning to be less noticeable as the number of men diminished in the streets the feminine population seemed to have increased although there was great scarcity of money the banks still remained closed the necessity for it was increasingly great in order to secure provisions memories of the famine of the siege of seventy tormented the imagination since war had broken out with the same enemy it seemed but logical to everybody to expect a repetition of the same happenings the storehouses were besieged by women who were securing stale food at exorbitant prices in order to store it in their homes future hunger was producing more terror than immediate dangers for young desnoyers these were about all the transformations that war was creating around him people would finally become accustomed to the new existence humanity has a certain reserve force of adaptation which enables it to mould itself to circumstances and continue existing he was hoping to continue his life as though nothing had happened it was enough for him that marguerite should continue faithful to their past together they would see events slipping by them with the cruel luxuriousness of those who from an inaccessible height contemplate a flood without the slightest risk to themselves this selfish attitude had also become habitual to argensola let us be neutral the bohemian would say neutrality does not necessarily mean indifference let us enjoy the great spectacle since nothing like it will ever happen again in our lifetime it was unfortunate that war should happen to come when they had so little money argensola was hating the banks even more than the central powers distinguishing with special antipathy the trust company which was delaying payment of julio's check how lovely it would have been with this sum available to have forestalled events by laying in every class of commodity in order to supplement the domestic scrimping he again had to solicit the aid of dona luisa war had lessened don marcelo's precautions and the family was now living in generous unconcern the mother like other house mistresses had stored up provisions for months and months to come buying whatever eatables she was able to lay hands on argensola took advantage of this abundance repeating his visits to the home in the avenue victor hugo descending its service stairway with great packages which were swelling the supplies in the studio he felt all the joys of a good housekeeper in surveying the treasures piled up in the kitchen great tins of canned meat pyramids of butter crocks and bags of dried vegetables he had accumulated enough there to maintain a large family the war had now offered a new pretext for him to visit don marcelo's wine vaults let them come he would say with a heroic gesture as he took stock of his treasure trove let them come when they will we are ready for them the care and increase of his provisions and the investigation of news were the two functions of his existence it seemed necessary to procure ten twelve fifteen papers a day some because they were reactionary and the novelty of seeing all the french united filled him with enthusiasm others because they were radical and must be better informed of the news received from the government they generally appeared at midday at three at four and at five in the afternoon a half hour's delay in the publication of the sheet raised great hopes in the public on the qui vive for stupendous news all the last supplements were snatched up everybody had his pockets stuffed with papers waiting anxiously the issue of extras in order to buy them too yet all the sheets were saying approximately the same thing 
argensola was developing a credulous enthusiastic soul capable of admitting many improbable things he presumed that this same spirit was probably animating everybody around him at times his old critical attitude would threaten to rebel but doubt was repulsed as something dishonorable he was living in a new world and it was but natural that extraordinary things should occur that could be neither measured nor explained by the old processes of reasoning so he commented with infantile joy on the marvellous accounts in the daily papers of combats between a single belgian platoon and entire regiments of enemies putting them to disorderly flight of the german fear of the bayonet that made them run like hares the instant that the charge sounded of the inefficiency of the german artillery whose projectiles always missed fire it was logical and natural that little belgium should conquer gigantic germany a repetition of david and goliath with all the metaphors and images that this unequal contest had inspired across so many centuries like the greater part of the nation he had the mentality of a reader of tales of chivalry who feels himself defrauded if the hero single-handed fails to cleave a thousand enemies with one fell stroke he purposely chose the most sensational papers those which published many stories of single encounters of individual deeds about which nobody could know with any degree of certainty the intervention of england on the seas made him imagine a frightful famine coming providentially like a thunderclap to torture the enemy he honestly believed that ten days of this maritime blockade would convert germany into a group of shipwrecked sailors floating on a raft this vision made him repeat his visits to the kitchen to gloat over his packages of provisions ah what they would give in berlin for my treasures never had argensola eaten with greater avidity consideration of the great privations suffered by the adversary was sharpening his appetite to a monstrous capacity white bread golden brown and crusty was stimulating him to an almost religious ecstasy if friend william could only get his claws on this he would chuckle to his companion so he chewed and swallowed with increasing relish solids and liquids on passing through his mouth seemed to be acquiring a new flavor rare and divine distant hunger for him was a stimulant a sauce of endless delight while france was inspiring his enthusiasm he was conceding greater credit to russia ah those cossacks he was accustomed to speak of them as intimate friends he loved to describe the unbridled gallop of the wild horsemen impalpable as phantoms and so terrible in their wrath that the enemy could not look them in the face the concierge and the stay-at-homes used to listen to him with all the respect due to a foreign gentleman knowing much of the great outside world with which they were not familiar the cossacks will adjust the accounts of these bandits he would conclude with absolute assurance within a month they will have entered berlin and his public composed of women wives and mothers of those who had gone to war would modestly agree with him with that irresistible desire which we all feel of placing our hopes on something distant and mysterious the french would defend the country reconquering besides the lost territories but the cossacks of whom so many were speaking but so few had seen were going to give the death blow the only person who knew them at first hand was tchernoff and to argensola's astonishment he listened to his words without showing any enthusiasm the cossacks were for him simply one body of the russian army good enough soldiers but incapable of working miracles that everybody was expecting from them that tchernoff exclaimed argensola since he hates the czar he thinks the entire country mad he is a revolutionary fanatic and i am opposed to all fanaticisms julio was listening absent-mindedly to the news brought by his companion the vibrating statements recited in declamatory tones the plans of the campaign traced out on an enormous map 
fastened to the wall of the studio and bristling with tiny flags that marked the camps of the belligerent armies every issue of the papers obliged the spaniard to arrange a new dance of the pins on the map followed by his comments of bomb-proof optimism we have entered into alsace very good it appears now that we abandon alsace splendid i suspect the cause it is in order to enter again in a better place getting at the enemy from behind they say that liege has fallen what a lie and if it does fall it doesn't matter just an incident nothing more the others remain the others that are advancing on the eastern side and are going to enter berlin the news from the russian front was his favorite but obliged him to remain in suspense every time that he tried to find on the map the obscure names of the places where the admired cossacks were exhibiting their wonderful exploits meanwhile julio was continuing the course of his own reflections marguerite she had come back at last and yet each time seemed to be drifting further away from him in the first days of the mobilization he had haunted her neighborhood trying to appease his longing by this illusory proximity marguerite had written to him urging patience how fortunate it was that he was a foreigner and would not have to endure the hardship of war her brother an officer in the artillery reserves was going at almost any minute her mother who made her home with this bachelor's son had kept an astonishing serenity up to the last minute although she had wept much while the war was still but a possibility she herself had prepared the soldier's outfit so that the small valise might contain all that was indispensable for campaign life but marguerite had divined her poor mother's secret struggles not to reveal her despair in moist eyes and trembling hands it was impossible to leave her alone at such a time then had come the farewell god be with you my son do your duty but be prudent not a tear not a sign of weakness all her family had advised her not to accompany her son to the railway station so his sister had gone with him and upon returning home marguerite had found her mother rigid in her armchair with a set face avoiding all mention of her son speaking of the friends who had also sent their boys to the war as if they only could comprehend her torture poor mamma i ought to be with her now more than ever to-morrow if i can i shall come to see you when at last she returned to the rue de la pompe her first care was to explain to julio the conservatism of her tailored suit the absence of jewels in the adornment of her person the war my dear now it is the chic thing to adapt oneself to the depressing conditions to be frugal and inconspicuous like soldiers who knows what we may expect her infatuation with dress still accompanied her in every moment of her life julio noticed a persistent absent-mindedness about her it seemed as though her spirit abandoning her body was wandering to far-away places her eyes were looking at him but she seldom saw him she would speak very slowly as though wishing to weigh every word fearful of betraying some secret this spiritual alienation did not however prevent her from slipping bodily along the smooth path of custom although afterwards she would seem to feel a vague remorse i wonder if it is right to do this is it not wrong to live like this when so many sorrows are falling on the world julio hushed her scruples with but if we are going to marry as soon as possible if we are already the same as husband and wife she replied with a gesture of strangeness and dismay to marry ten days ago she had had no other wish now the possibility of marriage was recurring less and less in her thoughts why think about such remote and uncertain events more immediate things were occupying her mind the farewell to her brother in the station was a scene which had fixed itself ineradicably in her memory upon going to the studio she had planned not to speak about it foreseeing that she might annoy her lover with this account but alas she had only to vow not to mention a thing to feel an irresistible impulse to talk about it 
she had never suspected that she could love her brother so dearly her former affection for him had been mingled with a silent sentiment of jealousy because her mother had preferred the older child besides he was the one who had introduced laurier to his home the two held diplomas as industrial engineers and had been close friends from their school days but upon seeing the boy ready to depart marguerite suddenly discovered that this brother who had always been of secondary interest to her was now occupying a preeminent place in her affections he was so handsome so interesting in his lieutenant's uniform he looked like another person i will admit to you that i was very proud to walk beside him leaning on his arm people thought that we were married seeing me weep some poor women tried to console me saying courage madame your man will come back he just laughed at hearing these mistakes the only thing that was really saddening him was thinking about our mother they had separated at the door of the station the sentries would not let her go any further so she had handed over his sword that she had wished to carry till the last moment it is lovely to be a man she exclaimed enthusiastically i would love to wear a uniform to go to war to be of some real use she tried not to say more about it as though she suddenly realized the inopportuneness of her last words perhaps she noticed the scowl on julio's face she was however so wrought up by the memory of that farewell that after a long pause she was unable to resist the temptation of again putting her thought into words at the station entrance while she was kissing her brother for the last time she had an encounter a great surprise he had approached also clad as an artillery officer but alone having to entrust his valise to a good-natured man from the crowd julio shot her a questioning look who was he he suspected but feigned ignorance as though fearing to learn the truth laurier she replied laconically my former husband the lover displayed a cruel irony it was a cowardly thing to ridicule this man who had responded to the call of duty he recognized his vileness but a malign and irresistible instinct made him keep on with his sneers in order to discredit the man before marguerite laurier a soldier he must cut a pretty figure dressed in uniform laurier the warrior he continued in a voice so sarcastic and strange that it seemed to be coming from somebody else poor creature she hesitated in her response not wishing to exasperate desnoyers any further but the truth was uppermost in her mind and she said simply no no he didn't look so bad quite the contrary perhaps it was a uniform perhaps it was his sadness at going away alone completely alone without a single hand to clasp his i didn't recognize him at first seeing my brother he started toward us but then when he saw me he went his own way poor man i feel sorry for him her feminine instinct must have told her that she was talking too much and she cut her chatter suddenly short the same instinct warned her that julio's countenance was growing more and more saturnine and his mouth taking a very bitter curve she wanted to console him and added what luck that you are a foreigner and will not have to go to the war how horrible it would be for me to lose you she said it sincerely a few moments before she had been envying men admiring the gallantry with which they were exposing their lives and now she was trembling before the idea that her lover might have been one of these this did not please his amorous egoism to be placed apart from the rest as a delicate and fragile being only fit for feminine adoration he preferred to inspire the envy that she had felt on beholding her brother decked out in his warlike accoutrement it seemed to him that something was coming between him and marguerite that would never disappear that would go on expanding repelling them in contrary directions far very far even to the point of not recognizing each other when their glances met he continued to be conscious of this impalpable obstacle in their following interviews marguerite was extremely affectionate in her speech and would look at him with moist and loving eyes but her caressing hands appeared more like those of a mother than a lover and her tenderness was accompanied with a certain disinterestedness and extraordinary modesty 
she seemed to prefer remaining obstinately in the studio declining to go into the other rooms we are so comfortable here i would rather not it is not worth while i should feel remorse afterwards why think of such things in these anxious times the world around her seemed saturated with love but it was a new love a love for the man who is suffering desire for abnegation for sacrifice this love called forth visions of white caps of tremulous hands healing shell-riddled and bleeding flesh every advance on julio's part but aroused in marguerite a vehement and modest protest as though they were meeting for the first time it is impossible she protested i keep thinking of my brother and of so many that i know that may be dying at this very minute news of battles were beginning to arrive and blood was beginning to flow in great quantities no no i cannot she kept repeating and when julio finally triumphed he found that her thoughts were still following independently the same line of mental stress one afternoon marguerite announced that henceforth she would see him less frequently she was attending classes now and had only two free days desnoyers listened dumbfounded classes what were her studies she seemed a little irritated at his mocking expression yes she was studying for the past week she had been attending classes now the lessons were going to be more regular the course of instruction had been fully organized and there were many more instructors i wish to be a trained nurse i am distressed over my uselessness of what good have i ever been till now she was silent for a few moments as though reviewing her past at times i almost think she mused that war with all its horrors still has some good in it it helps to make us useful to our fellow men we look at life more seriously trouble makes us realize that we have come into the world for some purpose i believe that we must not love life only for the pleasures that it brings us we ought to find satisfaction in sacrifice in dedicating ourselves to others and this satisfaction i don't know just why perhaps because it is new appears to me superior to all other things julio looked at her in surprise trying to imagine what was going on in that idolized and frivolous head what ideas were forming back of that thoughtful forehead which until then had merely reflected the slightest shadow of thoughts as swift and flitting as birds but the former marguerite was still alive he saw her constantly reappearing in a funny way among the sombre preoccupations with which war was overshadowing all lives we have to study very hard in order to earn our diplomas as nurses have you noticed our uniform it is most distinctive and the white is so becoming both to blondes and brunettes then the cap which allows little curls over the ears the fashionable coiffure and the blue cape over the white suit make a splendid contrast with this outfit a woman well shod and with few jewels may present a truly chic appearance it is a mixture of nun and great lady which is vastly becoming she was going to study with a regular fury in order to become really useful and sooner to wear the admired uniform poor desnoyers the longing to see her and the lack of occupation in these interminable afternoons which hitherto had been employed so delightfully compelled him to haunt the neighborhood of the unoccupied palace where the government had just established the training school for nurses stationing himself at the corner watching the fluttering skirts and quick steps of the feminine feet on the sidewalk he imagined that the course of time must have turned backward and that he was still but eighteen the same as when he used to hang around the establishments of some celebrated modiste the groups of women that at certain hours came out of the palace suggested these former days they were dressed extremely quietly the aspect of many of them as humble as that of the seamstresses but they were ladies of the well-to-do class some even coming in automobiles driven by chauffeurs in military uniform because they were ministerial vehicles these long waits often brought him unexpected encounters with the elegant students who were going and coming desnoyers some feminine voices would exclaim behind him isn't it desnoyers and he would find himself obliged to relieve their doubts saluting the ladies who were looking at him as though he were a ghost they were friends of a remote epoch 
of six months ago ladies who had admired and pursued him trusting sweetly to his masterly wisdom to guide them through the seven circles of the science of the tango they were now scrutinizing him as if between their last encounter and the present moment had occurred a great cataclysm transforming all the laws of existence as if he were the sole survivor of a vanished race eventually they all asked the same questions are you not going to the war how is it that you are not wearing a uniform he would attempt to explain but at his first words they would interrupt him that's so you are a foreigner they would say it with a certain envy doubtless thinking of their loved ones now suffering the privations and dangers of war but the fact that he was a foreigner would instantly create a vague atmosphere of spiritual aloofness an alienation that julio had not known in the good old days when people sought each other without considering nationality without feeling that disavowal of danger which isolates and concentrates human groups the ladies generally bade him adieu with malicious suspicion what was he doing hanging around there in search of his usual lucky adventure and their smiles were rather grave the smiles of older folk who know the true significance of life and commiserate the deluded ones still seeking diversion in frivolities this attitude was as annoying to julio as though it were a manifestation of pity they were supposing him still exercising the only function of which he was capable he wasn't good for anything else on the other hand these empty heads still keeping something of their old appearance now appeared animated by the grand sentiment of maternity an abstract maternity which seemed to be extending to all the men of the nation a desire for a self-sacrifice of knowing firsthand the privations of the lowly and aiding all the ills that flesh is heir to this same yearning was inspiring marguerite when she came away from her lessons she was advancing from one overpowering dread to another accepting the first rudiments of surgery as the greatest of scientific marvels at the same time she was astonished at the avidity with which she was assimilating these hitherto unsuspected mysteries sometimes with a funny assumption of assurance she would even believe that she had mistaken her vocation who knows but i was born to be a famous doctor she would exclaim End of section 31section thirty two part two chapter two continued of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez this librivox recording is in the public domain her great fear was that she might lose her self-control when the time came to put her newly acquired knowledge into practice to see herself before the foul odors of decomposing flesh to contemplate the flow of blood a horrible thing for her who had always felt an invincible repugnance toward all the unpleasant conditions of ordinary life but these hesitations were short and she was suddenly animated by a dashing energy these were times of sacrifice were not men snatched every day from the comforts of sensuous existence to endure the rude life of a soldier she would be a soldier in petticoats facing pain battling with it plunging her hands into putrefaction flashing like a ray of sunlight into the places where soldiers were expecting the approach of death she proudly narrated to desnoyers all the progress that she was making in the training school the complicated bandages that she was learning to adjust sometimes over a mannequin at others over the flesh of an employee trying to play the part of a sorely wounded patient she so dainty so incapable in her own home of the slightest physical effort was learning the most skilful ways of lifting a human body from the ground and carrying it on her back who knew but that she might render this very service some day on the battlefield she was ready for the greatest risks with the ignorant audacity of women impelled by flashes of heroism all her admiration was for the english army nurses 
slender women of nervous vigor whose photographs were appearing in the papers wearing pantaloons riding boots and white helmets julio listened to her with astonishment was this woman really marguerite war was obliterating all her winning vanities she was no longer fluttering about in bird-like fashion her feet were treading the earth with resolute firmness calm and secure in the new strength which was developing within when one of his caresses would remind her that she was a woman she would always say the same thing what luck that you are a foreigner what happiness to know that you do not have to go to war in her anxiety for sacrifice she wanted to go to the battlefields and yet at the same time she was rejoicing to see her lover exempt from military duty this preposterous lack of logic was not gratefully received by julio but irritated him as an unconscious offence one might suppose that she was protecting me he thought she is the man and rejoices that i the weak comrade should be protected from danger what a grotesque situation fortunately at times when marguerite presented herself at the studio she was again her old self making him temporarily forget his annoyance she would arrive with the same joy in a vacation that the college student or the employee feels on a holiday responsibility was teaching her to know the value of time no classes to-day she would call out on entering and tossing her hat on a divan she would begin a dance step retreating with infantile coquetry from the arms of her lover but in a few minutes she would recover her customary gravity the serious look that had become habitual with her since the outbreak of hostilities she spoke often of her mother always sad but striving to hide her grief and keeping herself up in the hope of a letter from her son she spoke too of the war commenting on the latest events with the rhetorical optimism of the official dispatches she could describe the first flag taken from the enemy as minutely as though it were a garment of unparalleled elegance from a window she had seen the minister of war she was very much affected when repeating the story of some fugitive belgians recently arrived at the hospital they were the only patients that she had been able to assist until now paris was not receiving the soldiers wounded in battle by order of the government they were being sent from the front to the hospitals in the south she no longer evinced toward julio the resistance of the first few days her training as a nurse was giving her a certain passivity she seemed to be ignoring material attractions stripping them of the spiritual importance which she had hitherto attributed to them she wanted to make julio happy although her mind was concentrated on other matters one afternoon she felt the necessity of communicating certain news which had been filling her mind since the day before springing up from the couch she hunted for her handbag which contained a letter she wanted to read it again to tell its contents to somebody with that irresistible impulse which forestalls confession it was a letter which her brother had sent her from the vosges in it he spoke of laurier more than of himself they belonged to different batteries but were in the same division and had taken part in the same combats the officer was filled with admiration for his former brother-in-law who could have guessed that a future hero was hidden within that silent and tranquil engineer but he was a genuine hero just the same all the officials had agreed with marguerite's brother on seeing how calmly he fulfilled his duty facing death with the same coolness as though he were in his factory near paris he had asked for the dangerous post of lookout slipping as near as possible to the enemy's lines in order to verify the exactitude of the artillery discharge rectifying it by telephone a german shell had demolished the house on the roof of which he was concealed and laurier on crawling out unhurt from the ruins had readjusted his telephone and gone tranquilly on continuing the same work in the shelter of a nearby grove his battery picked out by the enemy's aeroplanes 
had received the concentrated fire of the artillery opposite in a few minutes all the force were rolling on the ground the captain and many soldiers dead officers wounded and almost all the gunners there only remained as chief laurier the impassive as his comrades nicknamed him and aided by the few artillerymen still on their feet he continued firing under a rain of iron and fire so as to cover the retreat of a battalion he has been mentioned twice in dispatches marguerite continued reading i do not believe it will be long before they give him the cross he is valiant in every way who would have supposed all this a few weeks ago she did not share the general astonishment living with laurier had many times shown her the intrepidity of his character the fearlessness concealed under that placid exterior on that account her instincts had warned her against rousing her husband's wrath in the first days of her infidelity she still remembered the way he looked the night he surprised her leaving julio's home his was the passion that kills and nevertheless he had not attempted the least violence with her the memory of his consideration was awaking in marguerite a sentiment of gratitude perhaps he had loved her as no other man had her eyes with an irresistible desire for comparison sought julio's admiring his youthful grace and distinction the image of laurier heavy and ordinary came into her mind as a consolation certainly the officer whom she had seen at the station when saying good-bye to her brother did not seem to her like her old husband but marguerite wished to forget the pallid lieutenant with the sad countenance who had passed before her eyes preferring to remember him only as the manufacturer preoccupied with profits and incapable of comprehending what she was accustomed to call the delicate refinements of a chic woman decidedly julio was the more fascinating she did not repent of her past she did not wish to repent of it and her loving selfishness made her repeat once more the same old exclamation how fortunate that you are a foreigner what a relief to know that you are safe from the dangers of war julio felt the usual exasperation at hearing this he came very near to closing his beloved's mouth with his hand was she trying to make fun of him it was fairly insulting to place him apart from other men meanwhile with blind irrelevance she persisted in talking about laurier commenting upon his achievements i do not love him i never have loved him do not look so cross how could the poor man ever be compared with you you must admit though that his new existence is rather interesting i rejoice in his brave deeds as though an old friend had done them a family visitor who i had not seen for a long time the poor man deserved a better fate he ought to have married some other woman some companion more on a level with his ideals i tell you that i really pity him and this pity was so intense that her eyes filled up with tears awakening the tortures of jealousy in her lover after these interviews desnoyers was more ill-tempered and despondent than ever i am beginning to realize that we are in a false position he said one morning to argensola life is going to become increasingly painful it is difficult to remain tranquil continuing the same old existence in the midst of a people at war his companion had about come to the same conclusion he too was beginning to feel that the life of a young foreigner in paris was insufferable now that it was so upset by war one has to keep showing passports all the time in order that the police may be sure that they have not discovered a deserter in the street car the other afternoon i had to explain that i was a spaniard to some girls who were wondering why i was not at the front one of them as soon as she learned my nationality asked me with great simplicity why i did not offer myself as a volunteer now they have invented a word for the stay-at-homes calling them les embusqués the hidden ones i am sick and tired of the ironical looks shot at me wherever i go it makes me wild to be taken for an embusqué a flash of heroism was galvanizing the impressionable bohemian now that everybody was going to war he was wishing to do the same thing 
he was not afraid of death the only thing that was disturbing to him was the military service the uniform the mechanical obedience to bugle call the blind subservience to the chiefs fighting was not offering any difficulties for him but his nature capriciously resented everything in the form of discipline the foreign groups in paris were trying to organize each its own legion of volunteers and he too was planning his a battalion of spaniards and south americans reserving naturally the presidency of the organizing committee for himself and later the command of the body he had inserted notices in the papers making the studio in the rue de la pompe the recruiting office in ten days two volunteers had presented themselves a clerk shivering in midsummer who stipulated that he should be an officer because he was wearing a suitable jacket and a spanish tavern-keeper who at the very outset had wished to rob argensola of his command on the futile pretext that he was a soldier in his youth while the bohemian was only an artist twenty spanish battalions were attempted with the same result in different parts of paris each enthusiast wished to be commander of the others with the individual haughtiness and aversion to discipline so characteristic of the race finally the future generalissimos decided to enlist as simple volunteers but in a french regiment i am waiting to see what the garibaldis do said argensola modestly perhaps i may go with them this glorious name made military service conceivable to him but then he vacillated he would certainly have to obey somebody in this body of volunteers and he did not believe in an obedience that was not preceded by long discussions what next life has changed in a fortnight he continued it seems as if we were living in another planet our former achievements are not appreciated others most obscure and poor those who formerly had the least consideration are now promoted to the first ranks the refined man of complex spirituality has disappeared for who knows how many years now the simple-minded man climbs triumphantly to the top because though his ideas are limited they are sure and he knows how to obey we are no longer the style desnoyers assented it was so they were no longer fashionable none knew that better than he for he who was once the sensation of the day was now passing as a stranger among the very people who a few months before had raved over him your reign is over laughed argensola the fact that you are a handsome fellow doesn't help you one bit nowadays in a uniform and with a cross on my breast i could soon get the best of you in a rival love affair in times of peace the officers only set the girls of the provinces to dreaming but now that we are at war there has awakened in every woman the ancestral enthusiasm that her remote grandmothers used to feel for the strong and aggressive beast the high-born dames who a few months ago were complicating their desires with psychological subtleties are now admiring the military man with the same simplicity that the maid has for the common soldier before a uniform they feel the humble and servile enthusiasm of the female of the lower animals before the crests foretops and gay plumes of the fighting males look out master we shall have to follow the new course of events or resign ourselves to everlasting obscurity the tango is dead and desnoyers agreed that truly they were two beings on the other side of the river of life which at one bound had changed its course there was no longer any place in the new existence for that poor painter of souls nor for that hero of a frivolous life who from five to seven every afternoon had attained the triumphs most envied by mankind end of section thirty two section thirty three part two chapter three of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three 
the retreat war had extended one of its antennae even to the avenue victor hugo it was a silent war in which the enemy bland shapeless and gelatinous seemed constantly to be escaping from the hands only to renew hostilities a little later on i have germany in my own house growled marcelo desnoyers germany was dona elena the wife of von hartrott why had not her son that professor of inexhaustible sufficiency whom he now believed to have been a spy taken her home with him for what sentimental caprice had she wished to stay with her sister losing the opportunity of returning to berlin before the frontiers were closed the presence of this woman in his home was the cause of many compunctions and alarms fortunately the chauffeur and all the men-servants were in the army the two chinas received an order in a threatening tone they must be very careful when talking to the french maids not the slightest allusion to the nationality of dona elena's husband nor to the residence of her family dona elena was an argentinian but in spite of the silence of the maids don marcelo was always in fear of some outburst of exalted patriotism and that his wife's sister might suddenly find herself confused find in a concentration camp under suspicion of having dealings with the enemy frau von hartrott made his uneasiness worse instead of keeping a discreet silence she was constantly introducing discord into the home with her opinions during the first days of the war she kept herself locked in her room joining the family only when summoned to the dining-room with tightly puckered mouth and an absent-minded air she would then seat herself at the table pretending not to hear don marcelo's verbal outpourings of enthusiasm he enjoyed describing the departure of the troops the moving scenes in the streets and at the stations commenting on events with an optimism sure of the first news of the war two things were beyond all discussion the bayonet was the secret of the french and the germans were shuddering with terror before its fatal glistening point the seventy five cannon had proved itself a unique jewel its shots being absolutely sure he was really feeling sorry for the enemy's artillery since its projectile so seldom exploded even when well aimed furthermore the french troops had entered victoriously into alsace many little towns were already theirs now it is as it was in the seventies he would exult brandishing his fork and waving his napkin we are going to kick them back to the other side of the rhine kick them that's the word chichi always agreed gleefully while dona elena was raising her eyes to heaven as though silently calling upon somebody hidden in the ceiling to bear witness to such errors and blasphemies the kind dona luisa always sought her out afterwards in the retirement of her room believing it necessary to give sisterly counsel to one living so far from home the romantica did not maintain her austere silence before her sister who had always venerated her superior instruction so now the poor lady was overwhelmed with accounts of the stupendous forces of germany enunciated with all the authority of a wife of a great teutonic patriot and a mother of an almost celebrated professor according to her graphic picture millions of men were now surging forth in enormous streams thousands of cannons were filing by and tremendous mortars like monstrous turrets and towering above all this vast machinery of destruction was a man who alone was worth an army a being who knew everything and could do everything handsome intelligent and infallible as a god the emperor the french just don't know what's ahead of them declared dona elena we are going to annihilate them it is merely a matter of two weeks before august is ended the emperor will have entered paris senora desnoyers was so greatly impressed by these dire prophecies that she could not hide them from her family chichi waxed indignant at her mother's credulity and her aunt's germanism martial fervor was flaming up in the former peoncito ay if only women could go to war 
she enjoyed picturing herself on horseback in command of a regiment of dragoons charging the enemy with other amazons as dashing and buxom as she then her fondness for skating would predominate over her tastes for the cavalry and she would long to be an alpine hunter a diable bleu among those who slid on long runners with muskets slung across the back and alpenstock in hand over the snowy slopes of the vosges but the government did not appreciate the valorous women and she could obtain no other part in the war but to admire the uniform of her true love rene lacour converted into a soldier the senator's son certainly looked beautiful he was tall and fair of a rather feminine type recalling his dead mother in his fiancee's opinion rene was just a little sugar soldier at first she had been very proud to walk the streets by the side of this warrior believing that his uniform had greatly augmented his personal charm but little by little a revulsion of feeling was clouding her joy the senatorial prince was nothing but a common soldier his illustrious father fearful that the war might cut off for ever the dynasty of the lacours indispensable to the welfare of the state had had his son mustered into the auxiliary service of the army by this arrangement his heir need not leave paris ranking about as high as those who were kneading the bread or mending the soldiers cloaks only by going to the front could he claim as a student of the ecole centrale his title of sub-lieutenant in the artillery reserves what happiness for me that you have to stay in paris how delighted i am that you are just a private and yet at the same time chichi was thinking enviously of her friends whose lovers and brothers were officers they could parade the streets escorted by a gold trim kepis that attracted the notice of the passers-by and the respectful salute of the lower ranks each time that dona luisa terrified by the forecasts of her sister undertook to communicate her dismay to her daughter the girl would rage up and down exclaiming what lies my aunt tells you since her husband is a german she sees everything as he wishes it to be papa knows more rene's father is better informed about these things we are going to give them a thorough hiding what fun it will be when they hit my uncle and all my snippy cousins in berlin hush groaned her mother do not talk such nonsense the war has turned you as crazy as your father the good lady was scandalized at hearing the outburst of savage desires that the mere mention of the kaiser always aroused in her daughter in times of peace chichi had rather admired this personage he's not so bad-looking she had commented but with a very ordinary smile now all her wrath was concentrated upon him the thousands of women that were weeping through his fault the mothers without sons the wives without husbands the poor children left in the burning towns ah the vile wretch and she would brandish her knife of the old peoncito days a dagger with silver handle and sheath richly chased a gift that her grandfather had exhumed from some forgotten souvenirs of his childhood in an old valise the very first german that she came across was doomed to death dona luisa was terrified to find her flourishing this weapon before her dressing mirror she was no longer yearning to be a cavalry man nor a diable bleu she would be entirely content if they would leave her alone in some closed space with the detested monster in just five minutes she would settle the universal conflict defend yourself Bosch! she would shriek standing at guard as in her childhood she had seen the peons doing on the ranch and with a knife thrust above and below she would pierce his imperial vitals immediately there resounded in her imagination shouts of joy the gigantic sigh of millions of women freed at last from the bloody nightmare thanks to her playing the role of judith or charlotte corday or a blend of all the heroic women who had killed for the common weal her savage fury made her continue her imaginary slaughter dagger in hand second stroke the crown prince rolling on one side and his head to the other a rain of dagger thrusts 
all the invincible generals of whom her aunt had been boasting fleeing with their insides in their hands and bringing up the rear that fawning lackey who wished to receive the same things as those of highest rank the uncle from berlin ah oh, if she could only get the chance to make these longings a reality you are mad protested her mother completely mad how can a ladylike girl talk in such a way surprising her niece in the ecstasy of these delirious ravings dona elena would raise her eyes to heaven abstaining thenceforth from communicating her opinions reserving them wholly for the mother don marcelo's indignation took another bound when his wife repeated to him the news from her sister all a lie the war was progressing finely on the eastern frontier the french troops had advanced through the interior of alsace and lorraine but belgium is invaded isn't it asked dona luisa and those poor belgians desnoyers retorted indignantly that invasion of belgium is a treason and a treason never amounts to anything among decent people he said it in all good faith as though war were a duel in which the traitor was henceforth ruled out and unable to continue his outrages besides the heroic resistance of belgium was nourishing the most absurd illusions in his heart the belgians were certainly supernatural men destined to the most stupendous achievements and to think that heretofore he had never taken this plucky little nation into account for several days he considered liege a holy city before whose walls the teutonic power would be completely confounded upon the fall of liege his unquenchable faith sought another handle there were still remaining many other lieges in the interior the germans might force their way further in then we would see how many of them ever succeeded in getting out the entry into brussels did not disquiet him an unprotected city its surrender was a foregone conclusion now the belgians would be better able to defend antwerp neither did the advance of the germans toward the french frontier alarm him at all in vain his sister-in-law with malicious brevity mentioned in the dining-room the progress of the invasion so confusedly outlined in the daily papers the germans were already at the frontier and what of that yelled don marcelo soon they will meet someone to talk to joffre is going to meet them our armies are in the east in the very place where they ought to be on the true frontier at the door of their home but they have to deal with a treacherous and cowardly opponent that instead of marching face to face leaps the walls of the corral like sheep stealers their underhanded tricks won't do them any good though the french are already in belgium and adjusting the accounts of the germans we shall smash them so effectually that never again will they be able to disturb the peace of the world and that accursed individual with a rampant moustache we are going to put in a cage and exhibit in the place de la concorde inspired by the paternal braggadocio chichi also launched forth exultingly an imaginary series of avenging torments and insults as a compliment to this imperial exhibition these allusions to the emperor aggravated frau von hartrott more than anything else in the first days of the war her sister had surprised her weeping before the newspaper caricatures and leaflets sold in the streets such an excellent man so knightly such a good father to his family he wasn't to blame for anything it was his enemies who forced him to assume the offensive her veneration for exalted personages was making her take the attacks upon this admired grandee as though they were directed against her own family one night in the dining-room she abandoned her tragic silence certain sarcasms shot by desnoyers at her hero brought the tears to her eyes and this sentimental indulgence turned her thoughts upon her sons who were undoubtedly taking part in the invasion her brother-in-law was longing for the extermination of all the enemy may every barbarian be exterminated every one of the bandits and pointed helmets who have just burned louvain and other towns shooting defenceless peasants old men women and children you forget that i am a mother sobbed frau von hartrott you forget that among those whose extermination you are imploring are my sons her violent weeping made desnoyers realize more than ever the abyss yawning between him and this woman lodged in his own house his resentment however overleapt family considerations 
she might weep for her sons all she wanted to that was her right but these sons were aggressors and wantonly doing evil it was the other mothers who were inspiring his pity those who were living tranquilly in their smiling little belgian towns when their sons were suddenly shot down their daughters violated and their houses burned to the ground as though this description of the horrors of war were a fresh insult to her dona elena wept harder than ever what falsehoods the kaiser was an excellent man his soldiers were gentlemen the german army was a model of civilization and goodness her husband had belonged to this army her sons were marching in its ranks and she knew her sons well-bred and incapable of wrong-doing these belgian calumnies she could no longer listen to and with dramatic abandon she flung herself into the arms of her sister senor desnoyers raged against the fate that condemned him to live under the same roof with this woman what an unfortunate complication for the family and the frontiers were closed making it impossible to get rid of her very well then he thundered let us talk no more about it we shall never reach an understanding for we belong to two different worlds it's a great pity that you can't go back to your own people after that he refrained from mentioning the war in his sister-in-law's presence chichi was the only one keeping up her aggressive and noisy enthusiasm upon reading in the papers the news of the shootings sackings burnings of cities and the dolorous flight of those who had seen their all reduced to ashes she again felt the necessity of assuming the role of lady assassin ay if she could only once get her hands on one of those bandits what did the men amount to anyway if they couldn't exterminate the whole lot then she would look at rene in his exquisitely fresh uniform sweet-mannered and smiling as though all war meant to him was a mere change of attire and she would exclaim enigmatically what luck that you will never have to go to the front how fine that you don't run any risks and her lover would accept these words as but another proof of her affectionate interest one day don marcelo was able to appreciate the horrors of war without leaving paris three thousand belgian refugees were quartered provisionally in the circus before being distributed among the provinces when desnoyers entered this place he saw in the vestibule the same posters which had been flaunting their spectacular gaieties when he had visited it a few months before with his family now he noticed the odor from a sick and miserable multitude crowded together like the exhalation from a prison or poorhouse infirmary he saw a throng that seemed crazy or stupefied with grief they did not know exactly where they were they had come thither they didn't know how the terrible spectacle of the invasion was still so persistent in their minds that it left room for no other impression they were still seeing the helmeted men in their peaceful hamlets their homes in flames the soldiery firing upon those who were fleeing the mutilated women done to death by incessant adulterous assault the old men burned alive the children stabbed in their cradles by human beasts inflamed by alcohol and license some of the octogenarians were weeping as they told how the soldiers of a civilized nation were cutting off the breasts from the women in order to nail them on the doors how they had passed around as a trophy a newborn babe spiked on a bayonet how they had shot aged men in the very armchair in which they were huddled in their sorrowful weakness torturing them first with their jests and taunts they had fled blindly pursued by fire and shot as crazed with terror as the people of the middle ages trying not to be ridden down by the hordes of galloping huns and mongols and this flight had been across the country in its loveliest festal array in the most productive of months when the earth was bristling with ears of grain when the august sky was most brilliant and when the birds were greeting the opulent harvest with their glad songs in that circus filled with the wandering crowds the immense crime was living again the children were crying with a sound like the bleeding of lambs the men were looking wildly around with terrified eyes the frenzied women were howling like the insane families had become separated in the terror of flight a mother of five little ones now had but one 
the parents as they realized the number missing were thinking with anguish of those who had disappeared would they ever find them again or were they already dead end of section thirty three section thirty four part two chapter three continued of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente velasco ibanez this librivox recording is in the public domain don marcelo returned home grinding his teeth and waving his cane in an alarming manner ah oh, the bandits if only his sister-in-law could change her sex why wasn't she a man it would be better still if she could suddenly assume the form of her husband von hartrott what an interesting interview the two brothers-in-law would have the war was awakening religious sentiment in the men and increasing the devotion of the women the churches were filled dona luisa was no longer confining herself to those of her neighborhood with the courage induced by extraordinary events she was traversing paris afoot and going from the madeleine to notre dame or to the sacre coeur on the heights of montmartre religious festivals were now thronged like popular assemblies the preachers were tribunes patriotic enthusiasm interrupted many sermon with applause each morning on opening the papers before reading the war news senora desnoyers would hunt other notices where was father amet going to be to-day then under the arched vaultings of that temple would she unite her voice with the devout chorus imploring supernatural intervention lord save france patriotic religiosity was putting saint genevieve at the head of the favored ones so from all these fiestas dona luisa tremulous with faith would return in expectation of a miracle similar to that which the patron saint of paris had worked before the invading hordes of attila dona elena was also visiting the churches but those nearest the house her brother-in-law saw her one afternoon entering saint honore de lo the building was filled with the faithful and on the altar was a sheaf of flags france and the allied nations the imploring crowd was not composed entirely of women desnoyers saw men of his age pompous and grave moving their lips and fixing steadfast eyes on the altar on which were reflected like lost stars the flames of the candles and again he felt envy they were fathers who were recalling their childhood prayers thinking of their sons in battle don marcelo who had always considered religion with indifference suddenly recognized the necessity of faith he wanted to pray like the others with a vague indefinite supplication including all beings who were struggling and dying for a land that he had not tried to defend he was scandalized to see von hartrott's wife kneeling among these people raising her eyes to the cross in a look of anguished entreaty she was begging heaven to protect her husband the german who perhaps at this moment was concentrating all his devilish faculties on the best organization for crushing the weak she was praying for her sons officers of the king of prussia who revolver in hand were entering villages and farmlands driving before them a horror-stricken crowd leaving behind them fire and death and these horizons were going to mingle with those of the mothers who were praying for the youth trying to check the onslaught of the barbarians with the petitions of these earnest men rigid in their tragic grief he had to make a great effort not to protest aloud and he left the church his sister-in-law had no right to kneel there among those people they ought to put her out he growled indignantly she is compromising god with her absurd entreaties but in spite of his annoyance he had to endure her living in his household and at the same time had taken great pains to prevent her nationality being known outside it was a severe trial for don marcelo to be obliged to keep silent when at table with his family he had to avoid the hysterics of his sister-in-law 
who promptly burst into sighs and sobs at the slightest allusion to her hero and he feared equally the complaints of his wife always ready to defend her sister as though she were the victim that a man in his own home should have to curb his tongue and speak tactfully the only satisfaction permitted him was to announce the military moves the french had entered belgium it appears that the Boches have had a good setback the slightest clash of cavalry a simple encounter with the advanced troops he would glorify as a decisive victory in lorraine too we are making great headway but suddenly the fountain of his bubbling optimism seemed to become choked up to judge from the periodicals nothing extraordinary was occurring they continued publishing war stories so as to keep enthusiasm at fever heat but nothing definite the government too was issuing communications of vague and rhetorical verbosity desnoyers became alarmed his instinct warning him of danger there is something wrong he thought there's a spring broken somewhere this lack of encouraging news coincided exactly with the sudden rise in dona elena's spirits with whom had that woman been talking whom did she meet when she was on the street without dropping her pose as a martyr with the same woe-begone look and drooping mouth she was talking and talking treacherously the torment of don marcelo in being obliged to listen to the enemy harbored within his gates the french had been vanquished in lorraine and in belgium at the same time a body of the army had deserted the colors many prisoners many cannon were captured lies german exaggerations howled desnoyers and chichi with the derisive ha ha's of an insolent girl drowned out the triumphant communications of the aunt from berlin i don't know of course said the unwelcome lodger with mock humility perhaps it is not authentic i have heard it said her host was furious where had she heard it said who was giving her such news and in order to ventilate his wrath he broke forth into tirades against the enemy's espionage against the carelessness of the police force in permitting so many germans to remain hidden in paris then he suddenly became quiet thinking of his own behavior in this line he too was involuntarily contributing toward the maintenance and support of the foe the fall of the ministry and the constitution of a government of national defense made it apparent that something very important must have taken place the alarms and tears of dona luisa increased his nervousness the good lady was no longer returning from the churches cheered and strengthened her confidential talks with her sister were filling her with a terror that she tried in vain to communicate to her husband all is lost elena is the only one that knows the truth desnoyers went in search of senator lacour he would know all the ministers and no one could be better informed yes my friend said the important man sadly two great losses at morange and charlois at the east and the north the enemy is going to invade french soil but our army is intact and will retreat in good order good fortune may still be ours a great calamity but all is not lost preparations for the defence of paris were being pushed forward rather late the forts were supplying themselves with new cannon houses built in the danger zone in the piping times of peace were now disappearing under the blows of the official demolition the trees on the outer avenues were being felled in order to enlarge the horizon barricades of sacks of earth and tree trunks were heaped at the doors of the old walls the curious were skirting the suburbs in order to gaze at the recently dug trenches and the barbed wire fences the bois de boulogne was filled with herds of cattle near heaps of dry alfalfa steers and sheep were grouped in the green meadows protection against famine was uppermost in the minds of a people still remembering the suffering of eighteen seventy every night the street lighting was less and less the sky on the other hand was streaked incessantly by the shafts from the searchlights fear of aerial invasion was increasing the public uneasiness timid people were speaking of zeppelins attributing to them irresistible powers with all the exaggeration that accompanies mysterious dangers in her panic 
dona luisa greatly distressed her husband who was passing the days in continual alarm yet trying to put heart into his trembling and anxious wife they are going to come marcelo my heart tells me so the girl the girl she was accepting blindly all the statements made by her sister the only thing that comforted her being the chivalry and discipline of those troops to which her nephews belonged the news of the atrocities committed against the women of belgium were received with the same credulity as the enemy's advances announced by elena our girl marcelo our girl and the girl object of so much solicitude would laugh with the assurance of vigorous youth on hearing of her mother's anxiety just let the shameless fellows come i shall take great pleasure in seeing them face to face and she clenched her right hand as though it already clutched the avenging knife the father became tired of this situation he still had one of his monumental automobiles that an outside chauffeur could manage senator lacour obtained the necessary passports and desnoyers gave his wife her orders in a tone that admitted of no remonstrance they must go to biarritz or to some of the summer resorts in the north of spain almost all the south american families had already gone in the same direction dona luisa tried to object it was impossible for her to separate herself from her husband never before in their many years of married life had they once been separated but a harsh negative from don marcelo cut her pleading short he would remain then the poor senora ran to the rue de la pompe her son julio scarcely listened to his mother ay he too would stay so finally the imposing automobile lumbered toward the south carrying dona luisa her sister who hailed with delight this withdrawal before the admired troops of the emperor and chichi pleased that the war was necessitating an excursion to the fashionable beaches frequented by her friends don marcelo was at last alone the two coppery maids had followed by rail the flight of their mistresses at first the old man felt a little bewildered by this solitude which obliged him to eat uncomfortable meals in a restaurant and pass the nights in enormous and deserted rooms still bearing traces of their former occupants the other apartments in the building had also been vacated all the tenants were foreigners who had discreetly decamped or french families surprised by the war when summering at their country seats instinctively he turned his steps toward the rue de la pompe gazing from afar at the studio windows what was his son doing undoubtedly continuing his gay and useless life such men only existed for their own selfish folly desnoyers felt satisfied with the stand he had taken to follow the family would be sheer cowardice the memory of his youthful flight to south america was sufficient martyrdom he would finish his life with all the compensating bravery that he could muster no they will not come he said repeatedly with the optimism of enthusiasm i have a presentment that they will never reach paris and even if they do come the absence of his family brought him a joyous valor and a sense of bold youthfulness although his age might prevent his going to war in the open air he could still fire a gun immovable in a trench without fear of death let them come he was longing for the struggle with the anxiety of a punctilious business man wishing to cancel a former debt as soon as possible in the streets of paris he met many groups of fugitives they were from the north and east of france and had escaped before the german advance of all the tales told by this despondent crowd not knowing where to go and dependent upon the charity of the people he was most impressed with those dealing with the disregard of property shootings and assassinations made him clench his fists with threats of vengeance but the robberies authorized by the heads the wholesale sacking by superior order followed by fire appeared to him so unheard of that he was silent with stupefaction his speech seeming to be temporarily paralyzed 
and a people with laws could wage war in this fashion like a tribe of indians going to combat in order to rob his adoration of property rights made him beside himself with wrath at these sacrileges end of section thirty four section thirty five part two chapter three continued of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez this librivox recording is in the public domain he began to worry about his castle at villeblanche all that he owned in paris suddenly seemed to him of slight importance to what he had in his historic mansion his best paintings were there adorning the gloomy salons there too the furnishings captured from the antiquarians after an auctioneering battle and the crystal cabinets the tapestries the silver services he mentally reviewed all these objects not letting a single one escape his inventory things that he had forgotten came surging up in his memory and the fear of losing them seemed to give them greater lustre increasing their size and intensifying their value all the riches of ville blanche were concentrated in one certain acquisition which desnoyers admired most of all for to his mind it stood for all the glory of his immense fortune in fact the most luxurious appointment that even a millionaire could possess my golden bath he thought i have there my tub of gold this bath of priceless metal he had procured after much financial wrestling from an auction and he considered the purchase the culminating achievement of his wealth no one knew exactly its origin perhaps it had been the property of luxurious princes perhaps it owed its existence to the caprice of a demi mondaine fond of display he and his had woven a legend around this golden cavity adorned with lions claws dolphins and busts of naiads undoubtedly it was once a king's chichi gravely affirmed that it had been marie antoinette's and the entire family thought that the home on the avenue victor hugo was altogether too modest and plebeian to enshrine such a jewel they therefore agreed to put it in the castle where it was greatly venerated although it was useless and solemn as a museum piece and was he to permit the enemy in their advance toward the marne to carry off this priceless treasure as well as the other gorgeous things which he had accumulated with such patience ah no his soul of a collector would be capable of the greatest heroism before he would let that go each day was bringing a fresh sheaf of bad news the papers were saying little and the government was so veiling in its communications that the mind was left in great perplexity nevertheless the truth was mysteriously forcing its way impelled by the pessimism of the alarmists and the manipulation of the enemy's spies who were remaining hidden in paris the fatal news was being passed along in whispers they have already crossed the frontier they are already in lille they were advancing at the rate of thirty-five miles a day the name of von kluck was beginning to have a familiar ring english and french were retreating before the enveloping progression of the invaders some were expecting another sedan desnoyers was following the advance of the germans going daily to the gare du nord every twenty-four hours was lessening the radius of travel bulletins announcing that tickets would not be sold for the northern districts served to indicate how these places were falling one after the other into the power of the invader the shrinkage of national territory was going on with such methodical regularity that with watch in hand and allowing an advance of thirty-five miles daily one might gauge the hour when the lances of the first uhlans would salute the eiffel tower the trains were running full great bunches of people overflowing from their coaches 
in this time of greatest anxiety desnoyers again visited his friend senator lacour in order to astound him with the most unheard-of petitions he wished to go immediately to his castle while everybody else was fleeing toward paris he earnestly desired to go in the opposite direction the senator couldn't believe his ears you are beside yourself he exclaimed it is necessary to leave paris but toward the south i will tell you confidentially and you must not tell because it is a secret we are leaving at any minute we are all going the president the government the chambers we are going to establish ourselves at bordeaux as in eighteen seventy the enemy is surely approaching it is only a matter of days of hours we know little of just what is happening but all the news is bad the army still holds firm is yet intact but retreating retreating all the time yielding ground believe me it will be better for you to leave paris galliani will defend it but the defence is going to be hard and horrible although paris may surrender france will not necessarily surrender the war will go on if necessary even to the frontiers of spain but it is sad very sad and he offered to take his friend with him in that flight to bordeaux of which so few yet knew desnoyers shook his head no he wanted to go to the castle of villeblanche his furniture his riches his parks but you will be taken prisoner protested the senator perhaps they will kill you a shrug of indifference was the only response he considered himself energetic enough to struggle against the entire german army in the defence of his property the important thing was to get there and then just let anybody dare to touch his things the senator looked with astonishment at this civilian infuriated by the lust of possession it reminded him of some arab merchants that he had once known ordinarily mild and pacific who quarrelled and killed like wild beasts when bedouin thieves seized their wares this was not the moment for discussion and each must map out his own course so the influential senator finally yielded to the desire of his friend if such was his pleasure let him carry it through so he arranged that his mad petitioner should depart on that very night on a military train that was going to meet the army that journey put don marcelo in touch with the extraordinary movement which the war had developed on the railroads his train took fourteen hours to cover the distance normally made in two it was made up of freight cars filled with provisions and cartridges with the doors stamped and sealed a third-class car was occupied by the train escort a detachment of provincial guards he was installed in a second-class compartment with the lieutenant in command of this guard and certain officials on their way to join their regiments after having completed the business of mobilization in the small towns in which they were stationed before the war the crowd habituated to long detentions was accustomed to getting out and settling down before the motionless locomotive or scattering through the nearby fields in the stations of any importance all the tracks were occupied by rows of cars high-pressure engines were whistling impatient to be off groups of soldiers were hesitating before the different trains making mistakes getting out of one coach to enter others the employees calm but weary-looking were going from side to side giving explanations about mountains of all sorts of freight and arranging them for transport in the convoy in which desnoyers was placed the territorials were sleeping accustomed to the monotony of acting as guard those in charge of the horses had opened the sliding doors seating themselves on the floor with their legs hanging over the edge the train went very slowly during the night across shadowy fields stopping here and there before red lanterns and announcing its presence by prolonged whistling in some stations appeared young girls clad in white with cockades and pennants on their breasts day and night they were there in relays so that no train should pass through without a visit they offered in baskets and trays 
their gifts to the soldiers bread chocolate fruit many already surfeited tried to resist but had to yield eventually before the pleading countenance of the maidens even desnoyers was laden down with these gifts of patriotic enthusiasm he passed a great part of the night talking with his travelling companions only the officers had vague directions as to where they were to meet their regiments for the operations of war were daily changing the situation faithful to duty they were passing on hoping to arrive in time for the decisive combat the chief of the guard had been over the ground and was the only one able to give any account of the retreat after each stop the train made less progress everybody appeared confused why the retreat the army had undoubtedly suffered reverses but it was still united and in his opinion ought to seek an engagement where it was the retreat was leaving the advance of the enemy unopposed to what point were they going to retreat they who two weeks before were discussing in their garrisons the place in belgium where their adversaries were going to receive their death blow and through what places their victorious troops would invade germany their admission of the change of tactics did not reveal the slightest discouragement an indefinite but firm hope was hovering triumphantly above their vacillations the generalissimo was the only one who possessed the secret of events and desnoyers approved with the blind enthusiasm inspired by those in whom we have confidence joffre that serious and calm leader would finally bring things out all right nobody ought to doubt his ability he was the kind of man who always says the decisive word at daybreak don marcelo left the train good luck to you and he clasped the hands of the brave young fellows who were going to die perhaps in a very short time finding the road unexpectedly open the train started immediately and desnoyers found himself alone in the station in normal times a branch road would have taken him on to villeblanche but the service was now suspended for lack of a train crew the employees had been transferred to the lines crowded with the war transportation in vain he sought with most generous offers a horse a simple cart drawn by any kind of old beast in order to continue his trip the mobilization had appropriated the best and all other means of transportation had disappeared with the flight of the terrified he would have to walk the eight miles the old man did not hesitate forward march and he began his course along the dusty straight white highway running between an endless succession of plains some groups of trees some green hedges and the roofs of various farms broke the monotony of the countryside the fields were covered with stubble from the recent harvest the haycocks dotted the ground with their yellowish cones now beginning to darken and take on a tone of oxidized gold in the valleys the birds were flitting about shaking off the dew of dawn the first rays of sun announced a very hot day around the haystacks desnoyers saw knots of people who were getting up shaking out their clothes and awaking those who were still sleeping they were fugitives camping near the station in the hope that some train would carry them further on they knew not where some had come from far-away districts they had heard the cannon had seen war approaching and for several days had been going forward directed by chance others infected with the contagion of panic had fled fearing to know the same horrors among them he saw mothers with their little ones in their arms and old men who could only walk with a cane in one hand and the other arm in that of some member of the family and a few old women withered and motionless as mummies who were sleeping as they were trundled along in wheelbarrows when the sun awoke this miserable band they gathered themselves together with heavy step still stiffened by the night many were going toward the station in the hope of a train which never came thinking that perhaps they might have better luck during the day that was just dawning some were continuing their way down the track hoping that fate might be more propitious in some other place 
don marcelo walked all the morning long the white rectilinear ribbon of roadway was spotted with the approaching groups that on the horizon line looked like a file of ants he did not see a single person going in his direction all were fleeing toward the south and on meeting this city gentleman well shod with walking stick and straw hat going on alone toward the country which they were abandoning in terror they showed the greatest astonishment they concluded that he must be some functionary some celebrity from the government at midday he was able to get a bit of bread a little cheese and a bottle of white wine from a tavern near the road the proprietor was at the front his wife sick and moaning in her bed the mother a rather deaf old woman surrounded by her grandchildren was watching from the doorway the procession of fugitives which had been filing by for the last three days monsieur why did they flee she said to desnoyers war only concerns the soldiers we country folk have done no wrong to anybody and we ought not to be afraid four hours later on descending one of the hills that bounded the valley of the marne he saw afar the roofs of villeblanche clustered around the church and further on beyond a little grove the slaty points of the round towers of his castle the streets of the village were deserted only on the outer edges of the square did he see some old women sitting as in the placid evenings of bygone summers half of the neighborhood had fled the others were staying by their firesides through sedentary routine or deceiving themselves with a blind optimism if the prussians should approach what could they do to them they would obey their orders without attempting any resistance and it is impossible to punish people who obey anything would be preferable to losing the homes built by their forefathers which they had never left End of section thirty five section thirty six part two chapter three continued of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez this librivox recording is in the public domain in the square he saw the mayor and the principal inhabitants grouped together like the women they all stared in astonishment at the owner of the castle he was the most unexpected of apparitions while so many were fleeing toward paris this parisian had come to join them and share in their fate a smile of affection a look of sympathy began to appear on the rough bark-like countenances of the suspicious rustics for a long time desnoyers had been on bad terms with the entire village he had harshly insisted on his rights showing no tolerance in matters touching his property he had spoken many times of bringing suit against the mayor and sending half of the neighborhood to prison so his enemies had retaliated by treacherously invading his lands poaching in his hunting preserves and causing him great trouble with countersuits and involved claims his hatred of the community had even united him with the priest because he was on terms of permanent hostility with the mayor but his relations with the church turned out as fruitless as his struggles with the state the priest was a kindly old soul who bore a certain resemblance to renan and seemed interested only in getting alms for his poor out of don marcelo even carrying his good-natured boldness so far as to try to excuse the marauders on his property how remote these struggles of a few months ago now seemed to him the millionaire was greatly surprised to see the priest on leaving his house to enter the church greet the mayor as he passed with a friendly smile after long years of hostile silence they had met on the evening of august first at the foot of the church tower the bell was ringing the alarm announcing the mobilization to the men who were in the field and the two enemies had instinctively clasped hands all french this affectionate unanimity also came to meet the detested owner of the castle 
he had to exchange greetings first on one side then on the other grasping many a horny hand behind his back the people broke out into kindly excuses a good man with no fault except a little bad temper and in a few minutes m desnoyers was basking in the delightful atmosphere of popularity as the iron-willed old gentleman approached his castle he concluded that although the fatigue of the long walk was making his knees tremble the trip had been well worth while never had his park appeared to him so extensive and so majestic as in that summer twilight never so glistening white the swans that were gliding double over the quiet waters never so imposing the great groups of towers whose inverted images were repeated in the glassy green of the moats he felt eager to see at once the stables with their herds of animals then a brief glance showed him that the stalls were comparatively empty mobilization had carried off his best work horses the driving and riding horses also had disappeared those in charge of the grounds and the various stable boys were also in the army the warden a man upwards of fifty and consumptive was the only one of the personnel left at the castle with his wife and daughter he was keeping the mangers filled and from time to time was milking the neglected cows within the noble edifice he again congratulated himself on the adamantine will which had brought him thither how could he ever give up such riches he gloated over the paintings the crystals the draperies all bathed in gold by the splendor of the dying day and he felt more than proud to be their possessor this pride awakened in him an absurd impossible courage as though he were a gigantic gigantic being from another planet and all humanity merely an anthill that he could grind under foot just let the enemy come he could hold his own against the whole lot then when his common sense brought him out of his heroic delirium he tried to calm himself with an equally illogical optimism they would not come he did not know why it was but his heart told him that they would not get that far he passed the following morning reconnoitring the artificial meadows that he had made behind the park lamenting their neglected condition due to the departure of the men trying himself to open the sluice gates so as to give some water to the pasture lands which were beginning to dry up the grapevines were extending their branches the length of their supports and the full bunches nearly ripe were beginning to show their triangular lusciousness among the leaves ay who would gather this abundant fruit by afternoon he noted an extraordinary amount of movement in the village georgette the warden's daughter brought the news that many enormous automobiles and soldiers french soldiers were beginning to pass through the main street in a little while a procession began filing past on the high road near the castle leading to the bridge over the marne this was composed of motor trucks open and closed that still had their old commercial signs under their covering of dust and spots of mud many of them displayed the names of business firms in paris others the names of provincial establishments with these industrial vehicles requisitioned by mobilization were others from the public service which produced in desnoyers the same effect as a familiar face in a throng of strangers on their upper parts were the names of their old routes madeleine bastille passibourg etc probably he had travelled many times in these very vehicles now shabby and aged by twenty days of intense activity with dented planks and twisted metal perforated like sieves but rattling crazily on some of the conveyances displayed white discs with a red cross in the centre others had certain letters and figures comprehensible only to those initiates in the secrets of military administration within these vehicles the only new and strong motors he saw soldiers many soldiers but all wounded with head and legs bandaged ashy faces made still more tragic by their growing beards feverish eyes looking fixedly ahead mouths so sadly immobile 
that they seemed carven by agonizing groans doctors and nurses were occupying various carriages in this convoy escorted by several platoons of horsemen and mingled with the slowly moving horses and automobiles were marching groups of foot soldiers with cloaks unbuttoned or hanging from their shoulders like capes wounded men who were able to walk and joke and sing some with arms in splints across their breasts others with bandaged heads with clotted blood showing through the thin white strips the millionaire longed to do something for these brave fellows but he had hardly begun to distribute some bottles of wine and loaves of bread before a doctor interposed upbraiding him as though he had committed a crime his gifts might result fatally so he had to stand beside the road sad and helpless looking after the sorrowful convoy by nightfall the vehicles filled with the sick were no longer filing by he now saw hundreds of drays some hermetically sealed with the prudence that explosive material requires others with bundles and boxes that were sending out a stale odor of provisions then came great herds of cattle raising thick whirling clouds of dust in the narrow parts of the road prodded on by the sticks and yells of the shepherds and kepis his thoughts kept him wakeful all night this then was the retreat of which the people of paris were talking but in which many wished not to believe the retreat reaching even there and continuing its indefinite retirement since nobody knew what its end might be his optimism aroused a ridiculous hope perhaps this was only the retreat of the hospitals and stores which always follows an army the troops wishing to be rid of impedimenta were sending them forward by railway and highway that must be it so all through the night he interpreted the incessant bustle as the passing of vehicles filled with the wounded with munitions and eatables like those which had filed by in the afternoon toward morning he fell asleep through sheer weariness and when he awoke late in the day his first glance was toward the road he saw it filled with men and horses dragging some rolling objects but these men were carrying guns and were formed in battalions and regiments the animals were pulling the pieces of artillery it was an army it was the retreat desnoyers ran to the edge of the road to be more convinced of the truth alas they were regiments such as he had seen leaving the stations of paris but with what a very different aspect the blue cloaks were now ragged and yellowing garments the trousers faded to the color of a half-baked brick the shoes great cakes of mud the faces had a desperate expression with layers of dust and sweat in all their grooves and openings with beards of recent growth sharp as spikes with an air of great weariness showing the longing to drop down somewhere for ever killing or dying but without going a step further they were tramping 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 some marches had lasted thirty hours at a stretch the enemy was on their tracks and the order was to go on and not to fight freeing themselves by their fleet-footedness from the involved movements of the invader the chiefs suspected the discouraged exhaustion of their men they might exact of them complete sacrifice of life but to order them to march day and night for ever fleeing before the enemy when they did not consider themselves vanquished when they were animated by that ferocious wrath which is the mother of heroism their despairing expressions mutely sought the nearest officers the leaders even the colonel they simply could go no further such a long devastating march in such a few days and what for the superior officers who knew no more than their men seemed to be replying with their eyes as though they possessed a secret courage one more effort this is going to come to an end very soon the vigorous beasts having no imagination were resisting less than the men but their aspect was deplorable how could these be the same strong horses with glossy coats 
that he had seen in paris processions at the beginning of the previous month a campaign of twenty days had aged and exhausted them their dull gaze seemed to be imploring pity they were weak and emaciated the outline of their skeleton so plainly apparent that it made their eyes look larger their harness as they moved showed the skin raw and bleeding yet they were pushing on with a mighty effort concentrating their last powers as though human demands were beyond their obscure instincts some could go no further and suddenly collapsed from the sheer fatigue desnoyers noticed that the artillerymen rapidly unharnessed them pushing them out of the road so as to leave the way open for the rest there lay the skeleton-like frames with stiffened legs and glassy eyes staring fixedly at the first flies already attracted by their miserable carrion the cannons painted gray the gun carriages the artillery equipment all that don marcelo had seen clean and shining with the enthusiastic friction that man has given to arms from remote epochs even more persistent than that which woman gives to household utensils were now dirty overlaid with the marks of endless use with the wreckage of unavoidable neglect the wheels were deformed with mud the metal darkened by the smoke of explosion the gray paint spotted with mossy dampness in the free spaces in this file in the parentheses opened between battery and regiment were sandwiched crowds of civilians miserable groups driven on by the invasion populations of entire towns that had disintegrated following the army in its retreat the approach of a new division would make them leave the road temporarily continuing their march in the adjoining fields then at the slightest opening in the troops they would again slip along the white and even surface of the highway they were mothers who were pushing handcarts heaped high with pyramids of furniture and tiny babies the sick who could hardly drag themselves along old men carried on the shoulders of their grandsons old women with little children clinging to their skirts a pitiful silent brood nobody now opposed the liberality of the owner of the castle his entire vintage seemed to be overflowing on the highway casks from the last grape gathering were rolled out to the roadside and the soldiers filled the metal ladles hanging from their belts with a red stream then the bottled wine began making its appearance by order of date and was instantly lost in the river of men continually flowing by desnoyers observed with much satisfaction the effects of his munificence the smiles were reappearing on the despairing faces the french jest was leaping from row to row and on resuming their march the groups began to sing then he went to see the officers who in the village square were giving their horses a brief rest before rejoining their columns with perplexed countenances and heavy eyes they were talking among themselves about this retreat so incomprehensible to them all days before in guise they had routed their pursuers and yet now they were continually withdrawing in obedience to a severe and endless order we do not understand it they were saying we do not understand an ordered and methodical tide was dragging back these men who wanted to fight yet had to retreat all were suffering the same cruel doubt we do not understand End of section 36section thirty seven part two chapter three continued of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez translated by charlotte brewster jordan this librivox recording is in the public domain and doubt was making still more distressing this day and night march with only the briefest rests because the heads of the divisions were in hourly fear of being cut off from the rest of the army one effort more boys courage soon we shall rest the columns in their retirement were extending hundreds of miles desnoyers was seeing only one division others and still others were doing exactly this same thing 
at that very hour their recessional extending across half of france all with the same disheartened obedience were falling back the men exclaiming the same as the officials we don't understand we don't understand don marcelo soon felt the same sadness and bewilderment as the soldiers he didn't understand either he saw the obvious thing what all were able to see the territory invaded without the germans encountering any stubborn resistance entire counties cities villages hamlets remaining in the power of the enemy at the back of an army that was constantly withdrawing his enthusiasm suddenly collapsed like a pricked balloon and all his former pessimism returned the troops were displaying energy and discipline but what did that amount to if they had to keep retreating all the time unable on account of strict orders to fight or defend the land just as it was in the seventies he sighed outwardly there is more order but the result is going to be the same as though a negative reply to his faint-heartedness he overheard the voice of a soldier reassuring a farmer we are retreating yes only that we may pounce upon the bush with more strength grandpa joffre is going to put them in his pocket when and where he will the mere sound of the marshal's name revived don marcelo's hope perhaps this soldier who was keeping his faith intact in spite of the interminable and demoralizing marches was nearer the truth than the reasoning and studious officers he passed the rest of the day making presents to the last detachments of the column his wine cellars were gradually emptying by order of dates he continued distributing thousands of bottles stored in the subterranean parts of the castle by evening he was giving to those who appeared weakest bottles covered with the dust of many years as the lines filed by the men seemed weaker and more exhausted stragglers were now passing painfully drawing their raw and bleeding feet from their shoes some had already freed themselves from these torture cases and were marching barefoot with their heavy boots hanging from their shoulders and staining the highway with drops of blood although staggering with deadly fatigue they kept their arms and outfits believing that the enemy was near desnoyers liberality stupefied many of them they were accustomed to crossing their native soil having to struggle with the selfishness of the producer nobody had been offering anything fear of danger had made the country folk hide their eatables and refuse to lend the slightest aid to their compatriots who were fighting for them the millionaire slept badly this second night in his pompous bed with columns and plushes that had belonged to henry the fourth according to the declarations of the salesmen the troops no longer were marching past from time to time there straggled by a single battalion a battery a group of horsemen the last forces of the rear guard that had taken their position on the outskirts of the village in order to cover the retreat the profound silence that followed the turmoil of transportation awoke in his mind a sense of doubt and disquietude what was he doing there when the soldiers had gone was he not crazy to remain there but immediately there came galloping into his mind the great riches which the castle contained if he could only take it all away that was impossible now through want of means and time besides his stubborn will looked upon such flight as a shameful concession we must finish what we have begun he said to himself he had made the trip on purpose to guard his own and he must not flee at the approach of danger the following morning when he went down into the village he saw hardly any soldiers only a single detachment of dragoons was still in the neighborhood the horsemen were scouring the woods and pushing forward the stragglers at the same time that they were opposing the advance of the enemy the troopers had obstructed the street with a barricade of carts and furniture standing behind this crude barrier they were watching the white strip of roadway which ran between the two hills covered with trees occasionally there sounded stray shots like the snapping of cords ours said the troopers these were the last detachments of sharpshooters 
firing at the advancing uhlans the cavalry of the rear guard had the task of opposing a continual resistance to the enemy repelling the squads of germans who were trying to work their way along to the retreating columns desnoyers saw approaching along the high road the last stragglers from the infantry they were not walking they rather appeared to be dragging themselves forward with the firm intention of advancing but were betrayed by emaciated legs and bleeding feet some had sunk down for a moment by the roadside agonized with weariness in order to breathe without the weight of their knapsacks and draw their swollen feet from their leather prisons and wipe off the sweat but upon trying to renew their march they found it impossible to rise their bodies seemed made of stone fatigue had brought them to a condition bordering on catalepsy so unable to move they were seeing dimly the rest of the army passing on as a fantastic file battalions more battalions batteries troops of horses then the silence the night the sleep on the stones and dust shaken by most terrible nightmare at daybreak they were awakened by bodies of horsemen exploring the ground rounding up the remnants of the retreat ay it was impossible to move the dragoons revolver in hand had to resort to threats in order to rouse them only the certainty that the pursuer was nearer and might make them prisoners gave them a momentary vigor so they were forcing themselves up by superhuman effort staggering dragging their legs and supporting themselves on their guns as though they were canes many of these were young men who had aged in an hour and changed into confirmed invalids poor fellows they would not go very far their intention was to follow on to join the column but on entering the village they looked at the houses with supplicating eyes desiring to enter them feeling such a craving for immediate relief that they forgot even the nearness of the enemy villeblanche was now more military than before the arrival of the troops the night before a great part of the inhabitants had fled having become infected with the same fear that was driving on the crowds following the army the mayor and the priest remained reconciled with the owner of the castle through his unexpected presence in their midst and admiring his liberality the municipal official approached to give him some news the engineers were mining the bridge over the marne they were only waiting for the dragoons to cross before blowing it up if he wished to go there was still time again desnoyers hesitated certainly it was foolhardy to remain there but a glance at the woods over whose branches rose the towers of his castle settled his doubts no no we must finish what we have begun the very last band of troopers now made their appearance coming out of the woods by different paths they were riding their horses slowly as though they deplored this retreat they kept looking behind carbine in hand ready to halt and shoot the others who had been occupying the barricade were already on their mounts the division reformed the commands of the officers were heard and a quick trot accompanied by the clanking of metal told don marcelo that the last of the army had left he remained near the barricade in a solitude of intense silence as though the world were suddenly depopulated two dogs abandoned by the flight of their masters leaped and sniffed around him coaxing him for protection they were unable to get the desired scent in that land trodden down and disfigured by the transit of thousands of men a family cat was watching the birds that were beginning to return to their haunts with timid flutterings they were picking at what the horses had left and an ownerless hen was disputing the banquet with the winged band until then hidden in the trees and roofs the silence intensified the rustling of the leaves the hum of the insects the summer respiration of the sunburnt soil which appeared to have contracted timorously under the weight of the men in arms desnoyers was losing exact track of the passing of time he was beginning to believe that all which had gone before must have been a bad dream the calm surrounding him 
made what had been happening here seem most improbable suddenly he saw something moving at the far end of the road at the very highest point where the white ribbon of the highway touched the blue of the horizon there were two men on horseback two little tin soldiers who appeared to have escaped from a box of toys he had brought with him a pair of field glasses that had often surprised marauders on his property and by their aid he saw more clearly the two riders clad in greenish gray they were carrying lances and wearing helmets ending in a horizontal plate they he could not doubt it before his eyes were the first uhlans for some time they remained motionless as though exploring the horizon then from the obscure masses of vegetation that bordered the roadside others and still others came sallying forth in groups the little tin soldiers no longer were showing their silhouettes against the horizon's blue the whiteness of the highway was now making their background ascending behind their heads they came slowly down like a band that fears ambush examining carefully everything around the advisability of prompt retirement made don marcelo bring his investigations to a close it would be most disastrous for him if they surprised him here but on lowering his glasses something extraordinary passed across his field of vision a short distance away so that he could almost touch them with his hand he saw many men skulking along in the shadow of the trees on both sides of the road his surprise increased as he became convinced that they were frenchmen wearing kepis where were they coming from he examined more closely with his spy-glass they were stragglers in a lamentable state of body with a picturesque variety of uniforms infantry zouaves dragoons without their horses and with them were forest guards and officers from the villages that had received too late the news of the retreat altogether about fifty a few were fresh and vigorous others were keeping themselves up by supernatural effort all were carrying arms they finally made the barricade looking continually behind them in order to watch in the shelter of the trees the slow advance of the uhlans at the head of this heterogeneous group was an official of the police old and fat with a revolver in his right hand his moustache bristling with excitement and a murderous glitter in his heavy-lidded blue eyes the band was continuing its advance through the village slipping over to the other side of the barricade of carts without paying much attention to their curious countryman when suddenly sounded a loud detonation making the horizon vibrate and the houses tremble what is that asked the officer looking at desnoyers for the first time he explained that it was the bridge which had just been blown up the leader received the news with an oath but his confused followers brought together by chance remained as indifferent as though they had lost all contact with reality might as well die here as anywhere continued the official many of the fugitives acknowledged this decision with prompt obedience since it saved them the torture of continuing their march they were almost rejoicing at the explosion which had cut off their progress instinctively they were gathering in the places most sheltered by the barricade some entered the abandoned houses whose doors the dragoons had forced in order to utilize the upper floors all seemed satisfied to be able to rest even though they might soon have to fight the officer went from group to group giving his orders they must not fire till he gave the word don marcelo watched these preparations with the immovability of surprise so rapid and noiseless had been the apparition of the stragglers that he imagined he must still be dreaming there could be no danger in this unreal situation it was all a lie and he remained in his place without understanding the deputy who was ordering his departure with the roughest words obstinate civilian the reverberation of the explosion had filled the highway with horsemen they were coming from all directions forming themselves into the advance group the uhlans were galloping around under the impression that the village was abandoned fire desnoyers was enveloped in a rain of crackling noises 
as though the trunks of all the trees had split before his eyes the impetuous band halted suddenly some of their men were rolling on the ground some were bending themselves double trying to get across the road without being seen others remained stretched out on their backs or face downward with their arms in front the riderless horses were racing wildly across the fields with reins dragging urged on by the loose stirrups after this rude shock which had brought them surprise and death the band disappeared instantly swallowed up by the trees End of section 37section thirty eight part two chapter four of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez translated by charlotte brewster jordan this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four near the sacred grotto argensola had found a new occupation even more exciting than marking out the map of the manoeuvres of the armies i am now devoting myself to the taube he announced it appears from four to five with the precision of a punctilious guest coming to take tea every afternoon at the appointed hour a german aeroplane was flying over paris dropping bombs this would-be intimidation was producing no terror the people accepting the visit as an interesting and extraordinary spectacle in vain the aviators were flinging in the city streets german flags bearing ironic messages giving accounts of the defeat of the retreating army and the failures of the russian offensive lies all lies in vain they were dropping bombs destroying garrets killing or wounding old men women and babes oh the bandits the crowds would threaten with their fists the malign mosquito scarcely visible six thousand feet above them and after this outburst they would follow it with straining eyes from street to street or stand motionless in the square in order to study its evolutions the most punctual of all the spectators was argensola at four o'clock he was in the place de la concorde with upturned face and wide open eyes in most cordial good fellowship with all the bystanders it was as though they were holding season's tickets at the same theatre becoming acquainted through seeing each other so often will it come will it not come to-day the women appeared to be the most vehement some of them rushing up flushed and breathless fearing that they might have arrived too late for the show a great cry there it comes there it is and thousands of hands were pointing to a vague spot on the horizon with field glasses and telescopes they were aiding their vision the popular vendors offering every kind of optical instruments and for an hour the thrilling spectacle of an aerial hunt was played out noisy and useless the great insect was trying to reach the eiffel tower and from its base would come sharp reports at the same time that the different platforms spit out a fierce stream of shrapnel as it zigzagged over the city the discharge of rifles would crackle from roof and street every one that had arms in his house was firing the soldiers of the guard and the english and belgians on their way through paris they knew that their shots were perfectly useless but they were firing for the fun of retorting hoping at the same time that one of their chance shots might achieve a miracle but the only miracle was that the shooters did not kill each other with their precipitate and ineffectual fire as it was a few passers-by did fall wounded by balls from unknown sources argensola would tear from street to street following the evolutions of the inimical bird trying to guess where its projectiles would fall anxious to be the first to reach the bombarded house excited by the shots that were answering from below and to think that he had no gun like those khaki-clad englishmen or those belgians in barrack cap with tassel over the front finally the taube tired of manoeuvring would disappear 
until to-morrow ejaculated the spaniard perhaps to-morrow's show may be even more interesting he employed his free hours between his geographical observations and his aerial contemplations in making the rounds of the stations watching the crowds of travellers making their escape from paris the sudden vision of the truth after the illusion which the government had been creating with its optimistic dispatches the certainty that the germans were actually near when a week before they had imagined them completely routed the taubes flying over paris the mysterious threat of the zeppelins all these dangerous signs were filling a part of the community with frenzied desperation the railroad stations guarded by the soldiery were only admitting those who had secured tickets in advance some had been waiting entire days for their turn to depart the most impatient were starting to walk eager to get outside the city as soon as possible the roads were black with the crowds all going in the same directions toward the south they were fleeing by automobile in carriages in gardeners carts on foot argensola surveyed this hegira with serenity he would remain because he had always admired those men who witnessed the siege of paris in eighteen seventy now it was going to be his good fortune to observe a historical drama perhaps even more interesting the wonders that he would be able to relate in the future but the distraction and indifference of his present audience were annoying him greatly he would hasten back to the studio in feverish excitement to communicate the latest gratifying news to desnoyers who would listen as though he did not hear him the night that he informed him that the government the chambers the diplomatic corps and even the actors of the comedie francaise were going that very hour on special trains for bordeaux his companion merely replied with a shrug of indifference desnoyers was worrying about other things that morning he had received a note from marguerite only two lines scrawled in great haste she was leaving starting immediately accompanied by her mother adieu and nothing more the panic had caused many love affairs to be forgotten had broken off long intimacies but marguerite's temperament was above such incoherencies from mere flight julio felt that her terseness was very ominous why not mention the place to which she was going in the afternoon he took a bold step which she had always forbidden he went to her home and talked a long time with the concierge in order to get some news the good woman was delighted to work off on him the loquacity so brusquely cut short by the flight of tenants and servants the lady on the first floor marguerite's mother had been the last to abandon the house in spite of the fact that she was really sick over her son's departure they had left the day before without saying where they were going the only thing that she knew was that they took the train to the gare d'orsay they were going toward the south like all the rest of the rich and she supplemented her revelations with the vague news that the daughter had seemed very much upset by the information that she had received from the front some one in the family was wounded perhaps it was the brother but she really didn't know with so many surprises and strange things happening it was difficult to keep track of everything her husband too was in the army and she had her own affairs to worry about where can she have gone julio asked himself all day long why does she wish to keep me in ignorance of her whereabouts when his comrade told him that night about the transfer of the seat of government with all the mystery of news not yet made public desnoyers merely replied they are doing the best thing i too will go to-morrow if i can why remain longer in paris his family was away his father according to argensola's investigations also had gone off without saying whither now marguerite's mysterious flight was leaving him entirely alone in a solitude that was filling him with remorse that afternoon when strolling through the boulevards he had stumbled across a friend considerably older than himself an acquaintance in the fencing club which he used to frequent 
this was the first time they had met since the beginning of the war and they ran over the list of their companions in the army desnoyers inquiries were answered by the older man so-and-so he had been wounded in lorraine and was now in a hospital in the south another friend dead in the vosges another disappeared at charleroi and thus had continued the heroic and mournful roll-call the others were still living doing brave things the members of foreign birth young poles english residents in paris and south americans had finally enlisted as volunteers the club might well be proud of its young men who had practised arms in times of peace for now they were all jeopardizing their existence at the front desnoyers turned his face away as though he feared to meet in the eyes of his friend an ironical and questioning expression why had he not gone with the others to defend the land in which he was living to-morrow i will go repeated julio depressed by this recollection but he went toward the south like all those who were fleeing from the war the following morning argensola was charged to get him a railroad ticket for bordeaux the value of money had greatly increased but fifty francs opportunely bestowed wrought the miracle and procured a bit of numbered cardboard whose conquest represented many days of waiting it is good only for to-day said the spaniard you will have to take the night train packing was not a very serious matter as the trains were refusing to admit anything more than hand luggage argensola did not wish to accept the liberality of julio who tried to leave all his money with him heroes needed very little and the painter of souls was inspired with heroic resolution the brief harangue of gallieni in taking charge of the defence of paris he had adopted as his own he intended to keep up his courage to the last just like the hardy general let them come he exclaimed with a tragic expression they will find me at my post his post was the studio from which he could witness the happenings which he proposed relating to coming generations he would entrench himself there with the eatables and wines besides he had the plan just as soon as his partner should disappear of bringing to live there with him certain lady friends who were wandering around in search of a problematical dinner and feeling timid in the solitude of their own quarters danger often gathers congenial folk together and adds a new attractiveness to the pleasures of a community the tender affections of the prisoners of the terror when they were expecting momentarily to be conducted to the guillotine flashed through his mind let us drain life's goblet at one draught since we have to die the studio of the rue de la pompe was about to witness the mad and desperate revels of a castaway bark well stocked with provisions End of section 38section thirty nine part two chapter four continued of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez translated by charlotte brewster jordan this librivox recording is in the public domain desnoyers left the gare d'orsay in a first-class compartment mentally praising the good order with which the authorities had arranged everything so that every traveller could have his own seat at the austerlitz station however a human avalanche assaulted the train the doors were broken open packages and children came in through the windows like projectiles the people pushed with the unreason of a crowd fleeing before a fire in the space reserved for eight persons fourteen installed themselves the passageways were heaped with mountains of bags and valises that served later travellers for seats all class distinctions had disappeared the villagers invaded by preference the best coaches 
believing that they would there find more room those holding first-class tickets hunted up the plainer coaches in the vain hope of travelling without being crowded on the crossroads were waiting from the day before long trains made up of cattle cars all the stables on wheels were filled with people seated on the wooden floor or in chairs brought from their homes every trainload was an encampment eager to take up its march whenever it halted layers of greasy papers hulls and fruit skins collected along its entire length the invaders pushing their way in put up with many annoyances and pardoned one another in a brotherly way in war times war measures they would always say as a last excuse and each one was pressing closer to his neighbor in order to make a few more inches of room and helping to wedge his scanty baggage among the other bundles swaying most precariously above little by little desnoyers was losing all his advantage as a first comer these poor people who had been waiting for the train from four in the morning till eight at night awakened his pity the women groaning with weariness were standing in the corridors looking with ferocious envy at those who had seats the children were bleeding like hungry kids julio finally gave up his place sharing with the needy and improvident the bountiful supplies of eatables with which argensola had provided him the station restaurants had all been emptied of food during the train's long wait soldiers only were seen on the platform soldiers who were hastening at the call of the trumpet to take their places again in the strings of cars which were constantly steaming toward paris at the signal stations long war trains were waiting for the road to be clear that they might continue their journey the cuirassiers wearing a yellow vest over their steel breastplate were seated with hanging legs in the doorways of the stable cars from whose interior came repeated neighing upon the flat cars were rows of gun carriages the slender throats of the cannon of seventy five were pointed upwards like telescopes young desnoyers passed the night in the aisle seated on a valise noting the sodden sleep of those around him worn out by weariness and exhaustion it was a cruel and endless night of jerks shrieks and stops punctuated by snores at every station the trumpets were sounding precipitously as though the enemy were right upon them the soldiers from the south were hurrying to their posts and at brief intervals another detachment of men was dragged along the rails toward paris they all appeared gay and anxious to reach the scene of slaughter as soon as possible many were regretting the delays fearing that they might arrive too late leaning out of the window julio heard the dialogues and shouts on the platforms impregnated with the acrid odor of men and mules all were evincing an unquenchable confidence the boches very numerous with huge cannons with many mitrailleuses but we only have to charge with our bayonets to make them run like rabbits the attitude of those going to meet death was in sharp contrast to the panic and doubt of those who were deserting paris an old and much decorated gentleman type of a jubilee functionary kept questioning desnoyers whenever the train started on again do you believe that they will get as far as tours before receiving his reply he would fall asleep brutish sleep was marching down the aisles with leaden feet at every junction the old man would start up and suddenly ask do you believe that we will get as far as bordeaux and his great desire not to halt until with his family he had reached an absolutely secure refuge made him accept as oracles all the vague responses at daybreak they saw the territorialists guarding the roads they were armed with old muskets and were wearing the red kepis 
as their only military distinction they were following the opposite course of the military trains in the station at bordeaux the civilian crowds struggling to get out or to enter other cars were mingling with the troops the trumpets were incessantly sounding their brazen notes calling the soldiers together many were men of darkest coloring natives with wide gray breeches and red caps above their black or bronzed faces julio saw a train bearing wounded from the battles of flanders and lorraine their worn and dirty uniforms were enlivened by the whiteness of the bandages sustaining the wounded limbs or protecting the broken heads all were trying to smile although with livid mouths and feverish eyes at their first glimpse of the land of the south as it emerged from the mist bathed in the sunlight and covered with the regal vestures of its vineyards the men from the north stretched out their hands for the fruit that the women were offering them tasting with delight the sweet grapes of the country for four days the distracted lover lived in bordeaux stunned and bewildered by the agitation of a provincial city suddenly converted into a capital the hotels were overcrowded with many notables contenting themselves with servants quarters there was not a vacant seat in the cafes the sidewalks could not accommodate the extraordinary assemblage the president was installed in the prefecture the state departments were established in the schools and museums two theatres were fitted up for the future reunions of the senate and the chamber of deputies julio was lodged in a filthy disreputable hotel at the end of a foul-smelling alley a little cupid adorned the crystals of the door and the looking-glass in his room was scratched with names and unspeakable phrases souvenirs of the occupants of an hour and yet many grand ladies hunting in vain for temporary residence would have envied him his good fortune all his investigations proved fruitless the friends whom he encountered in the fugitive crowd were thinking only of their own affairs they could talk of nothing but incidents of the installation repeating the news gathered from the ministers with whom they were living on familiar terms or mentioning with a mysterious air the great battle which was going on stretching from the vicinity of paris to verdun a pupil of his days of glory whose former elegance was now attired in the uniform of a nurse gave him some vague information the little madame laurier i remember hearing that she was living somewhere near here perhaps in biarritz julio needed no more than this to continue his journey to biarritz the first person that he encountered on his arrival was chichi she declared that the town was impossible because of the families of rich spaniards who were summering there the boches are in the majority and i pass a miserable existence quarrelling with them i shall finally have to live alone then he met his mother embraces and tears afterwards he saw his aunt elena in the hotel parlors most enthusiastic over the country and the summer colony she could talk at great length with many of them about the decadence of france they were all expecting to receive the news from one moment to another that the kaiser had entered the capital ponderous men who had never done anything in all their lives were criticizing the defects and indolence of the republic young men whose aristocracy aroused dona elena's enthusiasm broke forth into apostrophes against the corruption of paris corruption that they had studied thoroughly from sunset to sunrise in the virtuous schools of montmartre they all adored germany where they had never been or which they knew only through the reels of the moving picture films they criticized events as though they were witnessing a bullfight the germans have the snap you can't fool with them they are fine brutes and they appeared to admire this 
in humanity as the most admirable characteristic why will they not say that in their own home on the other side of the frontier chichi would protest why do they come into their neighbor's country to ridicule his troubles possibly they consider it a sign of their wonderful good breeding but julio had not gone to biarritz to live with his family the very day of his arrival he saw marguerite's mother in the distance she was alone his inquiries developed the information that her daughter was living in po she was a trained nurse taking care of a wounded member of the family her brother undoubtedly it is her brother thought julio and he again continued his trip this time going to po his visits to the hospitals there were also unavailing nobody seemed to know marguerite every day a train was arriving with a new load of bleeding flesh but her brother was not among the wounded a sister of charity believing that he was in search of someone of his family took pity on him and gave him some helpful directions he ought to go to lourdes there were many of the wounded there and many of the military nurses so desnoyers immediately took the short cut between po and lourdes he had never visited the sacred city whose name was so frequently on his mother's lips for dona luisa the french nation was lourdes in her discussions with her sister and other foreign ladies who were praying that france might be exterminated for its impiety the good senora always summed up her opinions in the same words when the virgin wished to make her appearance in our day she chose france this country therefore cannot be as bad as you say when i see that she appears in berlin we will then rediscuss the matter but desnoyers was not there to confirm his mother's artless opinions just as soon as he had found a room in a hotel near the river he had hastened to the big hostelry now converted into a hospital the guard told him that he could not speak to the director until the afternoon in order to curb his impatience he walked through the street leading to the basilica past all the booths and shops with pictures and pious souvenirs which had converted the place into a big bazaar here and in the gardens adjoining the church he saw wounded convalescents with uniforms stained with traces of the combat their cloaks were greatly soiled in spite of repeated brushings the mud the blood and the rain had left indelible spots and made them as stiff as cardboard some of the wounded had cut their sleeves in order to avoid the cruel friction on their shattered arms others still showed on their trousers the rents made by the devastating shells they were fighters of all ranks and of many races infantry cavalry artillerymen soldiers from the metropolis and from the colonies french farmers and african sharpshooters red heads faces of mohammedan olive and the black countenances of the Senegalese with eyes of fire and thick bluish blubber lips some showing the good nature and sedentary obesity of the middle-class man suddenly converted into a warrior others sinewy alert with the aggressive profile of men born to fight and experienced in foreign fields the city formerly visited by the hopeful catholic sick was now invaded by a crowd no less dolorous but clad in carnival colors all in spite of their physical distress had a certain air of good cheer and satisfaction they had seen death very near slipping out from his bony claws into a new joy and zest in life with their cloaks adorned with medals their theatrical moorish garments their kepis and their african headdresses this heroic band presented nevertheless a lamentable aspect very few still preserved the noble vertical carriage the pride of the superior human being they were walking along bent almost double limping dragging themselves forward by the help of a staff or friendly arm others had to let themselves be pushed along stretched out on the handcarts which had so often conducted the devout sick 
from the station to the grotto of the virgin some were feeling their way along blindly leaning on a child or nurse the first encounters in belgium and in the east a mere half-dozen battles had been enough to produce these physical wrecks still showing a manly nobility in spite of the most horrible outrages these organisms struggling so tenaciously to regain their hold on life bringing their reviving energies out into the sunlight represented but the most minute part of the number mowed down by the scythe of death back of them were thousands and thousands of comrades groaning on hospital beds from which they would probably never rise thousands and thousands were hidden forever in the bosom of the earth moistened by their death agony fatal land which upon receiving a hail of projectiles brought forth a harvest of bristling crosses war now showed itself to desnoyers with all its cruel hideousness he had been accustomed to speak of it heretofore as those in robust health speak of death knowing that it exists and is horrible but seeing it afar off so far off that it arouses no real emotion the explosion of the shells were accompanying their destructive brutality with a ferocious mockery grotesquely disfiguring the human body he saw wounded objects just beginning to recover their vital force who were but rough skeletons of men frightful caricatures human rags saved from the tomb by the audacities of science trunks with heads which were dragged along on wheeled platforms fragments of skulls whose brains were throbbing under an artificial cap beings without arms and without legs resting in the bottom of little wagons like bits of plaster models or scraps from the dissecting room faces without noses that looked like skulls with great black nasal openings and these half men were talking smoking laughing satisfied to see the sky to feel the caress of the sun to have come back to life dominated by that sovereign desire to live which trustingly forgets present misery in the confident hope of something better end of section thirty nine section forty part two chapter four continued of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez translated by charlotte brewster jordan this librivox recording is in the public domain so strongly was julio impressed that for a little while he forgot the purpose which had brought him thither if those who provoke war from diplomatic chambers or from the tables of the military staff could but see it not in the field of battle fired with the enthusiasm which prejudices judgments but in cold blood as it is seen in the hospitals and cemeteries in the wrecks left in its trail to julio's imagination this terrestrial globe appeared like an enormous ship sailing through infinity its crews poor humanity had spent century after century in exterminating each other on the deck they did not even know what existed under their feet in the hold of the vessel to occupy the same portion of the surface in the sunlight seemed to be the ruling desire of each group men considered superior human beings were pushing these masses to extermination in order to scale the last bridge and hold the helm controlling the course of the boat and all those who felt the overmastering ambition for absolute command knew the same thing nothing not one of them could say with certainty what lay beyond the visible horizon nor whither the ship was drifting the sullen hostility of mystery surrounded them all their life was precarious necessitating incessant care in order to maintain it yet in spite of that 
the crew for ages and ages had never known an instant of agreement of teamwork of clear reason periodically half of them would clash with the other half they killed each other that they might enslave the vanquished on the rolling deck floating over the abyss they fought that they might cast their victims from the vessel filling its wake with cadavers and from the demented throng there were still springing up gloomy sophistries to prove that a state of war was the perfect state that it ought to go on forever that it was a bad dream on the part of the crew to wish to regard each other as brothers with a common destiny enveloped in the same unsteady environment of mystery ah human misery julio was drawn out of these pessimistic reflections by the childish glee which many of the convalescents were evincing some were mussulmans sharpshooters from algeria and morocco in lourdes as they might be anywhere they were interested only in the gifts which the people were showering upon them with patriotic affection they all surveyed with indifference the basilica inhabited by the white lady their only preoccupation being to beg for cigars and sweets finding themselves regaled by the dominant race they became greatly puffed up daring everything like mischievous children what pleased them most was the fact that the ladies would take them by the hand blessed war that permitted them to approach and touch these white women perfumed and smiling as they appeared in their dreams of the paradise of the blessed lady lady they would sigh looking at them with dark sparkling eyes and not content with the hand their dark paws would venture the length of the entire arm while the ladies laughed at this tremulous adoration others would go through the crowds offering their right hand to all the women we touch hands and then they would go away satisfied after receiving the hand-clasp desnoyers wandered a long time around the basilica where in the shadow of the trees were long rows of wheelchairs occupied by the wounded officers and soldiers rested many hours in the blue shade watching their comrades who were able to use their legs the sacred grotto was resplendent with the lights from hundreds of candles devout crowds were kneeling in the open air fixing their eyes in supplication on the sacred stones whilst their thoughts were flying far away to the fields of battle making their petitions with that confidence in divinity which accompanies every distress among the kneeling mass were many soldiers with bandaged heads kepis in hand and tearful eyes up and down the double staircase of the basilica were flitting women clad in white with spotless headdresses that fluttered in such a way that they appeared like flying doves these were the nurses and sisters of charity guiding the steps of the injured desnoyers thought he recognized marguerite in every one of them but the prompt disillusion following each of these discoveries soon made him doubtful about the outcome of his journey she was not in lourdes either he would never find her in that france so immeasurably expanded by the war that it had converted every town into a hospital his afternoon explorations were no more successful the employees listened to his interrogations with a distraught air he could come back again just now they were taken up with the announcement that another hospital train was on the way the great battle was still going on near paris they had to improvise lodgings for the new consignment of mutilated humanity in order to pass away the time until his return desnoyers went back to the garden near the grotto he was planning to return to pau that night there was evidently nothing more to do at lourdes in what direction should he now continue his search suddenly he felt a thrill down his back the same indefinable sensation which used to warn him of her presence when they were meeting in the gardens of paris marguerite was going to present herself unexpectedly as in the old days without his knowing from exactly what spot 
as though she came out of the earth or descended from the clouds after a second's thought he smiled bitterly mere tricks of his desire illusions upon turning his head he recognized the falsity of his hope nobody was following his footsteps he was the only being going down the centre of the avenue near him in the diaphanous white of a guardian angel was a nurse poor blind man desnoyers was passing on when a quick movement on the part of the white-clad woman an evident desire to escape notice to hide her face by looking at the plants attracted his attention he was slow in recognizing her two little ringlets escaping from the band of her cap made him guess the hidden head of hair the feet shod in white were the signs which enabled him to reconstruct the person somewhat disfigured by the severe uniform her face was pale and sad there wasn't a trace left in it of the old vanities that used to give it its childish doll-like beauty in the depths of those great dark circled eyes life seemed to be reflected in new forms marguerite they stared at one another for a long while as though hypnotized with surprise she looked alarmed when desnoyers advanced a step toward her no no her eyes her hands her entire body seemed to protest to repel his approach to hold him motionless fear that he might come near her made her go toward him she said a few words to the soldier who remained on the bench receiving across the bandage on his face a ray of sunlight which he did not appear to feel then she rose going to meet julio and continued forward indicating by a gesture that they must find some place further on where the wounded man could not hear them she led the way to a side path from which she could see the blind man confided to her care they stood motionless face to face desnoyers wished to say many things many but he hesitated not knowing how to frame his complaints his pleadings his endearments far above all these thoughts towered one fatal dominant and wrathful who is that man the spiteful accent the harsh voice with which he said these words surprised him as though they came from someone else's mouth the nurse looked at him with her great limpid eyes eyes that seemed forever freed from contractions of surprise or fear her response slipped from her with equal directness it is laurier it is my husband laurier julio looked doubtfully and for a long time at the soldier before he could be convinced that blind officer motionless on the bench that figure of heroic grief was laurier at first glance he appeared prematurely old with roughened and bronzed skin so furrowed with lines that they converged like rays around all the openings of his face his hair was beginning to whiten on the temples and in the beard which covered his cheeks he had lived twenty years in that one month at the same time he appeared younger with a youthfulness that was radiating an inward vigor with the strength of a soul which has suffered the most violent emotions and firm and serene in the satisfaction of duty fulfilled can no longer know fear as desnoyers contemplated him he felt both admiration and jealousy he was ashamed to admit the aversion inspired by the wounded man so sorely wounded that he was unable to see what was going on around him his hatred was a form of cowardice terrifying in its persistence how pensive were marguerite's eyes if she took them off her patient for a few seconds she had never looked at him in that way he knew all the amorous gradations of her glance but her fixed gaze on this injured man was something entirely different something that he had never seen before he spoke with the fury of a lover who discovers an infidelity and for this you have run away without warning without a word you have abandoned me in order to go in search of him tell me why did you come why did you come i came because it was my duty 
then she spoke like a mother who takes advantage of a parenthesis of surprise in an irascible child's temper in order to counsel self-control and explained how it had all happened she had received the news of laurier's wounding just as she and her mother were preparing to leave paris she had not hesitated an instant her duty was to hasten to the aid of this man she had been doing a great deal of thinking in the last few weeks the war had made her ponder much on the values in life her eyes had been getting glimpses of new horizons our destiny is not mere pleasure and selfish satisfaction we ought to take part in pain and sacrifice she had wanted to work for her country to share the general stress to serve as other women did and since she was disposed to devote herself to strangers was it not natural that she should prefer to help this man whom she had so greatly wronged there still lived in her memory the moment in which she had seen him approach the station completely alone among so many who had the consolation of loving arms when departing in search of death her pity had become still more acute on hearing of his misfortune a shell had exploded near him killing all those around him of his many wounds the only serious one was that on his face he had completely lost the sight of one eye and the doctors were keeping the other bound up hoping to save it but she was very doubtful about it she was almost sure that laurier would be blind marguerite's voice trembled when saying this as if she were going to cry although her eyes were tearless they did not now feel the irresistible necessity for tears weeping had become something superfluous like many other luxuries of peaceful days her eyes had seen so much in so few days how you love him exclaimed julio fearing that they might be overheard and in order to keep him at a distance she had been speaking as though to a friend but her lover's sadness broke down her reserve no i love you i shall always love you the simplicity with which she said this and her sudden tenderness of tone revived desnoyers hopes and the other one he asked anxiously upon receiving a reply it seemed to him as though something had just passed across the sun veiling its light temporarily it was as though a cloud had drifted over the land and over his thoughts enveloping them in an unbearable chill i love him too end of section forty section forty one part two chapter four continued of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez translated by charlotte brewster jordan this librivox recording is in the public domain she said it with a look that seemed to implore pardon with the sad sincerity of one who has given up lying and weeps in foreseeing the injury that the truth must inflict he felt his hard wrath suddenly dwindling like a crumbling mountain ah oh, marguerite his voice was tremulous and despairing could it be possible that everything between these two was going to end thus simply were her former vows mere lies they had been attracted to each other by an irresistible affinity in order to be together for ever to be one and now suddenly hardened by indifference were they to drift apart like two unfriendly bodies what did this absurdity about loving him at the same time that she loved her former husband mean anyway marguerite hung her head murmuring desperately you are a man i am a woman you would never understand me no matter what i may say men are not able to comprehend certain of our mysteries a woman would be better able to appreciate the complexity desnoyers felt that he must know his fate in all its cruelty she might speak without fear he felt strong enough to bear the blow what had laurier said when he found that he was being so tenderly cared for by marguerite he does not know who i am he believes me to be a war nurse like the rest who pities him seeing him alone and blind with no relatives to write to him or visit him at certain times i have almost suspected that he guesses the truth my voice the touch of my hands made him shiver at first as though with an unpleasant sensation 
i have told him that i am a belgian lady who has lost her loved ones and is alone in the world he has told me his life's story very sketchily as if he desired to forget a hated past never one disagreeable word about his former wife there are nights when i think he knows me that he takes advantage of his blindness in order to prolong his feigned ignorance and that distresses me i long for him to recover his sight for the doctors to save that doubtful eye and yet at the same time i feel afraid what will he say when he recognizes me but no it is better that he should see no matter what may result you cannot understand my anxiety you cannot know what i am suffering she was silent for an instant trying to regain her self-control again tortured with the agony of her soul oh the war she resumed what changes in our life two months ago my present situation would have appeared impossible unimaginable i caring for my husband fearing that he would discover my identity and leave me yet at the same time wishing that he would recognize me and pardon me it is only one week that i have been with him i disguise my voice when i can and avoid words that may reveal the truth but this cannot keep up much longer it is only in novels that such painful situations turn out happily doubt suddenly overwhelmed her i believe she continued that he has recognized me from the first he is silent and feigns ignorance because he despises me because he can never bring himself to pardon me i have been so bad i have wronged him so she was recalling the long and reflective silences of the wounded man after she had dropped some imprudent words after two days of submission to her care he had been somewhat rebellious avoiding going out with her for a walk because of his blind helplessness and comprehending the uselessness of his resistance he had finally yielded in passive silence let him think what he will concluded marguerite courageously let him despise me i am here where i ought to be i need his forgiveness but if he does not pardon me i shall stay with him just the same there are moments when i wish that he may never recover his sight so that he may always need me so that i may pass my life at his side sacrificing everything for him and i said desnoyers marguerite looked at him with clouded eyes as though she were just awakening it was true and the other one kindled by the proposed sacrifice which was to be her expiation she had forgotten the man before her you she said after a long pause you must leave me life is not what we have thought it had it not been for the war we might perhaps have realized our dream but now listen carefully and try to understand for the remainder of my life i shall carry the heaviest burden and yet at the same time it will be sweet since the more it weighs me down the greater will my atonement be never will i leave this man whom i have so grievously wronged now that he is more alone in the world and will need protection like a child why do you come to share my fate how could it be possible for you to live with a nurse constantly at the side of a blind and worthy man whom we would constantly offend with our passion no it is better for us to part go your way alone and untrammelled leave me you will meet other women who will make you more happy than i yours is the temperament that finds new pleasures at every step she stood firmly to her decision her voice was calm but back of it trembled the emotion of a last farewell to a joy which was going from her forever the man would be loved by others and she was giving him up but the noble sadness of the sacrifice restored her courage only by this renunciation could she expiate her sins julio dropped his eyes vanquished and perplexed the picture of the future outlined by marguerite terrified him to live with her as a nurse taking advantage of her patient's blindness would be to offer him fresh insult every day ah no that would be villainy indeed he was now ashamed to recall the malignity with which a little while before he had regarded this innocent unfortunate he realized that he was powerless to contend with him weak and helpless as he was sitting there on the garden bench he was stronger and more deserving of respect than julio desnoyers with all his youth 
and elegance the victim had amounted to something in his life he had done what julio had not dared to do this sudden conviction of his inferiority made him cry out like an abandoned child what will become of me marguerite too contemplating the love which was going from her forever her vanquished hopes the future illumined by the satisfaction of duty fulfilled but monotonous and painful cried out and i what will become of me as though he had suddenly found a solution which was reviving his courage desnoyers said listen marguerite i can read your soul you love this man and you do well he is superior to me and women are always attracted by superiority i am a coward yes do not protest i am a coward with all my youth with all my strength why should you not have been impressed by the conduct of this man but i will atone for past wrongs this country is yours marguerite i will fight for it do not say no and moved by his hasty heroism he outlined the plan more definitely he was going to be a soldier soon she would hear him well spoken of his idea was either to be stretched on the battlefield in his first encounter or to astonish the world by his bravery in this way the impossible situation would settle itself either the oblivion of death or glory no no interrupted marguerite in an anguished tone you know one is enough how horrible you too wounded mutilated forever perhaps dead no you must live i want you to live even though you might belong to another let me know that you exist let me see you sometimes even though you may have forgotten me even though you may pass me with indifference as if you did not know me in this outburst her deep love for him rang true her heroic and inflexible love which would accept all penalties for herself if only the beloved one might continue to live but then in order that julio might not feel any false hopes she added live you must not die that would be for me another torment but live without me no matter how much we may talk about it my destiny beside the other one is marked out for ever oh how you love him how you have deceived me in a last desperate attempt at explanation she again repeated what she had said at the beginning of their interview she loved julio and she loved her husband they were different kinds of love she could not say which was the stronger but misfortune was forcing her to choose between the two and she was accepting the most difficult the one demanding the greatest sacrifices you are a man and you will never be able to understand me a woman would comprehend me it seemed to julio as he looked around him as though the afternoon were undergoing some celestial phenomenon the garden was still illuminated by the sun but the green of the trees the yellow of the ground the blue of the sky all appeared to him as dark and shadowy as though a rain of ashes were falling then all is over between us his pleading trembling voice charged with tears made her turn her head to hide her emotion then in the painful silence the two despairs formed one and the same question as if interrogating the shades of the future what will become of me murmured the man and like an echo her lips repeated what will become of me all had been said hopeless words came between the two like an obstacle momentarily increasing in size impelling them in opposite directions why prolong the painful interview marguerite showed the ready and energetic decision of a woman who wishes to bring a scene to a close good-bye her face had assumed a yellowish cast her pupils had become dull and clouded like the glass of a lantern when the light dies out good-bye she must go to her patient she went away without looking at him and desnoyers instinctively went in the opposite direction as he became more self-controlled and turned to look at her again he saw her moving on and giving her arm to the blind man without once turning her head he now felt convinced that he should never see her again and became oppressed by an almost suffocating agony and could two beings who had formerly considered the universe concentrated in their persons thus easily be separated for ever his desperation at finding himself alone made him accuse himself of stupidity now his thoughts came tumbling over each other in a tumultuous throng 
and each one of them seemed to him sufficient to have convinced marguerite he certainly had not known how to express himself he would have to talk with her again and he decided to remain in lourdes he passed a night of torture in the hotel listening to the ripple of the river among its stones insomnia had him in its fierce jaws gnawing at him with interminable agony he turned on the light several times but was not able to read his eyes looked with stupid fixity at the patterns of the wallpaper and the pious pictures around the room which had evidently served as the lodging place of some rich traveller he remained motionless and as abstracted as an oriental who thinks himself into an absolute lack of thought one idea only was dancing in the vacuum in his skull i shall never see her again can such a thing be possible he drowsed for a few seconds only to be awakened with the sensation that some horrible explosion was sending him through the air and so with sweats of anguish he wakefully passed the hours until in the gloom of his room the dawn showed a milky rectangle of light and began to be reflected on the window curtains the velvet-like caress of day finally closed his eyes upon awakening he found that the morning was well advanced and he hurried to the garden of the grotto oh the hours of tremulous and unavailing waiting believing that he recognized marguerite in every white-clad lady that came along guiding a wounded patient by afternoon after a lunch whose dishes filed past him untouched he returned to the garden in search of her beholding her in the distance with the blind man leaning on her arm a feeling of faintness came over him she looked to him taller thinner her face sharper with two dark hollows in her cheeks and her eyes bright with fever the lids drawn with weariness he suspected that she too had passed an anguished night of tenacious self-centred thought of grievous stupefaction like his own in the room of her hotel suddenly he felt all the weight of insomnia and listlessness all the depressing emotion of the cruel sensations experienced in the last few hours oh how miserable they both were she was walking warily looking from one side to the other as though foreseeing danger upon discovering him she clung to her charge casting upon her former lover a look of entreaty of desperation imploring pity ay that look he felt ashamed of himself his personality appeared to be unrolling itself before him and he surveyed himself with the eyes of a judge what was this seduced and useless man called julio desnoyers doing there tormenting with his presence a poor woman trying to turn her from her righteous repentance insisting on his selfish and petty desires when all humanity was thinking of other things his cowardice angered him like a thief taking advantage of the sleep of his victim he was stalking around this brave and true man who could not see him who could not defend himself in order to rob him of the only affection that he had in the world which had so miraculously returned to him very well gentleman desnoyers oh what a scoundrel he was such subconscious insults made him draw himself erect in haughty cruel and inexorable defiance against that other i who so richly deserved the judge's scorn he turned his head away he could not meet marguerite's piteous eyes he feared their mute reproach neither did he dare to look at the blind man in his shabby and heroic uniform with his countenance aged by duty and glory he feared him like remorse so the vanquished lover turned his back on the two and went away with a firm step good-bye love good-bye happiness he marched quickly and bravely on a miracle had just taken place within him he had found the right road at last to paris a new impetus was going to fill the vacuum of his objectless existence End of section forty one section forty two part two chapter five 
of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez translated by charlotte brewster jordan this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five the invasion don marcelo was fleeing to take refuge in his castle when he met the mayor of villeblanche the noise of the firing had made him hurry to the barricade when he learned of the apparition of the group of stragglers he threw up his hands in despair they were crazy their resistance was going to be fatal for the village and he ran on to beg them to cease for some time nothing happened to disturb the morning calm desnoyers had climbed to the top of his towers and was surveying the country with his field glasses he couldn't make out the highway through the nearest group of trees but he suspected that underneath their branches great activity was going on masses of men on guard troops preparing for the attack the unexpected defence of the fugitives had upset the advance of the invasion desnoyers thought despairingly of that handful of mad fellows and their stubborn chief what was their fate going to be focusing his glasses on the village he saw the red spots of kepis waving like poppies over the green of the meadows they were the retreating men now convinced of the uselessness of their resistance perhaps they had found a ford or forgotten boat by which they might cross the marne and so were continuing their retreat toward the river at any minute now the germans were going to enter villeblanche half an hour of profound silence passed by the village lay silhouetted against a background of hills a mass of roofs beneath the church tower finished with its cross and iron weathercock everything seemed as tranquil as in the best days of peace suddenly he noticed that the grove was vomiting forth something noisy and penetrating a bubble of vapour accompanied by a deafening report something was hurtling through the air with a strident curve then a roof in the village opened like a crater vomiting forth flying wood fragments of plaster and broken furniture all the interior of the house seemed to be escaping in a stream of smoke dirt and splinters the invaders were bombarding villeblanche before attempting attack as though fearing to encounter persistent resistance in its streets more projectiles fell some passed over the houses exploding between the hamlet and the castle the towers of the desnoyers property were beginning to attract the aim of the artilleryman the owner was therefore about to abandon his dangerous observatory when he saw something white like a tablecloth or sheet floating from the church tower his neighbors had hoisted this signal of peace in order to avoid bombardment a few more missiles fell and then there was silence when don marcelo reached his park he found the warden burying at the foot of a tree the sporting rifles still remaining in his castle then he went toward the great iron gates the enemies were going to come and he had to receive them while uneasily awaiting their arrival his compunctions again tormented him what was he doing there why had he remained but his obstinate temperament immediately put aside the promptings of fear he was there because he had to guard his own besides it was too late now to think about such things suddenly the morning stillness was broken by a sound like the deafening tearing of strong cloth shots master said the warden firing it must be in the square a few minutes after they saw running toward them a woman from the village an old soul dried up and darkened by age who was panting from her great exertion and looking wildly around her she was fleeing blindly trying to escape from danger and shut out horrible visions desnoyers and the keeper's family listened to her explanations interrupted with hiccups of terror the germans were in villeblanche they had entered first in an automobile driven at full speed from one end of the village to the other its mitrailleuse was firing at random against closed houses and open doors knocking down all the people in sight the old woman flung up her arms with a gesture of terror dead many dead wounded blood then other iron-plated vehicles had stopped in the square and behind them cavalrymen battalions of infantry many battalions coming from everywhere the helmeted men seemed furious 
they accused the villagers of having fired at them in the square they had struck the mayor and villagers who had come forward to meet them the priest bending over some of the dying had also been trodden under foot all prisoners the germans were talking of shooting them the old dame's words were cut short by the rumble of approaching automobiles open the gates commanded the owner to the warden the massive iron grill work swung open and was never again closed all property rights were at an end an enormous automobile covered with dust and filled with men stopped at the entrance behind them sounded the horns of other vehicles that were putting on the brakes desnoyers saw soldiers leaping out all wearing the greenish-gray uniform with a sheath of the same tone covering the pointed cask the one who marched at their head put his revolver to the millionaire's forehead where are the sharpshooters he asked he was pale with the pallor of wrath vengeance and fear his face was trembling under the influence of his triple emotion don marcelo explained slowly contemplating at a short distance from his eyes the black circle of the threatening tube he had not seen any sharpshooters the only inhabitants of the castle were the warden with his family and himself the owner of the castle the officer surveyed the edifice and then examined desnoyers with evident astonishment as though he thought his appearance too unpretentious for a proprietor he had taken him for a simple employee and his respect for social rank made him lower his revolver he did not however alter his haughty attitude he pressed don marcelo into the service as a guide making him search ahead of him while forty soldiers grouped themselves at his back they advanced in two files to the shelter of the trees which bordered the central avenue with their guns ready to shoot and looking uneasily at the castle windows as though expecting to receive from them hidden shots desnoyers marched tranquilly through the centre and the official who had been imitating the precautions of his men finally joined him when he was crossing the drawbridge the armed men scattered through the rooms in search of the enemy they ran their bayonets through beds and divans some with automatic destructiveness slit the draperies and the rich bed coverings the owner protested what was the sense in such useless destruction he was suffering unbearable torture at seeing the enormous boots spotting the rugs with mud on hearing the clash of guns and knapsacks against the most fragile choices pieces of furniture poor historic mansion the officer looked amazed that he should protest for such trifling cause but he gave orders in german and his men ceased their rude explorations then in justification of this extraordinary respect he added in french i believe that you are going to have the honor of entertaining here the general of our division the certainty that the castle did not hold any hidden enemies made him more amiable he nevertheless persisted in his wrath against the sharpshooters a group of the villagers had opened fire upon the uhlans when they were entering unsuspiciously after the retreat of the french desnoyers felt it necessary to protest they were neither inhabitants nor sharpshooters they were french soldiers he took good care to be silent about their presence at the barricade but he insisted that he had distinguished their uniforms from a tower of the castle the official made a threatening face you too you who appear a reasonable man can repeat such yarns as these and in order to close the conversation he said arrogantly they were wearing uniforms then if you persist in saying so but they were sharpshooters just the same the french government has distributed arms and uniforms among the farmers that they may assassinate us belgium did the same thing but we know their tricks and we know how to punish them too the village was going to be burned it was necessary to avenge the four germans dead lying on the outskirts of ville blanche near the barricade the mayor the priest the principal inhabitants would all be shot by the time they reached the top floor desnoyers could see floating above the boughs of his park dark clouds whose outlines were reddened by the sun the top of the bell tower was the only thing that he could distinguish at that distance around the iron weathercock 
were flying long thin fringes like black cobwebs lifted by the breeze an odor of burning wood came toward the castle the german greeted this spectacle with a cruel smile then on descending to the park he ordered desnoyers to follow him his liberty and his dignity had come to an end henceforth he was going to be an underling at the beck and call of these men who would dispose of him as their whims directed ay why had he remained he obeyed climbing into an automobile beside the officer who was still carrying his revolver in his right hand his men distributed themselves through the castle and outbuildings in order to prevent the flight of an imaginary enemy the warden and his family seemed to be saying good-bye to him with their eyes perhaps they were taking him to his death beyond the castle woods a new world was coming into existence the short cut to villeblanche seemed to desnoyers a leap of millions of leagues a fall into a red planet where men and things were covered with the film of smoke and the glare of fire he saw the village under a dark canopy spotted with sparks and glowing embers the bell tower was burning like an enormous torch the roof of the church was breaking into flames with a crashing fury the glare of the holocaust seemed to shrivel and grow pale in the impassive light of the sun running across the fields with the haste of desperation were shrieking women and children the animals had escaped from the stables and driven forth by the flames were racing wildly across the country the cow and the workhorse were dragging their halters broken by their flight their flanks were smoking and smelt of burnt hair the pigs the sheep and the chickens were all tearing along mingled with the cats and the dogs all the domestic animals were returning to a brute existence fleeing from civilized man shots were heard and hellish ha-has the soldiers outside of the village were making themselves merry in this hunt for fugitives their guns were aimed at beasts and were hitting people end of section forty two section forty three part two chapter five continued of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez translated by charlotte brewster jordan this librivox recording is in the public domain desnoyers saw men many men men everywhere they were like gray ants marching in endless files toward the south coming out from the woods filling the roads crossing the fields the green of vegetation was disappearing under their tread the dust was rising in spirals behind the dull roll of the cannons and the measured trot of thousands of horses on the roadside several battalions had halted with their accompaniment of vehicles and draw horses they were resting before renewing their march he knew this army he had seen it in berlin on parade and yet it seemed to have changed its former appearance there now remained very little of the heavy and imposing glitter of the mute and vainglorious haughtiness which had made his relatives-in-law weep with admiration war with its realism had wiped out all that was theatrical about this formidable organization of death the soldiers appeared dirty and tired out the respiration of fat and sweaty bodies mixed with the strong smell of leather floated over the regiments all the men had hungry faces for days and nights they had been following the heels of an enemy which was always just eluding their grasp in this forced advance the provisions of the administration would often arrive so late at the cantonments that they could depend only on what they happened to have in their knapsacks desnoyers saw them lined up near the road devouring hunks of black bread and mouldy sausages some had scattered through the fields to dig up beetroots and other tubers chewing with loud crunchings the hard pulp to which the grit still adhered an ensign was shaking the fruit trees using as a catch-all the flag of his regiment that glorious standard adorned with souvenirs of eighteen seventy 
was serving as a receptacle for green plums those who were seated on the ground were improving this rest by drawing their perspiring swollen feet from high boots which were sending out an insufferable smell the regiments of infantry which desnoyers had seen in berlin reflecting the light on metal and leather straps the magnificent and terrifying hussars the cuirassiers in pure white uniform like the paladins of the holy grail the artillerymen with breasts crossed with white bands all the military variations on that parade had drawn forth the hartrott sighs of admiration these were now all unified and mixed together of uniform color all in greenish mustard like the dusty lizards that slipping along try to be confounded with the earth the persistency of the iron discipline was easily discernible a word from the chiefs the sound of a whistle and they all grouped themselves together the human being disappearing in the throngs of automatons but danger weariness and the uncertainty of triumph had for the time being brought officers and men nearer together obliterating caste distinction the officers were coming part way out of their overbearing haughty seclusion and were condescending to talk with the lower orders so as to revive their courage one effort more and they would overwhelm both french and english repeating the triumph of sedan whose anniversary they were going to celebrate in a few days they were going to enter paris it was only a matter of a week paris great shops filled with luxurious things famous restaurants women champagne money and the men flattered that their commanders were stooping to chat with them forgot fatigue and hunger reviving like the throngs of the crusade before the image of jerusalem nach paris the joyous shouts circulated from the head to the tail of the marching columns to paris to paris the scarcity of their food supply was here supplemented by the products of a country rich in wines when sacking houses they rarely found eatables but invariably a wine cellar the humble german the perpetual beer drinker who had always looked upon wine as a privilege of the rich could now open up casks with blows from his weapons even bathing his feet in the stream of precious liquid every battalion left as a souvenir of its passing a wake of empty bottles a halt in camp sowed the land with glass cylinders the regimental trucks unable to renew their stores of provisions were accustomed to seize the wine in all the towns the soldier lacking bread would receive alcohol this donation was always accompanied by the good counsels of the officers war is war no pity toward our adversaries who do not deserve it the french were shooting their prisoners and their women were putting out the eyes of the wounded every dwelling was a den of traps the simple-hearted and innocent german entering therein was going to certain death the beds were made over subterranean caves the wardrobes were make-believe doors in every corner was lurking an assassin this traitorous nation which was arranging its ground like the scenario of a melodrama would have to be chastised the municipal officers the priests the schoolmasters were directing and protecting the sharpshooters desnoyers was shocked at the indifference with which these men were stalking around the burning village they did not appear to see the fire and destruction it was just an ordinary spectacle not worth looking at ever since they had crossed the frontier smouldering and blasted villages fired by the advance guard had marked their halting places on belgian and french soil when entering villeblanche the automobile had to lower its speed burned walls were bulging out over the street and half charred beams were obstructing the way obliging the vehicle to zigzag through the smoking rubbish the vacant lots were burning like fire pans between the houses still standing with doors broken but not yet in flames desnoyers saw within these rectangular spaces partly burned wood chairs beds sewing machines iron stoves all the household goods of the well-to-do countryman being consumed or twisted into shapeless masses 
sometimes he would spy an arm sticking out of the ruins beginning to burn like a long wax candle no it could not be possible and then the smell of cooking flesh began to mingle with that of the soot wood and plaster he closed his eyes not able to look any longer he thought for a moment he must be dreaming it was unbelievable that such horrors could take place in less than an hour human wickedness at its worst he had supposed incapable of changing the aspect of a village in such a short time an abrupt stoppage of the motor made him look around involuntarily this time the obstruction was the dead bodies in the street two men and a woman they had probably fallen under the rain of bullets from the machine-gun which had passed through the town preceding the invasion some soldiers were seated a little beyond them with their backs to the victims as though ignoring their presence the chauffeur yelled to them to clear the track with their guns and feet they pushed aside the bodies still warm at every turn leaving a trail of blood the space was hardly open before the vehicle shot through a thud a leap the black wheels had evidently crushed some very fragile obstacle desnoyers was still huddled in his seat benumbed and with closed eyes the horror around him made him think of his own fate whither was this lieutenant taking him he soon saw the town hall flaming in the square the church was now nothing but a stone shell bristling with flames the houses of the prosperous villagers had had their doors and windows chopped out by axe blows within them soldiers were moving about methodically they entered empty-handed and came out loaded with furniture and clothing others in the upper stories were flinging out various objects accompanying their trophies with jests and guffaws suddenly they had to come out flying for fire was breaking out with the violence and rapidity of an explosion following their footsteps was a group of men with big boxes and metal cylinders someone at their head was pointing out the buildings into whose broken windows were to be thrown the lozenges and liquid streams which would produce catastrophe with lightning rapidity out of one of these flaming buildings two men who seemed but bundles of rags were being dragged by some germans above the blue sleeves of their military cloaks don marcelo could distinguish blanched faces and eyes immeasurably distended with suffering their legs were dragging on the ground sticking out between the tatters of their red pantaloons one of them still had on his kepis blood was gushing from different parts of their bodies and behind them like white serpents were trailing their loosened bandages they were wounded frenchmen stragglers who had remained in the village because too weak to keep up with the retreat perhaps they had joined the group which finding its escape cut off had attempted that insane resistance wishing to make that matter more clearly understood desnoyers looked at the official beside him attempting to speak but the officer silenced him instantly french sharpshooters in disguise who are going to get the punishment they deserve the german bayonets were sunk deep into their bodies then blows with the guns fell on the head of one of them and these blows were repeated with dull thumps upon their skulls crackling as they burst open again the old man wondered what his fate would be where was this lieutenant taking him across such visions of horror they had reached the outskirts of the village where the dragoons had built their barricade the carts were still there but at one side of the road they climbed out of the automobile and he saw a group of officers in gray with sheathed helmets like the others the one who had brought him to this place was standing rigidly erect with one hand to his visor speaking to a military man standing a few paces in front of the others he looked at this man who was scrutinizing him with his little hard blue eyes that had carved his spare furrowed countenance with lines he must be the general his arrogant and piercing gaze was sweeping him from head to foot don marcelo felt a presentiment that his life was hanging on this examination should an evil suggestion a cruel caprice flash across his brain he was surely lost the general shrugged his shoulders and said a few words in a contemptuous tone then entered his automobile with two of his aides and the group disbanded the cruel uncertainty 
the interminable moments before the official returned to his side filled desnoyers with dread his excellency is very gracious announced the lieutenant he might have shot you but he pardons you and yet you people say that we are savages with involuntary contempt he further explained that he had conducted him thither fully expecting that he would be shot the general was planning to punish all the prominent residents of villeblanche and he had inferred on his own initiative that the owner of the castle must be one of them military duty sir war exacts it after this excuse the petty official renewed his eulogies of his excellency he was going to make his headquarters in don marcelo's property and on that account granted him his life he ought to thank him then again his face trembled with wrath he pointed to some bodies lying near the road they were the corpses of uhlans covered with some cloaks from which were protruding the enormous soles of their boots plain murder he exclaimed a crime for which the guilty are going to pay dearly his indignation made him consider the death of four soldiers as an unheard-of and monstrous outrage as though it was only the enemy ought to fall keeping safe and sound the lives of his compatriots a band of infantry commanded by an officer approached as their ranks opened desnoyers saw the gray uniforms roughly pushing forward some of the inhabitants their clothes were torn and some had blood on face and hands he recognized them one by one as they were lined up against the mud wall at twenty paces from the firing squad of soldiers the mayor the priest the forest guard and some rich villagers whose houses he had seen falling in flames they are going to shoot them in order to prevent any doubt about it the lieutenant explained i wanted you to see this it will serve as an object lesson in this way you will feel more appreciative of the leniency of his excellency the prisoners were mute their voices had been exhausted in vain protest all their life was concentrated in their eyes looking around them in stupefaction and was it possible that they would kill them in cold blood without hearing their testimony without admitting the proofs of their innocence the certainty of approaching death soon gave almost all of them a noble serenity it was useless to complain only one rich countryman famous for his avarice was whimpering desperately saying over and over i do not wish to die i do not want to die End of section forty three section forty four part two chapter five continued of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez translated by charlotte brewster jordan this librivox recording is in the public domain trembling and with eyes overflowing with tears desnoyers hid himself behind his implacable guide he knew them all he had battled with them all and repented now of his former wrangling the mare had a red stain on his forehead from a long skin wound upon his breast fluttered a tattered tricolor the municipality had placed it there that he might receive the invaders who had torn most of it away the priest was holding his little round body as erect as possible wishing to embrace in a look of resignation the victims the executioners earth and heaven he appeared larger than usual and more imposing his black girdle broken by the roughness of the soldiers left his cassock loose and floating his waving silvery hair was dripping blood spotting with its red drops the white clerical collar upon seeing him cross the fatal field with unsteady step because of his obesity a savage roar cut the tragic silence the unarmed soldiers who had hastened to witness the execution greeted the venerable old man with shouts of laughter death to the priest the fanaticism of the religious wars vibrated through their mockery almost all of them were devout catholics or fervent protestants but they believed only in the priests of their own country outside of germany everything was despicable even their own religion 
the mayor and the priest exchanged their places in the file seeking one another each with solemn courtesy was offering the other the central place in the group here your honor is your place as mayor at the head of all no after you monsieur le cure they were disputing for the last time but in this supreme moment each one was wishing to yield precedence to the other instinctively they had clasped hands looking straight ahead at the firing squad that had lowered its guns in a rigid horizontal line behind them sounded laments good-bye my children adieu life i do not wish to die i do not want to die the two principal men felt the necessity of saying something of closing the page of their existence with an affirmation vive la république cried the mayor vive la france said the priest desnoyers thought that both had said the same thing two uprights flashed above their heads the arm of the priest making the sign of the cross and the sabre of the commander of the shooters glistening at the same instant a dry dull thunderclap followed by some scattering tardy shots don marcelo's compassion for that forlorn cluster of massacred humanity was intensified on beholding the grotesque forms which many assumed in the moment of death some collapsed like half-emptied sacks others rebounded from the ground like balls some leaped like gymnasts with upraised arms falling on their backs or face downward like a swimmer in that human heap he saw limbs writhing in the agony of death some soldiers advanced like hunters begging their prey from the palpitating mass fluttered locks of white hair and a feeble hand trying to repeat the sacred sign a few more shots and blows on the livid mangled mass and the last tremors of life were extinguished for ever the officer had lit a cigar whenever you wish he said to desnoyers with ironical courtesy they re-entered the automobile in order to return to the castle by the way of villeblanche the increasing number of fires and the dead bodies in the streets no longer impressed the old man he had seen so much what could now affect his sensibilities he was longing to get out of the village as soon as possible to try to find the peace of the country but the country had disappeared under the invasion soldiers horses cannons everywhere wherever they stopped to rest they were destroying all that they came in contact with the marching battalions noisy and automatic as a machine were preceded by the fifes and drums and every now and then in order to cheer their drooping spirits were breaking into their joyous cry nach paris the castle too had been disfigured by the invasion the number of guards had greatly increased during the owner's absence he saw an entire regiment of infantry encamped in the park thousands of men were moving about under the trees preparing the dinner in the movable kitchens the flower borders of the gardens the exotic plants the carefully swept and graveled avenues were all broken and spoiled by this avalanche of men beasts and vehicles a chief wearing on his sleeve the band of the military administration was giving orders as though he were the proprietor he did not even condescend to look at this civilian walking beside the lieutenant with the downcast look of a prisoner the stables were vacant desnoyers saw his last animals being driven off with sticks by the helmeted shepherds the costly progenitors of his herds were all beheaded in the park like mere slaughter-house animals in the chicken houses and dovecotes there was not a single bird left the stables were filled with thin horses who were gorging themselves before overflowing mangers the feed from the barns was being lavishly distributed through the avenue much of it lost before it could be used the cavalry horses of various divisions were turned loose in the meadows destroying with their hoofs the canals the edges of the slopes the level of the ground all the work of many months the dry wood was uselessly burning in the park through carelessness or mischief some one had set the wood piles on fire the trees with the bark dried by the summer heat were crackling on being licked by the flame 
the building was likewise occupied by a multitude of men under this same superintendent the open windows showed a continual shifting through the rooms desnoyers heard great blows that re-echoed within his breast ay his historic mansion the general was going to establish himself in it after having examined on the banks of the marne the works of the pontoon builders who had been constructing several military bridges for the troops don marcelo's outraged sense of ownership forced him to speak he feared that they would break the doors of the locked rooms he would like to go for the keys in order to give them up to those in charge the commissary would not listen to him but continued ignoring his existence the lieutenant replied with cutting amiability it is not necessary do not trouble yourself after this considerate remark he started to rejoin his regiment but deemed it prudent before losing sight of desnoyers to give him a little advice he must remain quietly at the castle outside he might be taken for a spy and he already knew how promptly the soldiers of the emperor settled all such little matters he could not remain in the garden looking at his dwelling from any distance because the germans who were going and coming were diverting themselves by playing practical jokes upon him they would march toward him in a straight line as though they did not see him and he would have to hurry out of their way to avoid being thrown down by their mechanical and rigid advance finally he sought refuge in the lodge of the keeper whose good wife stared with astonishment at seeing him drop into a kitchen chair breathless and downcast suddenly aged by losing the remarkable energy that had been the wonder of his advanced years ah master poor master of all the events attending the invasion the most unbelievable for this poor woman was seeing her employer take refuge in her cottage what is ever going to become of us she groaned her husband was in constant demand by the invaders his excellency's assistants installed in the basement apartments of the castle were incessantly calling him to tell them the whereabouts of things which they could not find from every trip he would return humiliated his eyes filled with tears on his forehead was the black and blue mark of a blow and his jacket was badly torn these were souvenirs of a futile attempt at opposition during his master's absence to the german plunderings of stables and castle rooms the millionaire felt himself linked by misfortune to these people considered until then with indifference he was very grateful for the loyalty of this sick and humble man and the poor woman's interest in the castle as though it were her own touched him greatly the presence of their daughter brought chichi to his mind he had passed near her without noting the transformation in her seeing her just the same as when with her little dog trot she had accompanied the master's daughter on her rounds through the parks and grounds now she was a woman slender and full-grown with the first feminine graces showing subtly in her fourteen-year-old figure her mother would not let her leave the lodge fearing the soldiery which was invading every other spot with its overflowing current filtering into all open places breaking every obstacle which impeded their course desnoyers broke his despairing silence to admit that he was feeling hungry he was ashamed of this bodily want but the emotions of the day the executions seen so near the danger still threatening had awakened in him a nervous appetite the fact that he was so impotent in the midst of his riches and unable to avail himself of anything on his estate but aggravated his necessity poor master again exclaimed the faithful soul and the woman looked with astonishment at the millionaire devouring a bit of bread and a triangle of cheese the only food that she could find in her humble dwelling the certainty that he would not be able to find any other nourishment no matter how much he might seek it greatly sharpened his cravings to have acquired an enormous fortune only to perish with hunger at the end of his existence the good wife as though guessing his thoughts sighed 
raising her eyes beseechingly to heaven since the early morning hours the world had completely changed its course ay this war the rest of the afternoon and a part of the night the proprietor kept receiving news from the keeper after his visits to the castle the general and numerous officers were now occupying the rooms not a single door was locked all having been opened with blows of the axe or gun many things had completely disappeared the man did not know exactly how but they had vanished perhaps destroyed or perhaps carried off by those who were coming and going the chief with the banded sleeve was going from room to room examining everything dictating in german to a soldier who was writing down his orders meanwhile the general and his staff were in the dining-room drinking heavily consulting the maps spread out on the floor and ordering the warden to go down into the vaults for the very best wines by nightfall an onward movement was noticeable in the human tide that had been overflowing the fields as far as the eye could reach some bridges had been constructed across the marne and the invasion had renewed its march shouting enthusiastically nach paris those left behind till the following day were to live in the ruined houses or the open air desnoyers heard songs under the splendor of the evening stars the soldiers had grouped themselves in musical knots chanting a sweet and solemn chorus of religious gravity above the trees was floating a red cloud intensified by the dusk a reflection of the still burning village afar off were bonfires of farms and homesteads twinkling in the night with their blood-colored lights End of section forty four section forty five part two chapter five continued of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez translated by charlotte brewster jordan this librivox recording is in the public domain the bewildered proprietor of the castle finally fell asleep in a bed in the lodge made mercifully unconscious by the heavy and stupefying slumber of exhaustion without fright nor nightmare he seemed to be falling falling into a bottomless pit and on awaking fancied that he had slept but a few minutes the sun was turning the window shades to an orange hue spattered with shadows of waving boughs and birds fluttering and twittering among the leaves he shared their joy in the cool refreshing dawn of the summer day it certainly was a fine morning but whose dwelling was this he gazed dumbfounded at his bed and surroundings suddenly the reality assaulted his brain that had been so sweetly dulled by the first splendors of the day step by step the host of emotions compressed into the preceding day came climbing up the long stairway of his memory to the last black and red landing of the night before and he had slept tranquilly surrounded by enemies under the surveillance of an arbitrary power which might destroy him in one of its caprices when he went into the kitchen the warden gave him some news the germans were departing the regiment encamped in the park had left at daybreak and after them others and still others in the village there was still one regiment occupying the few houses yet standing and the ruins of the charred ones the general had gone also with his numerous staff there was nobody in the castle now but the head of a reserve brigade whom his aide called the count and a few officials upon receiving this information the proprietor ventured to leave the lodge he saw his gardens destroyed but still beautiful the trees were still stately in spite of the damage done to their trunks the birds were flying about excitedly rejoicing to find themselves again in possession of the spaces so recently flooded by the human inundation suddenly desnoyers regretted having sallied forth five huge trucks were lined up near the moat before the castle bridge 
gangs of soldiers were coming out carrying on their shoulders enormous pieces of furniture like peons conducting a moving a bulky object wrapped in damask curtains an excellent substitute for a sacking was being pushed by four men toward one of the drays the owner suspected immediately what it must be his bath the famous tub of gold then with an abrupt revulsion of feeling he felt no grief at his loss he now detested the ostentatious thing attributing to it a fatal influence on account of it he was here but i the other furnishings piled up in the drays in that moment he suffered the extreme agony of misery and impotence it was impossible for him to defend his property to dispute with the head thief who was sacking his castle tranquilly ignoring the very existence of the owner robbers thieves and he fled back to the lodge he passed the remainder of the morning with his elbow on the table his head in his hands the same as the day before letting the hours grind slowly by trying not to hear the rolling of the vehicles that were bearing away these credentials of his wealth toward midday the keeper announced that an officer who had arrived a few hours before in an automobile was inquiring for him responding to this summons desnoyers encountered outside the lodge a captain arrayed like the others in sheathed and pointed helmet in mustard-colored uniform red leather boots sword revolver field glasses and geographic map hanging in a case from his belt he appeared young on his sleeve was the staff emblem do you know me i did not wish to pass through here without seeing you he spoke in castilian and don marcelo felt greater surprise at this than at the many things which he had been experiencing so painfully during the last twenty-four hours you really do not know me queried the german always in spanish i am otto captain otto von hartrott the old man's mind went painfully down the staircase of memory stopping this time at a far distant landing there he saw the old ranch and his brother-in-law announcing the birth of his second son i shall give him bismarck's name karl had said then climbing back past many other platforms desnoyers saw himself in berlin during his visit to the von hartrott's home where they were speaking proudly of otto almost as learned as the older brother but devoting his talents entirely to martial matters he was then a lieutenant and studying for admission to the general staff who knows but he may turn out to be another moltke said the proud father and the charming chichi had thereupon promptly bestowed upon the warlike wonder a nickname accepted through the family from that time otto was moltkecito the baby moltke to his parisian relatives desnoyers was astounded by the transformation which had meanwhile taken place in the youth this vigorous captain with the insolent air who might shoot him at any minute was the same urchin whom he had seen running around the ranch the beardless moltkecito who had been the butt of his daughter's ridicule the soldier meanwhile was explaining his presence there he belonged to another division there were many many they were advancing rapidly forming an extensive and solid wall from verdun to paris his general had sent him to maintain the contact with the next division but finding himself near the castle he had wished to visit it a family tie was not a mere word he still remembered the days that he had spent at villeblanche when the hartrott family had paid a long visit to their relatives in france the officials now occupying the edifice had detained him that he might lunch with them one of them had casually mentioned that the owner of the castle was somewhere about although nobody knew exactly where this had been a great surprise to captain von hartrott who had tried to find him regretting to see him taking refuge in the warden's quarters you must leave this hut you are my uncle he said haughtily return to your castle where you belong my comrades will be much pleased to make your acquaintance they are very distinguished men 
he very much regretted whatever the old gentleman might have suffered he did not know exactly in what that suffering had consisted but surmised that the first moments of the invasion had been cruel ones for him but what can you expect he repeated several times that is war at the same time he approved of his having remained on his property they had special orders to seize the goods of the fugitives germany wished the inhabitants to remain in their dwellings as though nothing extraordinary had occurred desnoyers protested but if the invaders were shooting the innocent ones and burning their homes his nephew prevented his saying more he turned pale an ashy hue spreading over his face his eyes snapped and his face trembled like that of the lieutenant who had taken possession of the castle you refer to the execution of the mayor and the others my comrades have just been telling me about it yet that castigation was very mild they should have completely destroyed the entire village they should have killed even the women and children we've got to put an end to these sharpshooters his uncle looked at him in amazement his moltkecito was as formidable and ferocious as the others but the captain brought the conversation to an abrupt close by repeating the monstrous and everlasting excuse very horrible but what else can you expect that is war then he inquired after his mother rejoicing to learn that she was in the south he had been uneasy at the idea of her remaining in paris especially with all those revolutions which had been breaking out there lately desnoyers looked doubtful as if he could not have heard correctly what revolutions were those but the officer without further explanation resumed his conversation about his family taking it for granted that his relative would be impatient to learn the fate of his german kin they were all in magnificent state their illustrious father was president of various patriotic societies since his years no longer permitted him to go to war and was besides organizing future industrial enterprises to improve the conquered countries his brother the sage was giving lectures about the nations that the imperial victory was bound to annex censuring severely those whose ambitions were unpretending or weak the remaining brothers were distinguishing themselves in the army one of them having been presented with a medal at lorraine the two sisters although somewhat depressed by the absence of their fiances lieutenants of the hussars were employing their time in visiting the hospitals and begging god to chastise traitorous england captain von hartrott was slowly conducting his uncle toward the castle the gray and unbending soldiers who until then had been ignoring the existence of don marcelo looked at him with interest now that he was in intimate conversation with a member of the general staff he perceived that these men were about to humanize themselves by casting aside temporarily their inexorable and aggressive automatonism upon entering his mansion something in his heart contracted with an agonizing shudder everywhere he could see dreadful vacancies which made him recall the objects which had formerly been there rectangular spots of stronger color announced the theft of furniture and paintings with what dispatch and system the gentleman of the armlet had been doing his work to the sadness that the cold and orderly spoliation caused was added his indignation as an economical man gazing upon the slashed curtains spotted rugs broken crystal and porcelain all the debris from a ruthless and unscrupulous occupation his nephew divining his thoughts could only offer the same old excuse what a mess but that is war with moltkecito he did not have to subside into the respectful civilities of fear that is not war he thundered bitterly it is an expedition of bandits your comrades are nothing less than highwaymen captain von hartrott swelled up with a jerk separating himself from the complainant and looking fixedly at him he spoke in a low voice hissing with wrath look here uncle 
it is a lucky thing for you that you have expressed yourself in spanish and those around you could not understand you if you persist in such comments you will probably receive a bullet by way of an answer the emperor's officials permit no insults and his threatening attitude demonstrated the facility with which he could forget his relationship if he should receive orders to proceed against don marcelo thus silenced the vanquished proprietor hung his head what was he going to do the captain now renewed his affability as though he had forgotten what he had just said he wished to present him to his companions at arms his excellency count meinburg the major-general upon learning that he was a relative of the von hartrotz had done him the honor of inviting him to his table invited into his own domain he finally reached the dining-room filled with men in mustard color and high boots instinctively he made an inventory of the room all in good order nothing broken walls draperies and furniture still intact but an appraising glance within the sideboard again caused a clutch at his heart two entire table services of silver and another of old porcelain had disappeared without leaving the most insignificant of their pieces he was obliged to respond gravely to the presentations which his nephew was making and take the hand which the count was extending with aristocratic languor the adversary began considering him with benevolence on learning that he was a millionaire from a distant land where riches were acquired very rapidly End of section forty five